first. So it actually, it actually comes first in terms of all of our decision making. We've got a great bunch of conveners and uh, we wouldn't be able to do the course without these great guys who are good friends. But I'd particularly like to thank Rags, who's done the lion's, uh, lion's share of the work to make the course happen. Um, so thanks, Rags. He's, he's really put it all together for us. So as I said yesterday, uh, why am I here? How have I got here? Well, I did know how to do an osteotomy at the start of my consultant career. And over the last 15 years, I've learned how to change the slope. And more recently, I've learned how to do rotation osteotomy. And that's what we're going to focus on today. So we're committed to teaching. We've got Matt Dawson, who's on faculty, running our northern course. But we'd like to thank Neil for really getting us into osteotomy at the very start of our journey as young consultants and getting these courses off the road, um, on the road. So this is now a typical case. This came from the London Clinic from one of, our, one of our patients quite recently. And this is exactly the sort of thing that we're going to be focusing on today. And it's now become a, a very typical case for us at the London Osteotomy Centre. Obviously, we'd love to be uh, at Lord's, but sadly, the coronavirus has meant that we've had to go virtual. And we looked at, we looked at uh, how we could change and modify. And we'd like to thank David, who worked first actually on the ACL course in, in Wexham Park with Henry Burke to do something a bit more interesting. And, you know, like we said yesterday, this has a sort of got a bit of a, a match of the day feel to it um, to try and create a studio and make this course a bit more interactive. Thanks, Adrian. Um, I'm sure everyone really enjoyed yesterday and it was very much a question time scenario. So we uh, recruited Dimbleby's younger brother to come in and help chair the sessions. And I really hope you enjoyed the format. It's something that's different, but I think we'll set a precedent for future meetings. We looked at the number of viewers that we had from around the world and, and it was a spectacular um, view, viewers, six and a half thousand people tuned in yesterday from 60 different countries. And these are just a list of some of the countries where um, people have come from. And to come in to see such an amazing course with such amazing faculty can be a very expensive affair. But this has really made it accessible for people around the world where they wouldn't necessarily have these opportunities. So we really are pleased with the way the format has gone for us and, uh, today and yesterday. So back at the, uh, back at the uh, Royal Society of Medicine, and it, it, it couldn't be more topical um, because this, we have significant fellows from this, particularly the gentleman on the left, um, Edward Jenner, uh, with the current corona pandemic. He really set the um, scientific trailblazer for us in developing vaccines. We've got Sigmund Freud in the middle, and we've also got Charles Darwin. So we're in a fantastic location um, for, for this meeting. I'd like to thank all the uh, faculty. They've been they're integral in making this work. Without them, this course wouldn't run, and th their expertise has, been, expertise has been welcomed. And the feedback yesterday was fantastic. So thank you to all the guys uh, for uh, give, taking out time and providing such great content. So I'm just going to run through the key messages from yesterday, looking at individual sections. So starting off with indications. We really learned that any patient who has a metaphyseal varus is suitable for an osteotomy. We know that if you have intra-articular deformity, you should think about partial knee replacements. And the old adage of age, BMI, and degree of osteoarthritis is less of an influence than previously thought. The way we should be thinking is physiology. What about planning? Planning has completely revolutionized the way that we practice on a day-to-day -day basis. The preoperative digital planning is a useful tool in reducing the amount of variability and getting the perfect alignment correction. Robotic unis demonstrate exciting advances in soft tissue and bony resection accuracy, and you can be much more accurate in the uh, post-operative x-rays, and hopefully that relates to outcomes. We know that the role of surgeons still remains vital. Robots are only as good as they can be depending on the person that's controlling them. So as Dave Houlihan Byrne said yesterday, they're not truly robots, they are an adjunct to the toolbox for any surgeon. Surgical technique. We spoke a lot about protecting the neurovascular bundle and the key message was not to start minimally invasive but make exposure so that you can key, get, get, the key is to get to the back and protect the neurovascular bundle. Both opening and closing wedge osteotomies have individual merits, 
but you must be comfortable in performing whichever option you go for and whatever works well in your hands. Over different speakers talked about wires going across the hinge, Takeuchi demonstrating his compression technique, and um, Mathieu, Christian, Adrian going through the um, hinge wire technique also. And we now know it's an important part of your correction. We know that robotic surgery allows for a reduced effect on the soft tissue, and hopefully this will reduce the amount of discomfort patients get. Going on to the results, we know that osteotomies demonstrate a great functional results. Um, however, what remains a mystery is where do we correct to? When it comes to partial knee replacements, we really learned well yesterday that if somebody is in varus, to keep them in varus and not go over too far into the lateral side. Robotic surgery is, is very useful at doing that, and hopefully the National Joint Registry will support what our speakers were talking about yesterday. Both options offer high levels of activity. So today's theme is about osteotomy meets ligaments, as Adrian, Adrian said. We're going to be looking at how important the slope is, and Sachin from India is going to be chairing that session. We're then going to go over to Ronald uh, from Holland, and he's going to look at slope change and the effects on cruciate ligaments. Adrian is going to be uh, uh, looking at the osteotomy and the posterolateral corner. And I'm going to be chairing the last session on patellar instability and rotational malalignment. We'd like to thank our sponsors again um, for, for helping support education. These events are incredibly expensive to put on, and without their support, we just simply wouldn't be able to run them. So thank you so much to all the sponsors on here, um, on this slide. We're really grateful for your kind support. In particular, our platinum sponsor, uh, the London Clinic. This is the home of the London Osteotomy Centre. It's one of the largest private hospitals in the UK, and they are focused on de delivering fantastic patient care, research and innovation, and focusing on education and training, which is why it's been a natural home for us to carry out our surgeries. Our welcome surgeons and physiotherapists, all allied healthcare professionals, to come and visit us. This is a pertinent case that we're going to be talking about today, looking at slope change and its role in um, managing the ligaments um, and something we're going to look at a bit later on. So I would please ask if you could kindly, fill out, um, kindly put your questions through the Glissa platform. We had close to 100 questions yesterday fielded by Chris Wilson and putting them to the faculty. That was an integral part of our meeting yesterday and would love to see the same again today. Please fill out the evaluation forms. The links are on the website and on the platform. And we know that CPD is an important part of everybody's education and portfolio and revalidation. And to get access to, to this and the course content and to cover the cost of the meeting as a charge of £50 to get, get these. So please do uh, do that. Just some housekeeping rules, please, to all the faculty. No phones, no children, no animals in the background. And just to say, if you're interested in visiting us or just getting an um, education from the gentlemen that are, that are surrounding my picture, Adrian, Ronald and Christian, I've had a fantastic education from these guys. And despite having just become a consultant in the last two and a half years, I still feel like I'm on a fellowship. So please do come and visit. Finally, ESCA. Thank you so much to ESCA for supporting this event. Um, they're integral in providing education. It's a large community. The Congress is a fantastic educational event. And uh, both Adrian and I and a lot of the faculty are involved with the osteotomy and arthroscopy committees. So do get involved with ESCA. Um, save the date on the 19th of, um, uh, sorry, the 11th and 15th of May 20, 2021. Please do attend. It's going to be a virtual Congress and it looks like a really exciting lineup. Uh, the membership includes a, a regular journal, um, which you can get um, a copy of, and 25% reduction on the ESCA publications. So please do sign up. To follow what we're doing today, look at the social media. You'll find us on Twitter and on LinkedIn. Um, and these are our Twitter handles. Brilliant. Hand over to David and the team. Hello and welcome to London Knee Osteotomy. This is a very quick guide on how the platform works and how to get the most of your meeting. So it's very simple. You'll see here a live session, which is the main meeting today. You simply click on the live session and that opens up the main window. Here 
in the middle here is the main feed for the meeting and we have social media feeds here and also a question and answers uh, tab here if you want to ask a question simply click on the plus and that will ask a question click submit and that question will appear in the column here questions are moderated so please do allow a little bit of time for the questions to appear and also for them to be answered by the faculty in addition if you have a menu here it'll take you back to the main agenda you'll be able to have a look at other content so for example we have a list of all of the sponsors you literally just click on this double click here and you'll see some promotional information as well as details on websites magazines and various other opportunities to look at products and services available to you you can literally click here to back to the main event the other thing you can see here as well is we have um, a virtual exhibition so you click here you'll be asked to register to enter the exhibition hall but just the once and this will take you to a feed here and you can see all of the supporters for the meeting literally just click on the more info for each particular company and that will give you access to a range of videos and you can scroll across also images download PDFs and also there's links to social media too. There's also a chat function here. Uh, clicking here, you'll be able to have chats with sponsors and delegates who are in the exhibition hall. And if you really fancy a bit of uh, light relief, if you click on here, we actually have a Space Invaders game, which, uh, well, it's just a little bit of fun for people. Uh, see who can win and get the most points. To get back to the main uh, plenary session, just click on the orange G for Glissa and give it a few seconds and you're back into the exhibition hall. So thank you very much and enjoy the meeting. So now we have the one hour industry session and we're gonna be covering innovations in plate technology we're also going to be looking at new meniscal repair devices. We've got a session on orthobiologics. And finally, we're going to be covering uh, saw technology uh, such that we can make osteotomy and other procedures safer using the precision saw. So we're going to kick off with James Robinson. He's going to be speaking to us in the first session which, with the uh, active motion plate dedicated to ACL surgery. So this is a very clever plate because there's two divergent screws that go away from each other uh, at the front and in the middle, creating a nice space for our ligament to come through. And James has got a great video on this. Thank you. So I've been asked to talk about my experience to doing combined high tip osteotomies uh, with soft tissue and ligament procedures, particularly using the Nuclip Active Motion Ligamento Plate. Now I come to this for a background of revision ACL, where we know that doing a revision is not just doing another ACL and avoiding another failure is to adopt a meticulous approach and as Peter Ma has once uh, said, don't just cross your fingers harder next time. And really the most important factor is to try and work out why did the first reconstruction fail? And we know that varus alignment, particularly when accompanied with thrust, increases tension in no, not only the lateral structures, but also the anterocruciate ligament. Uh, and this algorithm has been put forward by a number of surgeons, including Tim Spaulding, Peter Verdonk. And essentially what this says is, for example, a meniscal transplant is likely to be compromised if there's in ligament instability or malalignment. And similarly, any cartilage procedure, um, all of those factors have to be addressed beforehand in order for the cartilage uh, procedures to succeed. So what does the literature tell us about combination of ACL reconstruction with high tibial osteotomy? Well, if you look, unfortunately, at some of the older literature, you'll see that actually the literature is not great with this paper reporting high levels of complications with uh, loss of extension, 7% overcorrection needing for re revision, 
um, perineal nerve injuries. And in the simultaneous ACL and HTL group, um, six complications in five out of eight patients. So perhaps not that encouraging. But I think part of the problem with this was the issues with combining surgery with the older generations of fixation. And you can see whether it be a PUDU plate or these staple uh, closing wedge procedures, uh, or what I learned on, on my fellowship over on the top right, all of these are compromised by trying to do it around an ACL uh, tunnel. Even the, uh, what I suppose would be considered gold standard plate uh, has issues. And uh, when I used to do these combined revision ACL procedures with osteotomy uh, in my stint in Abu Dhabi with uh, Ronald van Heerwarden, um, you know, Ronald would do the osteotomy and leave out this anterior screw because there was almost always conflict with the tibial tunnel. And you can see in this case where the screw has had to be removed and so there's only two screws in those, the proximal aspect of the plate. So this plate was attractive, very much from the point of view of being able to position screws around the tibial tunnel. And uh, the osteotomy could be performed and the plate used without any compromise to that or the tunnel. One of the advantages for me is the ability to perform the osteotomy, hold it open with the wedge, and then drill the tibial tunnel and leave the drill in the tunnel. So when the plate is then applied to the tibia, the screws can be directed around the tunnel. I'll take you through the step-by-step -step approach to this in a sawbones demonstration. And I think it's easier to see the individual steps to the procedure. So you see here, I tend to use a biplane distal cut for these combined procedures. And this allows me to take the osteotomy a little bit more distal. You'll see us marking the depth of the uh, cut on the precision saw. And then this is all very standard for an HTO, but perhaps that cut is a little bit more distal than usual in order to allow enough room in the proximal segment to uh, get the tibial tunnel in. A reasonably long distal biplane uh, the osteotomy is then opened in the standard fashion with osteotomes, but then held, as I said, mentioned earlier, with one of these wedges, which is uh, the number of millimetres as required. The tibial tunnel is then drilled in standard way using a, a 2.4 millimetre guide pin and then over drilled to the size of the graft. That drill is then left in place. So when the plate is positioned, these variable angle screws can be drilled knowing that if it's uh, going to impinge on the tunnel, it's going to hit the drill in the tunnel and then deflect. You'll notice that my wedge is placed very posteriorly, and this is allowing me to achieve an asymmetric gap to make sure that we don't end up with a increased tibial slope. Screws are then positioned. And then once that's all been done, we can take the wedge out, drill out, and then we pass the graft. I usually do the femoral tunnel preparation before any of the osteotomy. Achieving this asymmetrical gap is absolutely critical in combined ACL procedures. If you forget this AP slope, it can end with disaster. You can see that in this case, surgeon has nicely corrected the alignment in the coronal plane with the osteotomy but he's forgotten about the slope. And you can see the patient ends up in a worse position than they started with, with this fixed anterior translation as the femur just rolls back down that slope. So in this case, uh, this is a two-stage procedure in a 45-year-old female. On the uh, middle image here, this very enlarged tibial tunnel, which I've ended up bone grafting. And you can see that we've corrected the alignment uh, with the images on the left. Uh, the bone grafting was performed, then we came back and did the ACL revision. You can see we've not ended up with this position of the femur rolling down the slope because we've managed to create this asymmetric gap in order to uh, slightly reduce the tibial slope. So here she is one year post-op uh, with the second stage uh, procedure done and the plate removed. Measuring the slope can be done on the short lateral with the drawing of two uh, circles and then taking a line through the centre of these 
and then measuring a perpendicular to that and then the slope. But for revision ACLs, I much prefer to do these weight bearing long leg alignment films because this actually shows you the situation under load and will show and demonstrate any anterior translation of the tibia. And you can see in this case, there's no way that the uh, tunnel, even if anatomically positioned, is not going to get impinged on by the roof of the notch. So this is a good indication for thinking about slope change. One of the nice things that Nuclip offer is a PSI service where cases can be planned pretty meticulously. And this is a case lent to me by my colleague, Nick Howells in Bristol. And you can see that he's uh, aiming for a biplane correction. And by making two different cuts in the uh, anterior aspect of the tibia and posterior uh, aspect of the tibia, he's able to use those two different cut planes in order to rock the uh, tibia forward in, and cause a reduction in the slope. Uh, and you can see in the final product, this very nice correction of the tibial slope with the PSI system allowing for very precise planning of the osteotomy, particularly if a slope change biplane is required. So it's not just varus alignment that can compromise ACLs. You can see, for example, in this 23 year old girl, not only is she a failed ACL reconstruction, but she's in significant valgus with lateral wear here on the MRI scan. So for her, we were going to do a combination of a closing wedge high tibial osteotomy, revision ACL and, and lateral extra articular plasty. The osteotomy closing wedge is performed. The gap is then progressively closed. And then we place something up into the tunnel in order to ensure that when the plate is applied, the screws are then directed around the tunnel as we showed in the sawbones video. What's nice about this plate is that you can see in the left hand image there really is very little addition to the incision with the final product on the right medial closing wedge tibial osteotomy correcting her to a neutral mechanical axis and then the revision ACL and lateral extra articular procedure. In terms of other combined surgeries, uh, this uh, works well with PCL reconstruction. Now, obviously for PCL, we want to take the slope uh, the other way. So it doesn't matter if we increase the slope a little bit. Uh, in fact, that is likely to favor the PCL. Um, so you can see in this 30 year old with a medial femoral condyle lesion, varus and PCL deficiency. So here you can see his clinical examination with significant uh, posterior step off and draw. We're going to do the osteotomy as standard, uh, medial opening wedge, so protecting the neurovascular structures with a swab. The guide wire is placed. This osteotomy is a little bit more proximal. Um, and when I insert the wedge, it's going to be relatively anterior because I don't mind increasing the tibial slope. And indeed, the plate is going to be placed posterior to that wedge, um, allowing me to deliberately increase the slope a little to favor the PCL. So the plate is then applied and then uh, fixated. And you can see here the uh, result of the osteotomy. And I found for PCL uh, reconstruction, it's not necessary uh, to do the drill tunnel and then place the plate on. You can actually do the osteotomy first, fix it. And then because of the position of the screws, you can drive the tunnel in uh, without worrying about the plate position as shown here on the right. You can see the final correction to the lateral tibial spine, offloading the medial compartment. And in the images on the right, I think you agree that we've increased slightly the tibial slope uh, from preoperatively, and that has now favoured the PCL reconstruction. In terms of other surgeries, such as meniscal root repair, you can see here this gentleman, a 42-year-old fireman, presented with a medial root avulsion. Now, interestingly, he's at a more advanced stage of disease on the right knee, but we actually, he presented to me acutely uh, with a pop uh, and feeling something go on the medial side. And you can see on these axial images, this classic Laprad type 2 root tear. We went on to perform, because of his degree of varus, a medial opening wedge high tibial osteotomy. I think this root repair would not have worked without an osteotomy. And you can see here the root has been avulsed. It's relatively recent from the bleeding. And we performed a root repair using two millimeter tape. 
Now, once those tapes have been passed across the posterior horn of the medial meniscus, they can be then shuttled down the transosseous tunnel and then simply tied onto the osteotomy plate uh, for fixation. Here his correction uh, to the lateral tibial spine and what's interesting is when we reviewed him at four years he's still active in the fire service and he's not gone on to develop medial joint space narrowing uh, whereas compared to the right knee you can see he's gone on to much more advanced disease uh, where I, I mean I think we just simply caught this left knee earlier in the disease process at the time of the root tear and he's now actually come back for an osteotomy to his right knee. In terms of meniscal allograft transplantation, I'm a member of the International Meniscus Reconstruction Forum, and in our consensus paper in uh, 2015, 93% of surgeons would perform an osteotomy if alignment was unfavourable for a meniscal allograft. Previous studies have shown that about 19% of meniscal allografts are with an osteotomy, and the results can be more favourable than uh, a mat alone. Here's the graph from that paper showing that if the uh, mechanical axis was within five degrees of, of, of malalignment, 90% of surgeons uh, performing an osteotomy if the axis is unfavorable. So here's the example case, a 27 year old man with instability and pain. He's had two previous ACL reconstructions uh, and now a medial meniscectomy and the MRI confirmed a further graft rupture and with a pretty deficient medial compartment in terms of meniscus and we went on to do a combination procedure of uh, osteotomy taking his correction to the lateral tibial spine revision acl reconstruction and meniscal allograft transplantation if we look at his six-year post-op scores which were done fairly recently you can see that his one-year scores uh, have been maintained so all domains of coups increased and those scores being maintained in orange uh, out to six years. In terms of primary ACL reconstruction with high tibial osteotomy I, I think this is something I'm, I'm now in increasingly considering. I think osteotomy throughout this meeting we'll hear about it being a disease modifying operation and I think it probably prevents uh, OA progression to a degree. And so, for example, cases like this, where you've got a 36 year old man who he was a Polish chap who'd uh, injured his knee playing football age 24 and had his ACL managed conservatively, but had then gone on to uh, a subsequent meniscal tear. Uh, he had a meniscectomy and then years later presented to me with pain and instability. And you can see he's already got some early joint space narrowing. The meniscus is deficient and he's in varus. So I did a combination of the high tibial osteotomy as we've shown. So the wedge is placed, the tunnel is drilled, and then the plate applied on around the tunnel to make sure we don't uh, conflict. And then the, the wedge is removed and the graph taken up. You can see here are his post-operative images. And on the right, under weight bearing load, you see we're not seeing that anterior tibial translation that concerns us. We've not increased the slope. Uh, and he's gone on to do well. So my take home points is I think my threshold for these combined procedures is increasing. I think this uh, new clip active motion ligamento plate uh, really is favorable for doing combined cruciate procedures. Uh, HDO I do think is a disease modifying operation. Also for the combined procedures, your, your best soft tissue reconstruction may be an osteotomy, particularly with the PCL where uh, a medial opening wedge is easy to increase the tibial slope to favor the PCL. And please don't forget the slope, it's terribly important. Many thanks for your attention. Thanks, James. That was a fantastic demonstration on how to use the active motion plate. The next session is sponsored by Dupuy, and we're going to be um, looking at the modern concepts around the knee particularly a meniscal all-inside repair system, repairing the root. This session is going to be presented by Professor Zafagnini from the Rizzoli Institute in Bologna. We're really lucky for, for us to have him present this to us, and I hope you enjoy the video. Thank you. We start speaking about meniscal repair using all inside suture device, so the famous MyTech Truspan. 
And uh, this is my place where I work. And uh, as, you, as Maria says, uh, I am at the Rizzoli Institute in Bologna, that is the oldest orthopedic hospital of Italy. And is a research center also. So we have two buildings, one of hospital and one of a research center. So this is my disclosure. And uh, you know that the meniscus in the 70s and 80s, it was like a thing that we could remove without any problem. And uh, if you can break, you can remove without any problem to the joint. But this, it happens uh, just in the 40 years ago, but now the things are changing. And in fact, uh, if you look at the literature, the literature about 2000, you can see how much uh, the consequence of a catastrophic effect of having a meniscectomy in the joint. In fact, just a simple small meniscectomy can increase peak pressure, decrease contact area, increase shear stress, and also increase tibial translation. So you have also problem about laxity. And in fact, this is a paper that we published uh, two years ago where we did in vivo evaluation of the effect of a meniscectomy. And in fact, after a ECR reconstruction, if you have a medial meniscus lesion, you have a laxity, increased laxity of more than two millimeters, even if you do a single meniscectomy. So there is a detrimental effect of having a meniscectomy in your joint. And there are also some problems. This is a 15 years old female volleyball player. She has partial meniscectomy three years ago. And you see how much is deteriorated the lateral part of the joint due to the meniscus deficiency and how is the joint. In a 15 years old lady, this cannot be happened. And in fact, this is a long-term study about the uh, effect of meniscectomy. This is two, pap two papers published by SFA. And in fact, at 10 years, we have a 22% of lateral meniscal OA after a lateral meniscectomy. And uh, at 20 years, we have more than 50% of OA after lateral meniscectomy compared to the healthy knee. So definitely, this is a really a bad situation for our joint. And, uh, there are also new possibilities, and in fact, uh, in the last uh, maybe 10 years, there are new lesions of the menisci that has come out that are really also more detrimental for the laxity of the joint. In fact, this is a ramp lesion. You see a dissection of the posterior horn of the middle of lateral meniscus that has shown to have, a, if you have a ramp lesion uh, associated to ACL, you see how it's increased the laxity. And when you repair, you have a, a suture that uh, is similar to the normal joint. So there is a possibility to have, when you have this type of lesion, you should try to uh, repair. And uh, you see when you repair the meniscus and you repair this type of lesion, you have a sort of effect that is similar to the ACL intact. So this is the real. And this is the ramp tier, is normally 970% of the associated with ACL. And is, uh, the MRI sensitivity is not too high, 77%. And this is the problem, they have a higher degree of static and dynamic laxity. So we have, we have a grade three, 41%, and grade three pivot in 47% of the cases. So this is really detrimental for the joint and for the knee. So the ramper tear must be repaired. And also there is a root tear, that is the new lesion that is the posterior medial or posterior lateral menisci, where there is inserted, and there is a, a sort of detaching of this insertion of the posterior horn. That is about three, 0.6 or 4.3% of all the meniscal tears. And this is the classification of Laprade, where we can see that there is a partial root tear type one, there is a type two, where it's a complete radial root tear, and then there are more complex uh, cases where you can have a complete root plus a bucket handle, and then you can have an oblique tear into the attachment, and you have a root with evolution, that this could be probably the only one that could be really fixed uh, with maybe suturing and uh, with some uh, screw or some tunnel for me. And the effect of these root tears, you see that in vitro, the kinematic effect of this is really detrimental. In fact, you have an increased uh, contact pressure, you have a decreased contact area, and in, in vitro, this has been shown in vivo, and in vivo you have a increased lateral tibial translation, and you have a medial compartment and increased mobility. So definitely, again, there is a problem and you have increased the laxity of the joint itself. And you see that the stress on the cartilage is becoming wider and higher. And then we'll have a deterioration of the joint during it, if you don't treat this type of lesion. And there is a guidelines from meniscus expert that it happens when we had the, the meniscus meeting in uh, 219. And in fact, uh, the message of this uh, meeting was repair whenever possible especially in the lateral meniscus, because 
the lateral meniscus that has a high mobility. If you have to remove the lateral meniscus, you have an increased peak stress on the joint and on the cartilage of the lateral compartment that really can give very bad situation in a very short time. And this is very bad. So now there is a trend, and I think after this meeting, we have seen a very increase of a repairing procedure done mostly. And this is a, fourth, a nice study that is, came out in 2018. And you see this is a New York database where we have 650,000 procedures. And you can see that uh, at least in 2018, 97% was still meniscectomy and only 3% of repair. And if you look at the age group, you see that the removal was more in the age of more than 45 patients, 45 years. But you can see that the repair has a lot of increasing in the last uh, two, four years for the patient that is younger. So definitely, especially in young population, we try, all the surgeons are trying to repair as much as they can of the menisci, even if they have lesions that maybe, maybe 20 years ago we would think it would be irreparable. But now we try to preserve because what we have seen is that even if you repair a menisci and then you have to turn back in the joint because the suture was not functioning, the meniscus that you have to remove is less if you have done on the first time. So general indication for meniscal repair should be longitudinal lesion, 25, 30% of the peripheral part. Normally it should be red, red zone, but now also white, red zone, I think is, uh, should be done, at least in the young population. And obviously you need to have a stable knee and you have less than four grade Calgary and Lawrence. And the technique that you can use is the all inside. That is my preferred technique because uh, since I have started with the uh, uh, fast fix at the beginning and now through spam, my, um, my suturing of a different technique like outside in or inside out is very, very low. I would say that I use only outside in for the anterior horn sometimes, but it become more rarely when I now I'm using a 24 degree uh, true spam that is really helpful in the anterior horn of the lateral and medial menisci and it helped me a lot. So what is the effect of a meniscal repair? You have a biomechanical effect that restores normal laxity and pressure, and this is in vitro. And these are the results of the clinical uh, results of uh, some uh, meniscus repair. And these uh, were all the implants. So you see that the literature is old. And you have also about 24% of medial repair and lateral repair that failed. And there was no difference between medial and lateral. And uh, Meniscal repair is allowed to preserve meniscal tissue even after failure. And you can see these are the results of the meniscal repair compared to meniscectomy. And you can see that definitely there is an improvement and there is better long-term outcome compared to meniscectomy. And there is long-term protective effect and you have healing rate that increases if there is a concomitant ACI reconstruction. And this is important. You see how is the percentage of calcare and Lorenz before a meniscectomy that is a high percentage of increased uh, degenerative changes. While if you have a repair, you see how many, no grade two, grade three, or grade four Cagran Lawrence in your joint. So definitely there is a, a protective effect of the meniscus repair compared to meniscectomy for degenerative changes. So the ramp tier clinical outcome, these are results of the last uh, new lesion that we found. These are different type of suturing that has been used. So this is the ramp uh, trying to suture by the posterior medial uh, suturing uh, portal. And uh, this uh, in increasing a 6.8 of failures in two years follow up. And this is the root, uh, 45 knees, 2.5 years follow up. Uh, and there is again 7% of failure. And there is a lesion of OMAC improvement. But there is an extrusion at one year predict uh, mid-term clinical radiographic outcome. So you need to really try to preserve as much as you can of the extrusion to have a, a good uh, joint performance. But you see this technique is quite uh, time consuming. And especially if you have to do com combine with an ACL, it takes uh, a lot of time and it takes uh, to do maybe two tunnels instead of one on the tibia. So meniscal repair, all inside versus inside out. This is my technique. It's a shorter operative time. Why I use all inside? There is no association with nerve injury, no need for one more incision. And you have similar clinical failure rate and subjective outcome. And there is no significant difference in meniscal healing rate. So definitely why you have to use a so different technique and so tedious technique with respect to all inside that is very quick and fast 
And with the true spam with the gun, it's very simple. And it's uh, even simpler than uh, fast fix. So let's see some cases where uh, we can show how we do. So this is a normal uh, lat posterior horn of the middle mini sky. And uh, this case is a uh, try to shoot her. And uh, you see, I didn't even touch the meniscus, just uh, trying to go and uh, try to shoot the, the menisci and to uh, really try to, um, I would say, uh, to try to go to very to tight the two parts of the menisci that are detached in order to really have a very nice rim and very close rim of the menisci. And in this case, you see that I do a sort of panino uh, shooting uh, device and like a sandwich. So I go up and down of the mini sky in order to have a really suturing of and uh, to have a sort of very strict uh, conflict between the two type of lesion, the two edge of the lesion. So this is my first case. So then I have a second case that is a ramp lesion. You see that I go back, I do this uh, uh, going with the joint in the back and the posterior horn of the middle mini sky. And you see that there is a definitely a lesion there. So you go back and now you try to shoot the, this mini sky that is a little bit unstable. It's not so bad, but if you live like that in a, in a few years, you can have a, a less functioning of this mini sky. And then you have to, to deal with the problem for the joint. And in this case, with the true spam again, it's quite simple. You see, it doesn't take too much time. You just have to go posterior and to fix. And in this case, you should go more in an extended position with the joint in order to catch the posterior edge of this lesion and in order to combine and to fix the two parts. And you see that there, there is no way. And then we do maybe another, another suture to fix and to have a real lesion of the both side. And in this case, I normally also, again, at the edge of the lesion, in the more medial side, I go with the sandwich way of doing the suturing. And in this case, you know that this is the way. You see? And I try also to maybe a little bit enlarge the point in order to have a better, you see, fixing of the device. And in this case, it's really helpful. And at the end, the lesion is nice. So this is a all inside repair for a root lesion. And you see, this is the lateral mini sky that is very mobile. And you can see this is the closing of the insertion, how close is the PCL. And you can see how close is the PCL. And you need to have to think that the lateral mini sky is also connected to the PCL by the Amphrey, Dave Riesberg and Amphrey ligaments. And this is my technique that I will show in this, uh, in this video. So this is just a, a silicon uh, trying. And you see, I normally go to the posterior horn of the insertion, and then I go to pick up the PCL and see what happens to the mini sky when you have to release. And you go to the, you see how you tight and you see how much is uh, connecting and how much is tensioning the device. So this is a 24 years for male foldable player, no contact injury. She has this uh, lateral side lesion. And you can see that is a, uh, he has an ACL, but also he has this uh, uh, posterior horn root tear that is a sort of lengthening of this uh, tear. She was not, uh, you see, how much it can be when you leave it, you, how much is uh, going back uh, the menisci. So the menisci is intact, but the insertion is not really well inserted and well fixed to the joint because of probably connected to the ACL. So what we do normally in this case, what we do, I normally go, to pick up this uh, part of the menisci, and then I go to, to pick up the PCL. And so for me, it's very simple way to do it. And you see that the, the insertion of the, of the lateral menisci is coming up, and you see that the menisci is much more fixed and is much more straight, and you see that how the meniscus is no more back and is uh, again in the good position. So this is how it works. And again, this is a six month follow up, and you see it's quite good and the patient is doing fine and this is a volleyball play. So for me, I think uh, the conclusion that all inside meniscus repair give a satisfactory clinical outcome is also indicated in complex and new lesion like the root and the ramp. Actually, I found very, very easy to use in this type of technique, especially when you have not uh, so uh, very big detachment of this type of lesion. 
and this fast technique with very low complication, and also try to repair, as I say, the meniscus whenever possible, because this is the message that we should do. And uh, you see, this is the indication for this type of technique. So just as this type of lesion, partial root tear, complete radial root tears, where you should fix, and this oblique tear. These are the main indication for this type of technique that I show you, because in this case, instead of having a tunnel and to, to be struggling uh, some uh, making tunnel and uh, to have a loop of suturing that you have to pull down in the tunnel, then this uh, simple and easy technique is very short in your time and is very helpful to avoid any problem. So with this, I think I have closed my presentation and uh, thank you very much for having me with you. Okay, so now we're going to move on to uh, orthobiologics, and Jennifer uh, is going to present to us uh, some of the innovative work that Biomet Zimmer have been doing uh, in this um, in this uh, in this field. So over to Jennifer now, and let's hear about Biomet Zimmer's intraarticular therapies. Thank you. to have the opportunity to discuss with you today treatments for intraarticular injection. Um, I know this meeting is about extraarticular repair, but I wanted to uh, put in your mind the thought that while you're also balancing extraarticularly, there can be inflammatory processes that have already begun inside the joint and potentially um, an adjuvant to uh, fix or slow down that inflammatory process could potentially improve your outcomes. So I will discuss a, a novel intraarticular injection that is blood-based that is called Instride APS. Um, we've been working on this particular program uh, for over 14 years. So we have quite a bit of data. And, and in fact, in this presentation, I'm gonna uh, share new data with you on what we know about the effect and who this um, in therapy works on. So just briefly, what we're trying to uh, intervene in is the uh, inflammatory, the local inflammatory process inside the joint of osteoarthritis. We know it's not a systemic inflammatory disease, but it is a local inflammatory disease. And it is driven by IL-1 and TNF-alpha, which in fact um, starts and continues the breakdown of cartilage. And we end up with um, lack of homeostasis in the joint. So this therapy is trying to provide antagonists to IL-1 and TNF-alpha to slow down or stop that breakdown process. It is a blood-based process that can be prepared point of care in 20 minutes. Uh, the collection of the output is about three milliliters that contains white blood cells, some platelets, and concentrated plasma. I want to point your attention to the white blood cells because the main antagonists to IL-1 and TNF-alpha are actually found in monocytes and neutrophils. And this is just a schematic. We call this output an autologous anti-inflammatory as opposed to a PRP because we want to focus on those anti-inflammatory cytokines. We collect white blood cells in the first spin and then we mix them with polyacrylamide beads in a second device, which allows for further concentration of those anti-inflammatory cytokines. Then there's a filter that prevents the beads from coming into the output. And then you have this highly concentrated anti-inflammatory solution to inject within the joint. Just to show you how um, Instride APS fits in the scheme of autologous therapies, uh, you can see the white blood cell counts of pure PRPs, leukocyte rich PRPs. Instride has more white blood cells than any of those products but much less than a concentrated bone marrow aspirate. And when we look at the output, you can see four subjects that have 
osteoarthritis and not rheumatoid arthritis. We have high concentrations of the antagonists, IL-1-RA, SIL-1, and then STNFR1 and R2, without also highly concentrating IL-1 and TNF-alpha. However, we definitely keep our eyes on these inflammatory cytokines and then look at the ratio between these two. We try to have a goal of at least a thousand times IL-1-RA to IL-1. And we've shown in vitro that um, APS can block enzymatic production from chondrocytes stimulated by IL-1 and TNF-alpha. We've shown then that we can also reduce the amount of cartilage breakdown from explants. And finally, we've shown that uh, we can reduce inflammation from activated macrophages like those cells found in the synovium. So in vitro, the mechanism of action does appear to be anti-inflammatory. We then repeated this in animals and have shown both um, reduction, uh, a protection of uh, cartilage reduction inside a joint and decreased wear from a meniscal injury. We have also done large animal studies in uh, animals with naturally occurring um, osteoarthritis, both in horses and dogs, and shown um, significant reduction in pain. So that moved to a fairly extensive clinical evidence program. And uh, we have a lot of these studies finally done. So I'm looking forward to sharing the data with you. We did two phase one studies um, in unilateral osteoarthritis, a phase two pilot. We did a registry uh, there in the UK. And then we've run two uh, pivotal studies, both in the US and Europe, and uh, an investigated initiated trial looking specifically at telephemoral osteoarthritis. And down here below are the markets that Instrite is for sale in currently. So to start with those, um, just briefly, those safety trials, we did do safety trials because this, this product does contain white blood cells and we wanted to make sure it was safe. These are unilateral subjects with KL2 or 3. And in both trials, uh, the one performed in Europe and one in the United States, we had about a 70% reduction in Womack pain in the knee, both at six months here and one year. And interestingly, in uh, the, that very first trial, we did see that high responders uh, correlated to the amount of IL-1RA to IL-1 ratio in the joint. Those subjects that had over a thousand were the high, high MRAC or C responders, and the three that didn't actually went on to get total knees. We then moved to a phase two trial to understand the effect size between, uh, in a blinded fashion, between Instride APS and saline, again, in the same patient population. And at one year uh, in Womack pain, this is percent improvement, we had a significant improvement in pain uh, of those subjects, and this has been published in American Journal of Sports Medicine. We just recently carried um, this data out to three years and have published that just this year in American Journal of Sports Medicine as well. And you can see uh, that uh, still at three years from a single injection with no other therapy, we still have um, a significant improvement in pain. Uh, the registry that we opened in the United Kingdom is also complete, and we are drafting a manuscript on this data now. It is also looking at one year. What is interesting about the registry is that it was all comers, any level of OA, KL grade, and any level of pain, unilateral or bilateral. And uh, in this real world study, we did, again, this is looking at Coos pain, had a significant improvement in pain. Um, most of the uh, inclusion-exclusion criteria for studies uh, excludes patellofemoral osteoarthritis. So we had an investigator look specifically at patellofemoral osteoarthritis in perimenopause and menopausal women, because this is um, a, a group that struggle with um, patellofemoral osteoarthritis and, and many injections are, uh, don't work as well. So we examined APS in this patient population. And um, in, this is the one study where we've actually looked at dosing. So this is the Coos score at one year uh, for the subjects that uh, received one injection had significant improvement in pain. 
And those subjects that were not happy with their pain at three months received a second dose. And then by their 12 month time point, there was no difference at their um, 12 month data to their one injection cohort. So those that were not as um, strong responders with the first injection appeared to do better after receiving the second one. Um, an interesting finding in this trial was that the subjects that had more synovitis at the beginning of the trial measured by MRI actually, I'm sorry, um, uh, measured by ultrasound actually uh, improved more than those that didn't. So that was uh, interesting in terms of the mechanism. Um, so now uh, I'd like to talk about uh, a double-blind pivotal trial we ran in the United States. This was a double-blind study against saline. Um, this was 28 centers, uh, 332 subjects, and a one-to-one -one randomization against saline. The primary outcome was at one year. And um, again, it was unilateral symptomatic early to mid osteoarthritis. Uh, the randomization was 172 APS patients and 160 saline patients. And then you can see based on uh, baseline carried forward data, forward data are subjects that exited due to knee pain and then uh, missing data for those that exited for other reasons than the total available at the end of the study. This is the effect of that single injection of Instride at one year. It was greater than 50% improvement in pain in the population. Unfortunately, saline also did as well, and we did not find a significant difference. So we were obviously disappointed in those results. However, when we looked into the data, we found several interesting facts. One, here are all of the clinical trials of Instride lined up on one graph. And you can see, based on randomization, uh, the effect of uh, the, the effect at 12 months. So no randomization, two to one randomization, one to one randomization and active control randomization. So uh, the, the design of the study certainly influences how the product outcomes. But more importantly, uh, we found that the uh, saline subjects took more rescue medication, which was acetaminophen and restricted medication, which is anything else at all time points. And there was a significant influence on outcome measures based on that medication they used. Um, also, we had more subjects withdrawal due to uh, in the saline group than the Instride APS group. So we tried to combine all of those factors into a responder analysis, combining percent pain reduction, amount of medication use, and study exit. And in fact, uh, when we applied that responder criteria to the data, we found a significant difference between groups. Um, obviously, that's not how we uh, designed the study and wanted the outcome to be, but we learned a lot by uh, keeping someone on saline for one year is, is quite a, an ask. And they, in fact, do use quite a bit of medication in order to manage their pain, even when they're in a, a double-blinded situation. Um, in this study also, we did full characterization of the output to see if there's any correlation between responders and non-responders. And interestingly, if we look at their pain improvement at 12 months and the ratio of IL-1-RA to IL-1, uh, you can see the orange line or the average of all of the subjects. Um, but this is their pain percent improvement as a function of the ratio. And subjects that had under 1,000 IL-1-RA to IL-1 were less likely to be responders than those, the, the remaining subjects. And again, you can actually see this increase at greater than 8,000, but the majority of the subjects um, are over 1,000 and are hitting uh, the median. And this effect was not seen in the saline group. So we measured the ratio in the saline subjects, um, but it didn't influence their percent improvement in pain because they were injected with saline. So again, this is supportive, uh, not it doesn't prove it, but it is supportive that that ratio is in fact potentially driving the mechanism of APS in the joint. And uh, finally, we have also completed at least um, our two-year data 
in an ongoing uh, trial comparing Instride with Sinvesquan, hyaluronic acid in Europe. Um, we had 252 subjects in 16 centers, again, the primary endpoint at one year, and we're following these subjects out to five years. Um, here's the breakdown, uh, and it was very similar to the trial in the U.S. where both groups improved significantly from baseline, and we didn't detect a difference between the groups at one year. Um, and again, uh, interestingly, this was with against an active comparator. We had more study exits in the hyaluronic acid group and more use of restricted medication in the hyaluronic acid group than Instride. So using that same um, responder criteria, uh, we again found a significant difference at the, um, when, we compare, when we combine pain reduction, medication usage, and study exits. So uh, moving forward, I think we learned a lot about these trial designs and we'll use this as our primary outcome um, so we don't have to do these post hoc at the end to understand um, how Instride is working and how it is uh, reducing pain medication and improving pain. Um, interestingly, this trial at one year, we allowed subjects to decide if they wanted a second injection or not. And their amount of pain at one year drove that decision regardless of what therapy they had been randomized to. So still blinded, they made the choice to get no injection, try the same injection again, or cross over. Um, majority of the patients did in fact try their same injection again, but we did have subjects um, that crossed over and we learned something from them interestingly as well. So when we look at the majority of the subjects that received the same second injection, there was a significant difference from their 12 month data point to their 24 month data point in the Instride group, but that did not happen in the Synvis group. Um, again, we're following these subjects out to uh, five years. In the crossover group, so these subjects are crossed over, um, but they do not know which injection was which, but we asked them which was their patient preference. Did they prefer the first injection they received or the second? So in a blinded fashion, um, patients who've received both injections selected a preference. And that was statistically significant to prefer Instride over uh, the Simvisp one in this group. Um, so where we are now, uh, we've come a long way if you've heard me present on this topic before, um, but uh, what is next is we have actually completed that pilot study out to five years and we are writing that data up now. Um, and we're continuing to follow that European trial out to five years, as you've seen, I've just presented the two year data. We're still um, encouraging all of you to enter subjects into the ICRS registry that's free for you. Um, and is a really nice registry to track your patients. We have started a, a HIP trial in Australia. That study is done and we're collecting that data now. And this is our, our first um, adventure into HIP OA. And um, we're uh, gonna complete a new study in the United States with the FDA using that uh, responder criteria as the primary analysis that will become progress six. And we're in discussions with the FDA now on designing that trial. So I'm, I'm very happy to have the opportunity to present this to you and uh, thank you for your time. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, that was a brilliant talk um, for the event sponsored by Zuma Biomet. Uh, we're now going to go on to our next uh, sponsored event by Stryker. Uh, we're going to be looking at how to perform a minimally invasive high tibial osteotomy using the precision saw. This is something that I use routinely in my practice and it's just something that helps with um, protection from neurovascular injury. Um, so we hope you enjoy the talk. At the end of the talk, there's going to be a five minute pause before we start off with the first session of the of the day. Uh, so take a break and we'll be back five minutes after the next talk. Thank you.
First we see the imaging. This shows that in this case we are going for an 8.1 mm opening. We see the landmarks on this left knee. The pes anserinus is identified, which is three fingers below the joint line. The posterior border of the tibia and the anterior border of the tibia are marked. We want this incision to be slightly in the posterior half, which gives us better access to the posterior aspect of the osteotomy. You can see in this case we are going for a 4 cm incision. A longitudinal incision is made through the skin and down through to the fascia. At this point you can roll the hamstring tendons. We then identify the patella tendon and place a ring-handled spike. This protects the patella tendon when we make the ascending biplane cut at a later stage. Once this dissection is complete, we can then begin to release the soft tissues. We release the MCL, which is a critical part of this procedure, and you can see this being done. A clip is then placed inside the pes, and the hamstring tendons are released free from the tibia. This curved periosteal elevator is a very useful device to gently slip around the posterior aspect of the tibia and ensure that the soft tissues are released sufficiently to place a blunt homen, as can be seen. We are now in a position to place our wires. The entry point for this is just above the pes and aim to come out a centimetre and a half below the joint line, most commonly in line with the fibula head. A second wire is then placed. I begin to make the horizontal osteotomy and we make this such that we maintain the hinge so we don't go right the way into the lateral cortex, but stop five to seven millimeters short of the lateral cortex using the blunt homen to protect the neurovascular structures posteriorly. We are now marking out on the skin and the angle which is 110 degrees for the biplane cut, and we are going to make this in an ascending fashion, which is what we do in the vast majority of cases for any osteotomy which is 12 millimeters or less. The precision saw blade is used again through the bone by gently finishing with the osteotomes. These are gently tapped into place and using the surgeon's hands to feel them coming through on the opposite side. This osteotomy is now mobile and we can see that as we put the leg into valgus. The chisels are now inserted to gently dilate and open the osteotomy and these are stacked which can be seen in the fluoro. Two wires are placed either side of the osteotomy and used to open the osteotomy. The lamina spreader is placed against the two wires so there is nothing in the gap while it is opened. This makes the insertion of the bone wedge that much more straightforward. The anterior aspect of the wedge is chamfered such that it is half a millimetre to one millimetre less anteriorly compared to posteriorly. The wedge is finished, which is now measured as 8 mm at the back and 7 mm at the front. The bone wedge is then inserted and gently tapped into place. And once it's in place, we can then release the lamina spreader and we have complete control of the osteotomy and then we can remove the wires. The active motion plate is then taken and slipped into the soft tissues and a check x-ray is first made to check we are at the right height. And once we are happy it is at the right height, it's locked into place by first fixing proximally with a drill, measuring and then inserting appropriately sized screws. The second screw is going in and then the top four screws are locked into position and then the distal part of the plate is fixed. In this plate there are four distal screws. These screws are all bicortical. We now see the fluoro and also the plate in situ. We infiltrate a large volume dilute local anaesthetic into the soft tissues surrounding the osteotomy site. Finally, we see the check x-rays showing the plate in a very satisfactory position with the bone wedge and well fixed.
it's the sun when it starts to snow. Only know you love her when you let her go. Only know you've been high when you're feeling low. Only hate the road when you're missing home. Only know you love her when you let her go. Then you only need the light.
Welcome back, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining us for the first session today. We'd like to thank once again our platinum sponsors, the London Clinic. And as part of uh, their, um, their ethos, they're really innovating and really leading on the forefront for research within the London area in particular. And so we've got one of their main professors, Professor Hamand Kocha, who's just going to talk to us a little bit about the research activity that they're doing at the clinic. And uh, we'd like him to introduce and start the session for us today. Thank you. Good afternoon and welcome to the London Osteostomies event. My name is Hemant Kocher. I'm Professor of Liver and Pancreas Surgery at Queen Mary University of London. I've been working at the London Clinic as a consultant hepatobiliary and pancreatic surgeons since 2010. I've been appointed as the research director for the Clinical Research Center at the London Clinic since 2018. This has been an exciting time at the London Clinic, which has been at the forefront of medical innovation. We already are a complex super specialty hospital. And with the charitable status of the London Clinic, we are able to invest into medical innovation. A great example of this is the state of the art robotics theater suit, where we can perform complex surgery in the neck, thorax, abdomen, and pelvis with the help of wonderful instruments, which would have not been possible with open surgery. We also invest in research and clinical trials via the Clinical Research Center. For example, we do CAR T cell therapy, where patients are given the state of art treatment for cancers. We also do intraoperative radiotherapy, where radiotherapy can be combined during surgery when we're treating patients for cancer. Of interest for you would be studies such as marathon hip and marathon knee, where we perform serial MRI scans to look at the impact on the hip and knee during and after a marathon run. This has led to important discoveries. We hope You'll be able to also conduct research at the London Clinic. We hope you have a fantastic conference and all the best. Thank you very much. Okay, welcome everyone. We're going to kick off today's uh, session uh, with um, the slope. And Sachin, who's going to be uh, chairing this session, uh, will be leading. It's something that we're all really beginning to focus on more and more with our patients as we see it as a very powerful tool to stabilize unstable knees. So over to you, Sachin. Thank you for chairing. so much and uh, good morning good afternoon or good evening and uh, it's really nice to have uh, all our colleagues amongst all of us uh, initially have uh, james present the take on how we calculate and measure the slope over to you james brilliant thank you sachin um so i'm hoping we will see some slides and i was asked to really say how do we measure the slope um so that is I'm trying this uh, remote clicker, so we'll see if that uh, activates. And if it doesn't, which it doesn't seem to be, I'm going to ask the guys just to press the advance button, please. And that should bring up the next. So um, studies have shown really the way in which we measure that you can measure this in a number of ways. And I think what I'm going to talk about is that off the plane x-ray, which is something that's immediate to all of us. There have been numbers, a number of methods in how do we actually do this. What I've taken is the most accurate uh, methods in that in that analysis of inter-observer reliability. So the short film, the way we do this, I don't know. You just press advance, please. You draw two circles in the proximal uh, uh, tibia, and you can see those ideally should be 15 centimeters apart. And then you draw a line, advance, please, up through those. Uh, advance please yep and then keep going click please and that then you draw a 90 degree perpendicular to that 
and then click on again, please. The normal slope should be seven to nine degrees. So that's how we do it on the short film lateral. That's been shown to be more accurate than using that posterior cortex. You go to the next slide, please. Now, yeah, I'm sorry about my choice of socks in this video. That's me demonstrating how we uh, do a long leg lateral. Now, for this is a trick that I learned when I spent two years with, with Charlie Brown and, uh, and, and Ronald in, in Abu Dhabi, where this, I think, is the gold standard. It's been shown in those studies the most accurate measure. And if you, people say, well, how on earth do we do this? We simply use the standard X-ray that you would do a normal coronal plane alignment and we stand the patient in this position, and that gives us this standing lateral view. And I don't know if we can advance, click please. What we do is we draw a line across the tibial plafond, click on please. You then draw a line parallel to the tibial plateau, click on please. And then a line drawn 50% along those two lines. Click on please. And again, if we look at that now in zoom detail, you'll see that the that produces this and the further click, please. And that is then you draw a 90 degrees to the line you've drawn, and that then gives you the best measurement of tibial slope, accounting into the fact that you the way, the shape of the tibia. And if you click to the next slide, please. One of the other huge advantages of doing it in this is that you also get an assessment in the weight bearing knee of the amount of anterior tibial translation. So if you click forward, please, you'll see that you can see here, click forward, please. And again, you'll see there we are able to see the amount of tibial translation. And then again, forward, please. You can do this using MRI. The challenge is inter-observer reliability. And, and so the studies have shown, and so for me, the optimal way of measuring is using that long leg plane X-ray. Thank you. Thank you, James. And I think that brings us to the first part of this discussion. I think we all know very well that uh, you know there's a large ethnic variation amongst all these various slope values that we have. So let me start off with you, Bruce. Is that uh, you know when we're talking about normal slope? We have values all over the place, right from maybe uh, 4.9 degrees for, for Caucasians, which go high up to as much as 17 degrees of normal slope when you go off to the Oriental population. So in your practice, what do you consider as normal slope and do you take into account any ethnic variations for the same? Uh, well, thanks very much, Sasha, for the for the question, and just want to uh, thank Adrian and the organizers for this uh, tremendous honor uh, to be invited to speak with you today. So, you're 100 percent right. The the quote normal tibial slope is all over the map. There's a wonderful new study by Pangode and Olivier that are I believe at this meeting, uh, looking at normal uh, healthy individuals with CT scans. Uh, looking at uh, several hundred patients. And what they found essentially is that the, the mean slope on the medial side was about six degrees and on the lateral side was about five degrees with quite a lot of variation. So it ranged between let's say two and 10 degrees. Uh, if you speak to uh, uh, Philippe Neret, he'll say that the normal slopes between uh, nine to 11 degrees. So I think somewhere in that, let's say, three to eight degrees or two to nine degrees is probably what we would consider normal. Now, what we've learned is that none of that really matters. What matters is what's pathologic. In other words, what is gonna cause the slope to increase and the tibia to come forward and increase strain on the ACL. Uh, and what we've learned is that number is somewhere around 12 to 13. Uh, if you look at uh, Neret's group, they say greater or equal to 12 with 10 millimeters of anterior translation. You look at the Kaiser data, they found much higher rates of ACL failure if they were greater than 12. And if you look at Don Shelbourne's most recent study, looking at about 2,500 uh, patellar tendon grafts, he found that if the slope was greater or equal to 10, that there was a 10% failure rate with his graphs compared to only 5% if the slope was less. So I think the pathologic number, the number that seems to be getting everybody uh, you know, thinking about doing an osteotomy 
is around that 12 to 13 degrees. But I believe it's coupled. It's not just the slope. It has to be coupled with the anterior translation. Because if you have slope and there's no anterior translation, I'm not convinced that that's a problem. And now we can open up to other discussions. Okay, James, on the same path, you know, slope is not just bone. Slope also is soft tissue, which is meniscus. And uh, interesting that you said that, uh, you know, when you're looking at MRI scans, MRIs probably don't give you the better picture. But then would you not be concerned that when you have, uh, you know, when you're taking into account things like meniscus, that is also going to look at the slope in a different manner? Yeah, no, I think that's right. And I, I mean, interesting, this number of 12 uh, is out there. Um, the paper published by the Australian group, the catastrophic yes. effect of slope and age with their 20 year survivorship in, in, in young patients with a slope of greater than 12 was around 20% for the ACL. I mean, you know, it's terrible. Um, so it's it's a big deal. Now, Bruce said, I, I absolutely echo that. That's why I showed that that weight bearing stance view showing the translation. There's no way that that graph, no matter what you do with those tunnel, you know, you've really got to think about how we're going to correct for that. Um, and of course, the meniscus plays an important role. If you're deficient, particularly in the in the posterior horn of the meniscus, you've lost that sort of chock block effect. So there's a whole load of interplay. I, I've let, it's interesting, we've left that slide. I, I, I'm seeing the, my final slide of the MRI slope measurement. It's probably the slope in the lateral compartment that's more related to the way the ACL behaves. The difficulty is how do we measure that effectively and reliably? And, and, and for most of us, I still think that, that the, the, the sagittal plane X-ray is probably the best way to go because it's easier for us to do. But you're absolutely right. There must be a more complex in, in, interplay. Okay, Elvia, a question for you. In your practice, do you use short films or full length films? And if so, why? Uh -huh. um, you, I'm, I'm doing short films to, to look on the sagittal plane, uh, monoclonal stance, but I'm using long, I'm, I'm using long legs film only for the frontal plane. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm yes, I'm using the older Lyon, Lyonnaise. Uh, uh, school measurements. It's like it looks like the circle you use, uh, James. But uh, we use uh, the middle of the shaft and ten centimeter lower, as Michel Bonin or Ridujou described that long time ago. It, it, it's mostly the same measurements uh, as you are doing with uh, the, the circle system. But yes, just short film for the sagittal plane. Short film. Uh, yeah. Okay. Let's have the next slide, please. And uh, Bushan, this question comes to you now. Uh, when you look at the long leg films, there are three different ways. So if you look at the original teaching by Gerard Pelle, he says that, you know, you should go up to a point that is uh, anterior uh, fifth and uh, posterior fourth fifth. Uh, Laprade and his group have described the so-called midpoint at the level of the proximal tibia. And then you also have the posterior cortex line. So since you do a lot of planning on long films, which one of these three will you use? Will you use the mechanical axis or the anatomical axis and why? So uh, the value is different when you're using a posterior tibial cortical line or using a proximal tibial anatomical axis. The PTA tends to give a slightly higher value as compared to a posterior tibial cortex. So it's important to be consistent in your planning. So use whatever value you are using, but use the same value for uh, comparison. I tend to use the Laprade technique. I feel that gives a slightly uh, uh, easy for, for someone like me, but uh, once again, it's, it's the same technique to be used for every patient. So I, I use a central technique. Okay, let's have the next slide. And this question comes to you, Matthew, now. Uh, you know, we have this discussion about whether to measure the slope on MR versus the X-rays. And uh, recently, you've published quite a lot looking at uh, various uh, measurements, looking on the frontal plane as well as CT scans and looking at how axial rotation will give you a difference in the slope. So can you make a comment on this as well, please? Yes, thank you for the question and thank you for the organizer committee for the, the second day of, uh, of, uh, of a discussion. I'm very happy to be here. I will say that, yeah, we published uh, quite a few uh, data on, on, on CT scan. Uh, and, uh, and to be honest, uh, when you access to, to those 3D measurement, you probably discover that most of the 2D are pretty wrong. Uh, because as you said, the, the rotational uh, position of the foot and the femoral condyle 
make it very complex to understand because there is a parallax inside of the rotation that increase or decrease your measurement of the tibia slope because you you are not strictly parallel to the to the to the condyle or to the to the to the tibial plateau so probably one of the only real way to be precise in the measurement of the slope and this give you access to the medial and the lateral one is to perform 3d ct scans okay let's have the next slide now oh, please i should I think we'll uh, go on the same line. Okay, so on the CT scan, as you see in this particular image here, there are different slopes for the medial and on the lateral side. So when we measure an X-ray, most of us would essentially look at the lateral slope. So when you're looking at your CT scan, which slope would you take? We know that it's the lateral tibial slope, which is you know more important for all the pathology that we see. So which is the one that you're going to be choosing here? So I would probably select the lateral one. Would that be the comment of the panel as well? Would the, the panel sort of echo the same aspect? Would they be measuring more on the lateral or on the medial side? Yeah. Lateral. Lateral. Okay, next, next slide, please. And I think uh, this is where we come to the next part of this, uh, next part of uh, this particular panel session here, where we look at various effects in change in slope. So Elvia, I'd like you to get going first. Particular aspect. What do you think happens when the slope increases? Why is there abnormal anterior translation? Uh, well, um, <laughs> uh, I, I think what's happened, it's especially in a monomodal stance when the patient is working with full weight bearing due to the quadriceps function, uh, the increasing of the slope will increase the anterior tibial translation due to the because of the quadrucem function. And um, so there is, it, yes, it function, quadricep, the muscle function and, uh, the, and the slope. And uh, I'm not sure there is any study regarding, um, I mean, there is a study regarding the meniscal slope from Australian people and the, the, the tibial slope on the bone. But I'm not sure uh, on the meniscus, uh, the meniscus play a role uh, regarding uh, the tibial slope. I'm not sure I'm, I'm quite uh, clear. I mean, Bruce, what I'm not sure the correlation between the medial slope on the posterior on and the, uh, the, the, the bony tibial slope. I think. Uh, you know, Sachin, isn't what's going on. I mean, you're probably like Varus. You know, while your knee is normal, it's fine. We, we tolerate a big slope. The problem is when you then go on to have a problem with your ACL, you yeah. then, if you're, if you're disadvantaged by your slope, you're then going to go on and wreck your secondary restraints, which is your meniscus and everything stretches out. And then you get this, you progress onto that uh, anterior right. translation. And the problem is once that's then got into a situation of fixed anterior translation, which you which we do see, you, you you probably any soft tissue operation is going to struggle to correct that. Uh, Bruce, what do you think uh, goes wrong when we have you know a slope that is more flat, and how does it really predispose to having posterior translation? Uh, well, I'm just gonna just gonna go back to the to the increasing slope for just a sec. There's no question, uh, you know, Andy Pearl and the HSS people, they really showed, and DuJour as well, they show that with, with chronic ACLs, there's this sort of progressive creep where the tibia just sort of shifts anteriorly and everything just sort of stretches out. And I think a lot of it has to do with meniscal deficiency too. So the more meniscal deficient you are, the more that meniscus will be less protective of the slope. Um, the, the, um, the other thing is that when Bob Giffen and Chris Harner did that classic study on slope and tibial translation, that was at time zero with cadavers. So I think that although we see this creep with ACL deficient knees, just simply increasing the slope does shift the tibia forward, even at time zero with cadavers. Now your question about decreasing slope has the same effect with the PCL. And so I think uh, more recently, Laprade has shown that People that have decreased slopes are probably at increased risk for, for PCL uh, deficiency. And so, uh, you know, we've had people come to us with, 
with PCL efficiency that we've corrected with an anterior opening wedge osteotomy to increase the slope. And it's been extremely powerful, like really, really, really good. Bhushan, what has been your experience so far when we look at uh, abnormal slopes, especially in the Indian population? What have you seen to be the most predominant factor that uh, really influences so I think it's uh, it's it's usually the failed ACLs that uh, we we look more frequently at, and they tend to have a slightly uh, increased tibial slope. So uh, for Indians, as a the slope is midway between the Oriental population and the Western population, but anyone with a higher uh, tibial slope has an increased risk of uh, fail uh, failure of an ACL reconstruction. So I think uh, anyone who has uh, so in general speaking, people with higher slope will have a higher tendency for ACL rupture. So that just is exactly what uh, interesting literature has shown we have seen in uh, Indian population as well. Uh, Matthew, I mean, what has been your observation as regards the measurement of the slope or the amount of slope and the presence of hyperlaxity? Because I think that's one more thing that starts complicating things further. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point, Sachin. That's a very good point. I w there, uh, there is, I think, a clear correlation uh, for patient who has an excessive slope to have a, a, a nipperlax and and potentially a recurvatum of the of the of the knee. Combined together, those two things might might be the two things that leads to ACL rupture. So I would say that it's 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 very common to find patient with both excessive slopes and Hypolaxity, which is, of course, very bad for, for ACLs. But then when you go to think about it, if you have hyperextension, correct, then you usually should have a decreased slope. And here you're faced with a situation where you have an increased slope and hyperlaxity. So how yeah. do you explain this phenomenon? What do you think is going wrong there? To be honest, I don't know. Uh, probably there is some you know, pathological anatomical factor that we don't understand surrounding the first ACL rupture on those guys, because, you know, specifically with those guys with very high slope, as everybody described, there is a tendency to a, an anterior translation of the distal tibia. But to be honest, we, it's very hard to imagine that, that those guys at the beginning were very stable and the, most of the rupture are, are with very common uh, injuries like uh, d domestic injuries, but not with big crashes. So I would say that there is something. There is something we we, we don't understand with uh, necessitation of the of the slope and the, and the ten and those hypolaxity and those those uh, mechanical problems. To be honest, today I don't have any answer on that. Perfect. Uh, I think this is almost bringing us to the close of this first question. We have ten seconds left. If any of the panelists would like to make any quick comments. We have about 10 seconds if anybody would like to make any comments on what we've discussed so far. No comments? Okay. So I think uh, that really opens up the first part of today's session as to how do we measure the slope and what exactly is the slope. We'll now move on to the next part of uh, today's session where we actually look at when we should intervene. And for this, um, we'll be calling in uh, Professor Carl Eriksson from Sweden. We'll also be having Howard Lutz from New York, and uh, we would have uh, Andy Williams and Peter Myers. So uh, we'll start with uh, Carl Erickson and we'll request Carl to present his case, please. I don't see Carl in the room. Adrian, can you check if Carl is in the room? Because I can't see him on my virtual room. There. He's coming now. Yeah, there you are. OK, Carl, stage is all yours. Thank you. Thank you, Sachin. And thank you, Adrian and the group uh, for inviting me to this interesting two-day seminar. Uh, my task was to, to open the discussion about when should we intervene with the slope? Can we have the next slide, please? Uh, I was told that someone could progress my slides. Uh, Next slide. You might have to share screen. Uh, we we didn't receive them, Carl. Yeah, but I, I 
I sent them in earlier and, and you, sh you should be able to... to uh... We're looking, we're looking. Let's get the discussion going just whilst we look, Carl. Yeah. Okay. So I think let me, let me pose um, a scenario. Let me pose a scenario if you have, you know, someone who comes with a primary, uh, uh, with, with a primary ACL rupture and um, he has a 20 degree slope. Okay, so you have someone who's got a primary ACL rupture. He's probably you know somewhere from uh, somewhere from India or some other place where people have uh, you know, inherent high slopes. And how many on the panel would consider a slope correction for his primary procedure? So, Carl, what would be your take on this? Uh, in his primary procedure. I wouldn't consider a slope correction. Uh, that wouldn't be the tradition in Sweden to do that. And in fact, uh, slope corrections in, in ACL insufficiency is a rare bird in Sweden. Maybe it's become a little bit more popular now over the years, but in a primary, I would probably not do it or not even consider it. Okay, Bruce, I think you have a case here to present. Am I right? Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, yeah, okay. You want to, uh... no. Let's advance the slide. Yep. So it's a 31 year old female. She had a BTB autograph a few years ago performed at an outside institution. And when she came in to see me, she had um, both a little antromedial and some lateral knee pain, occasionally felt the knee shift uh, with no effusions. Next slide. So uh, her motion was pretty good, uh, 0 to 135. She was very tender over her IT band. You can almost palpate a screw there. And on her exam, it was really guarded. So it was quite difficult, but I felt at least a one plus Lockman. I couldn't do a pivot shift. PCL felt fine. I felt a little bit of opening to virus stress at 30. Everything else was normal for the lateral side, medial, postural, medial corner, normal. So it really like, very unimpressive exam, very difficult to examine the patient, uh, but for sure she had this very tender screw. Okay, go ahead, next slide. So here's her um, presentation films, and um, you can see here that uh, her slope uh, is increased. If I can't, it's too sorry, it's, it's about 15, 16 degrees. And you can see that she's got tunnel widening that's about 16 to 17 millimeters. Next slide. And there's the prominent screw. And then on her MRI, I was worried about a uh, lateral meniscus root tear. And also, you know, there's some signal change through the mid substance of the LCL. Next slide. And here you can see her graph looks totally normal on the MRI. Next slide. And so I said, okay, you got prominent hardware over the IT band, um, feels any shift a little bit. To be honest, I couldn't really tell if the ACL was functional or not. Uh, I did think there was a possibility of a meniscal root tear and I wanted to do intraoperative virus stress views to check for LCL deficiency. But for all I knew it was just removing a screw. Next, next slide. So my plan was an exam under anesthesia, remove the hardware, check out the graft, and uh, if her ACL was deficient, I was going to take the opportunity to bone graft her because her tunnels were so wide, I would do a two-staged approach here. Next slide. So here's her exam under anesthesia. Uh, you might have to click on the picture. So she has a three-plus Lachman. Watch this. <laughs> so this is, a, this is a great like teaching case because she was so guarded in the office. She had like a one plus Lockman. I really wasn't that impressed. And her ACL graph looked completely normal in MRI. Next slide. So you can see here, she's got uh, almost a three millimeter side to side difference on her varus stress view. So she did have LCL deficiency. Next slide. And her graft, obviously, remember the MRI looked completely normal. Well, we know the graft is not working. Next slide and her root was completely off. And there's her lateral drive-through sign. Next slide. So we did a two-stage. So we came from outside in there, we reamed and we put in these cannulated allograft dowels. Next slide. 
So that's femoral, here's tibial. Next slide. So she did well, no effusion, full motion. Next slide. And here we are now, this is uh, almost six months post first stage and you can see the bone graft is beautifully incorporated. Next slide. And now, because I'm in a revision setting, I'm gonna get coronal plane alignment, which in her was fine. So normal, remember it's her right knee. Next slide. And in this case, because I'm planning potentially a slope correcting osteotomy, I am gonna do the full length standing monopedal uh, x-ray and her slope is 16. And you can see the anterior translation was around 10, 11 millimeters. Next slide. So my plan was revision ACL with ipsilateral hamstring. She's 31. Lateral meniscus root repair, anterior closing wedge osteotomy, and LCL reconstruction with the TIM antallograft. Next slide. So here's her femoral tunnel for the ACL. Next slide. There's our planned osteotomy. We do a supratubercle osteotomy. 10 millimeter wedge, it was a 10.8 was the measurement, but 10 millimeters, go ahead. And here's our technique, pin placement and saw cuts, remove the wedge, next slide. And we close her down and then we use these compression staples that I really like, next slide. And then I left room for the revision ACL on the tibia, next slide. So now I'm gonna do the root repair Transosseous technique and a separate tunnel for the ACL. Next slide. So there's the tibial socket. There's the graft. Next slide. There's her root repair. Next slide. Then I do an open LCL reconstruction with the tibialis anterior allograft. Next slide. And here's her final x-rays. And I think there's one more picture of the before and afters. Next slide. Keep going. There it is. So here you can see, and this, this really shows, I've zoomed in, so this is another standing view. Look at the tibial translation, completely normalized. So I got her slope to just around four degrees from 16, and the tibial translation is completely resolved. So I think these osteotomies are extremely powerful, extremely powerful. So Adrian, I've got about um, one minute. I've unfortunately got to get to the operating room. Uh, my room started 10 minutes ago. So uh, maybe if anyone has any uh, quick comments or questions, I can hang out for another minute or two. And again, I just want to thank you for this uh, wonderful opportunity. Uh, thank you, Bruce. I think that was really a fantastic demonstration of uh, you know, how perfectly executed, perfectly planned and well executed. Uh, one quick question that I would have, would the type of sport or activity level change your decision form a potential slope correction osteotomy? Someone say has got the same slope, but is not into any active uh, lifestyle, is a sedentary person, aged about say 35, 40, would you still go ahead and do all the same that you did now, or would you just, you know, do something like an extra articular just to take care of that uh, bit of laxity that may stay behind? Yeah, I mean, it, it obviously depends on their on their demands, work demands, sport demands. But I don't feel that a lateral extraarticular tenodesis, for example, is something that corrects slope. Uh, you know, I think those are two independent problems. And so if you have a severe increase in slope, you need a slope correcting osteotomy. If you have a huge rotational deficient knee with a grade three pivot shift uh, in somebody who has hyperlaxity, sure, I think IT band's fantastic. We do, we do a ton of lateral extraarticular surgery. I think the data is very supportive. But I, I don't, when people say, well, they had increased slope, but I did it at an LET mm. instead, yeah. that doesn't make any sense yeah. to me. Those are two, yeah. two independent yeah. problems. Yeah. So I think that's a great point because that's probably one of the most commonly performed mistakes where people are just scared to make that cut and you know close down the slope and they say, well, in place, I'm adding something else. So my patient's going to be fine. 
So thank you, Bruce. Thank you for joining us. So we'll move on to Carl's case now. So Carl, okay. uh, over to you, please. Thank you. Thanks, Sachin. Thanks, Bruce, for a nice presentation. And I, I think my strategy is usually to, to look at the, the reason for failure. And I try to assess the different, uh, different possible reasons for failure. And, and obviously, if there's an um, unaddressed uh, associated ligament uh, problem, that might be enough. So, I mean, slope correction in, in Swedish hands is not as common as uh, you can think if you watch this seminar here. Uh, next slide. I think there is it's, yeah, one, uh, one case where we must correct the slope. It's a case with a negative slope like this, where you have a hyperextension, you have a functional PCL instability, and you have um, a flexion deficit probably. And this is due to a, a earlier uh, fracture un, untreated in the, in the physis, obviously. And uh, in this particular case, I think I opened maybe a little bit less than two centimeters and you had to be, put a big bone block and dual plates. And, and this is a case where we would correct the slope in, in a Swedish setting. Next slide, please. Uh, I use the same um, measurement tools as, as James presented, where usually short films. If there is, uh, we, we do long films if there is a, a coronal alignment uh, discussion, but I would I would assess the slope with a with an anatomical axis on the short films, um, as published by the Prods group uh, just just recently I think. Uh, next slide, please. This is just a case to open the discussion where we could discuss addressing the slope, and it's a primary ACL. Uh, with a hamstring graft when this guy was 18 years old, uh, 2010, he returned to soccer, played for nine years, all good. And then nine years later, a traumatic, traumatic uh, uh, injury with a graft rupture. His coronal alignment was okay. Uh, as you can see on his slope measurement here, it's about 16 to 17 degrees. Uh, it's actually, it's obviously more than 12. Uh, and the options for operation here would be ACL revision and nothing else, ACL revision and decreased slope, or ACL revision and LET. And in a case like this in Sweden, I would say that the majority of, of, of my colleagues wouldn't do, do slope correction in, in this guy. And this guy had normal or functional menisci in the posterior horns, both medially and, and laterally. Uh, next slide, please. So what I did here was I did an ACL revision, quad tendon bone block, medial meniscus suture, because there was a longitudinal uh, tear uh, close to the capsule. I did an LET, uh, modified LMR, and I didn't address the slope. But this could obviously be discussed, and that's why we are here today, to, to see who would, who would correct the slope in a case like this, or would you would you do pretty much the same as I did, or would you perhaps do even uh, less? So that opens the discussion. Thanks. Yeah, thank you, Khan. So I think uh, that's really set the stage for this uh, really whole case discussion here as to when should we intervene. So looking at Carl's case, I've just sort of mixed it up even further now. Let's say he was 18 years old, he's got a high slope, and he also has got a ramp lesion or maybe a lateral meniscus posterior root tear. Now, amongst the panel, who would think that this person who is a soccer player that they should have a primary slope change? Let's face it, he's 17. He has a very high risk of re-rupture. So Peter, over to you, what, what would you say? I think it depends on the chronicity of the injury, Sachin. You sort of broached that topic a little earlier. It sort of wasn't mentioned. If it's this person's had this slope all their life and that had, now has an injury, sure, they're at higher risk of a re-injury, but I, I think uh, they're not going to get back to high-level soccer after a tibial osteotomy, I wouldn't have thought, uh, so changing the uh, proprioception so much. So as a first-up injury, provided it's not chronic and hasn't stretched out the posterior soft tissues, and, and, and uh, which uh, James referred to earlier, 
I would be doing a primary ACL reconstruction. I would do this would be an indication in my hands for lateral tenodesis and obviously meniscal repairs all around as needed. But I wouldn't do a change in slope as a primary operation. In both of the cases we've seen, Carl's case and uh, Bruce's case, I would be doing a, a slope change in osteotomy. So, what number for you, Peter, would be the magic number where you, you know, tip the balance over and say, "Hey, for this person, I have to do a slope, even if it's a primary." I, I don't think Sachin, I would ever do it in a primary situation, un, unless it's been chronic. So, first up surgery in someone who injured five years ago and had done all the stretching up of the capsule, that's a different ball game. But um, and you might see that in some in some places, but. Um, well, I don't see that in my practice. It's acute injury with a big slope. I'm not going to do an osteotomy for an acute injury um, first up operation. James, you did mention in one of your slides when you're looking at the industry session that you're even considering the osteotomy not as a joint salvage, but you know a primary operation. So what would be your take on this now? I agree with Peter. I mean, we mustn't forget that these slope change osteotomies are a hell of an operation. Um, it was interesting, you look at the Aussie series where they were talking about the high rate of uh, failure with high slopes. In the paper, they saw or they just said, we would discuss that with the patient and discuss their, their increased risk. I, I think that I agree and disagree with Bruce. Where I agree with him is that when you've seen fixed anterior translation or that creeping in with time, with chronicity, that's something that should really alert you to the fact that you might need to do something to the slope. But in a primary scenario where they've just injured, they've just torn their ACL on a high slope knee, we know that the LET offers some load share of the ACL. And I would do something protective to the ACL. I know, I know they've got a high slope, but I would add the LET to protect the, the graft, accepting they've got a high slope. We warn the patient that they've got you know, an increased risk of re-rupture. But I, I totally agree with Peter that the, the proprioceptive changes around a primary slope change, those patients are not going to get back to elite sport. Uh, Andy, if I can ask you, uh, you're on the panel as well, that uh, given the same scenario where someone has an abnormal slope, by virtue of which I'm saying someone has a more flattened slope and lands up with a PCL injury with or without a postlateral corner, in the coronal plane is absolutely fine. And he wants to get back to doing, say, contact activity. He's had this injury for about two years now. What would you say? I, I did miss some of that, but um, I've, I've had a number of cases like the one that Carl showed where there's a premature growth arrest, the anterior physis, and they get a, a really significant posterior tibial translation, and they're corrected with an opening wedge osteotomy do do very, very well. But uh, as Peter said earlier on, you know, if somebody's playing high-level sport, I'm trying to avoid osteotomy. If they're not, then I may consider it. And uh, obviously, if they've got a coronal plane abnormalities, the classic would be PCL postlateral corner. And uh, I would do a me medial opening wedge osteotomy to correct coronal alignment. But and it's very easy to increase the slope doing that operation. And in this case, obviously, that's advantageous. Uh, I have combined that procedure with soft tissue surgery. Uh, the last time I did it, I vowed never to do it again. So I usually stage that operation. Uh, you mean you'd stage the osteotomy and the soft tissue both at the same time, correct? Yeah, for PCL postlateral corner, yeah, with, a, with an opening wedge osteotomy. If you do a closing wedge osteotomy, it's actually very easy to do the soft tissue surgery at the same time. But obviously, um, it's usually for PCL situation where I want, I want to increase the slope, then I'd do a medial opening wedge. So if I can quickly ask all the panel, that includes Andy, yourself, Carl, James and Peter, in your clinical practice, if you have someone who has a chronic uh, ACL or a PCL ruptured knee, say maybe 16, 18 months, you know, he's going on with that injury, and he comes to for you for evaluation, how many of you would do a calculation of the slope by doing a long leg lateral view? In, Let's in a, start. In a primary situation yeah. or revision? Yes, please. Primary. I would always have a lateral view yeah. uh, and assess the slope, yes. Would you a short, do a, a long short leg? leg? A short, short leg, leg James. Short, yeah, short, James? short leg, lateral, measure the slope. The long legs are only for the revisions. Yeah, agreed. Yeah. Agreed? Okay. 
same with me. Okay. I, 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 would, so I, think, I would do the long legs for revision, or if I think there's a coronal plane uh, um, issue. Um, one thing about the slope that we might just bring up is that it happens that people have different slopes in two knees. And that would be a case if I have an ACL uh, re rupture or rupture or revision case, I always measure the both knees. So I have a look at it if there's an asymmetry, because that would increase my indication for a slope change if it happens that it's four or five degrees more slope in the ACL insufficient knee than in the normal knee. Uh, so, and that sometimes happens that you have differences between the legs. So you would actually both I, the legs? I, I actually both legs in, the, in those cases. Yeah, if I see a, a very high slope in a revision case, I take a, I take a lateral on the, on the healthy leg as well. Okay, when we're talking about PCL deficient knee, what would your threshold be? Would your threshold values change? You know, when you're looking at a primary PCL, would your threshold values change as compared to a primary ACL? We'll start with you, Peter. I'm not sure I have a threshold in that scenario because most primary PCL injuries do very well uh, managed non-operatively. Um, bracing and otherwise, so I'd be reluctant to again to do an osteotomy on a primary PCL injury, uh, unless there was a really nasty case like uh, was shown before that that was a bit different. But they'd have to have symptomatic instability to justify surgery. I don't have a figure in mind, Sachin. Okay, James, when looking at revision PCLs, how many in what percentage of the cases would you actually consider doing a slope change? Can um, you give us a ballpark figure? God. Um, luckily, you said revision PCL. Revision PCL yes. is a rare big. It's a pretty rare big. Yeah. Um, well, let's say a neglected PCL. Yeah, I think that you've just you know the message we're trying to get across in this sim in this session is think about the slope. I, I think you have to have taken it into account in your preoperative planning. And if this was a you know a wildly flat slope, particularly if the patient's gone on to develop some medial disease, which they often do with a PCL deficiency, then as Andy says, a medial opening wedge osteotomy is going to is going to ha have the effect of killing two birds with one stone. Uh, and so it just has to come into your planning. Any comments, Carl? No, I agree with James. Uh, I, I would consider it like an, a, a, a medial opening wedge and do slope uh, correction in a PCL insufficiency because they, in the revision situation, because they usually have some errors, they usually have some medial wear. So that, that would be the situation. So Andy, we heard you speak yesterday about uh, you know, closing wedge osteotomies and how the lateral closing wedge high tibial osteotomy effectively tackles the lateral slope more. Now, when we're looking at this situation where we're doing a lateral closing wedge osteotomy, what exactly, do you actually measure the numbers and you try and add them up? Do you actually calculate the amount of wedge that you're going to be closing to try and get that slope to decrease? And if so, how do you do that? Well, Sachin, it's, it's a gift, really. Um, <laughs> uh, no, I do think about it and uh, I, want to bring the slope down to uh, less than uh, 10 degrees, but not particularly more than that. As Peter said yesterday, you don't need to go wildly. But when I put the guide wires and I pl place my coronal wires for the coronal correction, and then I place an AP parallel to the um, joint surface. And again, as Peter taught all of us, you hold the saw and you angle it so that there's an anterior closing component. Now, the problem with that is if you really want to make a big closure, a big change, then there's conflict sometimes between the proximal um, tibia as it comes down against the tibial tuberosity if you have an ascending cut. Um, so you gotta be careful with that. But the easy, easier answer is to go above the tuberosity anyway. But um, uh, there's no science because we haven't got the data to know, but I'm aiming to get a, a correction that reduces the slope to less than 10 degrees. There is, there, is some yeah. Yeah. there is some science, if you come immediately, uh, if you take your osteotomy from the side laterally, purely laterally, and close it, you'll, you won't change the slope. For, for every eight or nine degrees, that sort of figure around that you go, you change, go slightly anterolaterally by eight degrees, you'll change the slope by one degree. You can work your way around that way. Perfect. Excellent point.
So I think, uh, thank you, gentlemen, for this uh, really exciting session as to uh, where, when we should intervene. We'll now move on to the third part of uh, today's slope discussion as to how we should intervene. And we'll get in our new panels for the next session. Uh, we'll have um, Vincenzo Condello coming from Italy. We have Elvier uh, coming in from Lyon. We're going to have James Robinson staying behind well with us from Bristol. We have Ronald Hewarden who comes in from Netherlands. And we have Carl Eriksson from Sweden. Uh, I'll first ask uh, Vincenzo to kindly present his presentation. So Vincenzo, if you could come in with your case, this please, that would be lovely. Someone will need to get Vincenzo's Hello. slides. Excellent, okay. thank you. Thank you, good afternoon. Thanks for the kind invitation. Thanks, uh, Adrian. Thanks, Sachin, Sachin for uh, also sharing some slides with me. Uh, I cannot, uh, sorry, I can't say. Yes. Okay. Okay, so I, I'm, I'm going to present two cases. Uh, one first case is um, kind of a disaster, uh, male, uh, uh, 22 years old, but uh, when he had a motorbike accident on the left and he was dislocated, he was uh, 18 years old. He had a multi-ligament lesion, medial tibial patellar fracture uh, with a medial depression uh, because of a bone loss neurovascular lesions. So tibial fracture and neurovascular injuries were treated acutely and uh, changed. Uh, can you, uh, sorry, I don't know if I can. Okay, thanks. Um, so a few years later, we planned the um, uh, high tibial osteotomy monoplanar uh, plus uh, tibial tuberosity proximalization because he had a uh, Patella Baja, uh, sector range of motion. So uh, we had to increase the slope from six degrees uh, to 13 degrees. And we did this, uh, first of all, we removed in two steps the, uh, the plate of the previous surgery and the eccentric opening of the osteotomy gap, more anterior than inflection, of course, to counteract the long lever arm of the leg. And then after application to spread the anterior wider than the posterior, then the, the osteotomy was uh, fixed in a monoplan uh, fashion. Next, please. Um, next slide, please. Okay, uh, this is uh, seven months uh, after the removal of the plate. He was very happy. Feels a stable knee and pain-free knee. No more brace and doesn't want to do any surgery anymore. So uh, from a disaster and just the change in the slope, increasing the posterior slope uh, took him uh, to normal, an, almost a normal life. N next uh, case, please. The second one is uh, ACI revision with isolated slope reduction. 27 years old, soccer, male uh, defender, right, uh, right hand, ACL reach here. Uh, as you can see, the tunnels are uh, just a little bit more large, not too, not too bad. Partially correct, mm, medium is the tier, but the slope, as you can see, the posterior tibia slope is 17.3 uh, degrees. Next slide, please. So the anterior drawer, uh, the anterior translation in monopodalic stance phase shows, next, please. Next, next shows the, uh, the anterior uh, translation of the tibia, which is uh, next, please, uh, almost pathological. So of course, uh, this case next needs a, um, a correction of, of the slope, a reduction of the slope. Uh, the, the surgery has been done with tibial tuberosity osteotomy, a close wedge technique, the hinge point of the um, this closing wedge technique is a TCL insertion. Next slide, please. So uh, the closing wedge osteotomy uh, had, was fixed with uh, 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 screws and with staples. Next, please. Uh, staples for uh, screws for the tibial tuberosity osteotomy and staple next, next for uh, the tibial osteotomy fixation with staples. 
Next, please. Let's go on. Next. Again. So this is uh, just two cases. Uh, oh, okay. No, no. Just the one before, please. Uh, this is for discussion. Isolate for slope correction, which is, which is the best choice. Advantage, disadvantage of uh, three different techniques. Supra, tibial tuberosity, best bone quality, extended contact surface, but uh, modification of patellar height, surgical approach hampered by the patellar tendon. At the tibial tuberosity, no modification of the patellar height, easier surgical approach, but uh, there's a weakening of the insertion of the extensor apparatus. I never use this. And with a tibial uh, tuberosity osteotomy, best control of a patella 8. TT is a natural plate for osteotomy fixation, but double osteotomy sites very close to uh, each other, so a possible delayed healing uh, is sometimes in a, an extensive surgical approach. Okay, next, it's in queue, I'm done, uh, just two cases. So we have time for discussion. Uh, thank you so much for bringing out uh, the important aspects of uh, isolated as well as combined slope correction procedures. Uh, well, let's talk about first about the isolated slope correct procedure. So we know very well that uh, you know you can do it at three locations. You can do it completely above the tibial tubercle. You could do it at the tibial tubercle or you know below the tubercle or with a tibial tubercle osteotomy. Each one has their own advantages and disadvantages. I'll start with you, Elbia. What is your go-to for doing an opening or a closing wedge? Would you do it above, below, or at? At the level of the ATT, uh, uh, I will not touch the ATT when I do an entire closing wedge, but when I do a post, um, a post uh, sorry, uh, an entire um, uh, opening wedge for uh, PCL, I will do ATT to avoid patella infera. Ronald, you have extensively described the biological blade. Would you also always do the tibial tubercle osteotomy if you're doing an anterior closing wedge or would you reserve it only for an opening wedge? No, I, I'm used to doing it uh, for both anterior closing and anterior opening weights. You have to realize we have different practices. If you do small corrections, you probably can do, deal with it with a supratuberosity situation. And I've tried that, but you have to realize that it becomes cumbersome if you have a failure. You have a very small proximal fragment you have to try to fix. So I always take the tuberosity off and then do it um, in the best, for me, the best situation. And I have a population who probably needs larger corrections than the sports population. So James, in your practice, where would you do an isolated closure? Um, I'm a Van Heerwarden disciple. Um, I learned this operation from him. So he, <laughs> I mean, I agree. And I think it gives me the, uh, the best control over the, um, over the height of the, the patella. Um, so I think you've asked me, when do I close down the slope? Um, that's for the, the ACL. So for me, it's usually re... No. Sorry. No, that's fine. Uh, the next question that I wanted to ask you... Yeah, sorry. The next question I wanted to ask you, James, is that you've been a great proponent of using the PSI systems for doing, uh, you know, slope changing as well as coronal plane osteotomies. How do you see the PSI being applied for isolated slope correction osteotomies? Um, I've, I've tended, if it's isolated, so I've not used it for that. I've only, I've only used uh, the, the experiences with, with the sort of biplane corrections where you've got to correct in two planes. And I think the advantage with the PSI that it gives you is ability to work that out when it's all becoming more complex than a uni uh, uniplanar correction, um, and I think that's where those PSIs really would come into their own. Is if you're having to correct plane deformity in two planes, um, that gets a little bit more complex for my brain. Um, and I think for uniplanar, I've, I've tended not to, but for biplanar, where you're thinking of varus valgus and a slope crane change, then PSI is a nice addition. Uh, Vincenzo, when you're doing an opening or a closing, what 
number is it that you take to decide that how much are you going to remove or open the wedge? So, you know, one millimeter of opening will transfer the slope because we have numbers stating from the Santi group, they say that one millimeter equals one. We have the Lobenhofer group, which uh, has published that one millimeter of change opening or closing translates to two degrees. So what is it? What number do you use in your clinical practice? Uh, I usually coming from the osteotomy uh, 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 valorization, uh, I, I usually do one, one millimeter, uh, one degree, but uh, it depends on how much you have to to, to change the slope and then the dimension of the of the of course dimension of the tibia that you are facing with uh, it's different a uh, big guy with a very small uh, female um, I but I usually do one millimeter one degree Ronald do you have a comment on that as to you know is there any maths is there any trigonometry yeah well the, there is actually any magic the, numbers that we should know of? Yeah, well, there is a very interesting video of the Frank Noyes group out there on Vumedi. I, I want to recommend that video because it discusses the trigonometry. And Vincenzo is absolutely right. It differs between a big person, big tibia, and a small female person, small tibia. And I think if you have calibrated x-rays, also for the sagittal plane, you can never make the mistake. However, if you stick to one degree is one millimeter, you will find out that in some of these cases, you're off, you're really off. So be careful to stick to, to rules of thumbs uh, and try to work with calibrated x-rays. And otherwise, have a look at that video because in that video, it's discussed like five or six uh, documented techniques, which all differ. And then they come to the conclusion that making measurements, pre-planning, try to uh, use your 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 your, uh, your trigonometry, and then you will find the right height of the wedge to open or to take out. Carl, when you're doing these closing wedges or opening wedges, you're trying to alter the slope. How do you intraoperatively check? that you're, you know, you, you've just opened enough or you've closed enough because, you know, all of us doing coronal plane correction, corrections, we have the long rod, we have the C arm, we can see where the Mikudik shrine is passing. What sort of intraoperative corrections do you apply when you're doing your surgical cases? Uh, first of all, I agree with Ronald. I, I use calibrated uh, X-rays and I try to calculate and many times it's one millimeter is one degree. But, but I used the calibrated balls uh, on the fields to, to make sure. Uh, and I use uh, intraoperative sea uh, arms with the long rods uh, to, to check. And I, I put my pins uh, before and, and double check before I make the cuts. Uh, I mean, if in an opening session, you could always adjust, but in the closing wedge, you have to be accurate. So if I do closing wedge for an ACL chronic uh, huge slope correction, which I had said previously is not so common in Sweden, but has happened, um, I would rather undercorrect a little bit than overcorrect. So I don't end up in a, a situation that I can't handle. Obviously, in the open open wedge, it's it's not a big deal. You can just measure and then pick your angle. Okay, LV. When you're doing a combined um, coronal plane and slope correction, do you purposefully break the hinge if you want to do a large slope correction, or do you leave the hinge intact? No, I, I try to. I try to because that's the uh, at least when I do it. I, the, the key thing is to have the hinge in different positions. If you want to, if you want to decrease the slope, you have the, have to have the hinge more anteriorly, obviously. Otherwise, you cannot open it in the back. And uh, other way around, if you're increasing the slope, you have to deal with where you put the hinge. And I, I don't go for breaking the hinge. Uh, I, sometimes it breaks, but I don't always break it. I try to keep it. Uh, and then I just go slowly. But it, uh, at least for me, the, the key thing is to have the hinge in the right spot on the, on the opposite side. 
Elvia, you have any tips for you know having the hinge at the correct place? Uh, <laughs> if you're not using uh, the PSI, uh, actually now when I try to address the tibial slope, uh, it's really unusual for me to address only on the sagittal plane of deformity when there is an ACL injury, uh, because usually they are in varus. So I will do uh, um, a correction on the frontal plane and as in 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 the sagittal plane at the same time. So now I'm using PSI now. Uh, uh, so for, for for double correction, I would say I, I use PSI. That's in one thing I saw. But let, oh, sorry. Yeah, go on. Yes, James. One thing I saw Ronald do, which was really was an opening wedge uh, osteotomy to uh, adjust slope, was to have a pre-made bone wedge um, with the number of millimeters. And he then did a biplate, a correction of the varus valgus and the alignment uh, by 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 just having a. A, a preformed bone wedge, Ronald. That was a. I remember that was a case we did together. A really slick way of of adjusting the slope in two planes. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Ronald, when you're doing an isolated slope correction, how do you protect the hinge? You know, you have the hinge wire that we use for doing corbel plane corrections. But when you're doing an isolated slope correction, how do you protect your hinge, which is at the PCL insertion point? Do you place uh, a wire? Uh, no, I'm not placing a wire. I do not like any wire in that area mm -hmm. other than my mm -hmm. wires approaching from the anterior side. And I'm just as afraid as any other surgeon just to penetrate that dorsal cortex. And I, I'm, I make sure that I have an excellent sagittal plane x-ray view, so fluoroscopy view. And that that, until now, knock on wood, saved me from having big troubles there. But this technique is not a technique for beginners. This is a technique that you should learn and do in small steps and be not too bold with bigger corrections to start. Because it's, uh, it's, if you lose that hinge posteriorly, you have a floating knee situation. And that's, uh, that's not easy to recover from. Uh, not first, first of all for the patient, but also for the surgeon to to go back and to continue there. So uh, that's how do I protect it? I do not put a, a wire in. Probably the PSI uh, users are a little bit in advantage there because that equipment will probably gives you uh, the the optimal. Uh, distance from the posterior cortex in your specific hinge situation to make it safer. That's him. Um, yes. Yeah, I totally agree with Ronald. Uh, my way to protect the hinge, whether I do an opening medial or or a hinge that goes in the back, is to tell a joke between each hit with a hammer <laughs> and use the elasticity of the ball. <laughs> So that's what I tell my, my residents and, and assistants and fellows, that you, this has to take time. So make, tell, make a bad joke in between every hit of the hammer and let the bone uh, sort of gradually use its elasticity. That's, that's my best protection for the, for the hinge. Yeah. No wonder you're so popular amongst fellows. Uh, Vincenzo, a comment from your side regarding fixation. So when we're doing a combined coronal plane and sagittal plane, of course, we are going to use a single stable plate device. But if you're doing an isolated slope correction, what is your choice between using staples, screws, or plates? Does any particular fixation system have any specific advantage over the other? Uh, I would use plates for open, uh, isolated. Uh, gives me more feeling of, insta of stability. Um, uh, we, I, we, I do not use uh, bone uh, substitute, uh, neither um, allograft. So uh, I, I usually don't do huge, huge opening. So um, I would use a, a plate to stabilize and open and staples uh, are, are fine in a closing wedge. Uh, Elvia, when you're doing an isolated slope correction and combining it with an ACL or a PCL reconstruction? I use staple because for me it's easier. A because, uh, 
the, the TBR tunnel is going to be free. There is no material into the TBR tunnel. So it's for that. I, I use staple only for that. To be sure, the TBR tunnel is going to be free out of material. Do you do it as a single stage or a two stage? Uh, for ACL, a uh, single stage. For a PCL, uh, actually, for a PCL, as Peter said uh, in a previous uh, session, uh, usually a injury, a PC, isn't it a PCL? It's quite well managed uh, with just uh, rehabilitation. So I would just go for the slope and no PCL construction. So in one stage, for me, it's really unusual to do a PCL construction and a TBL slope um, also to me at the same time for PCL, I mean. Thank you. So I'll get Peter to give some closing remarks before we close off this session on slope. So Peter, over to you. Can you give us some closing remarks on the session? You'll have to unmute yourself, please. Well, I wasn't part of this session, so I wasn't prepared for that. <laughs> um, I thought uh, <laughs> closing the slope is a very difficult procedure, and I just don't think I think your comment before uh, James about uh, Ron about this is not a straightforward procedure, um, and it's not one for beginners. Um, go and watch a, a more experienced surgeon do it before you take it on yourself, and and. And as Carl said, telling a joke, Carl, I couldn't stand listening to five of your jokes in a row, but I do make a point of opening a, a wedge osteotomy that should only be one degree per minute. So they have to be quick jokes. <laughs> thank you. Sure. So thank you so much, uh, panelists, for this fantastic session. And Adrian, over to you if there are any questions for the panel. Uh, we'll have you bring them on for all of these uh, lovely faculty, please. Thank you, Sacha, for a great session, guys. Thank you so much. Chris, have you got any uh, questions for us? Well, back in the studio, <laughs> the, the, the switchboard's been lighting up. This, is, this session's attracted lots and lots of questions. I've had to field most of them, and some of them are just too long for the panel, and the questioners are going to have to go to the literature and the textbooks to get the answers to the questions, so forgive me for that. But I'm going to put some of the, the quickfire ones to the panel. The first thing before we start, I've done the trigonometry for you. If you work out the sine of one degree, it works out, if you multiply it by 60, it's one mil. So for one degree to equal one mil of opening, your osteotomy has got to be approximately six centimeters long. If it's longer, then your opening's less. If it's shorter, then your opening's more. So that's your basic rule of thumb. I've done it all for you. I looked at the trigonometry tables. So for the panel, uh, and for, for the panel in the, in the, in the ether, What's your basic target when you're correcting the slope? Where, where are you aiming for? Let's say you say correcting a slope of 14 degrees, what are you gonna bring it down to? Quick fire answer. I know it's not uh, an easy thing. Five degrees, 10 degrees, what do you think? Yeah, I'd aim for something uh, normal, so seven for me, and then. Yeah, between five and 10, seven, yeah. Between five and 10. It depends yeah. on the degree of laxity, actually, so I do customize it. Okay. And it depends also on the range of hyperextension or lack of. So less than 10, more than five? Yes. Okay. Now, any dissenters in the ether? What, well, I think one thing to say, Chris, is when, you, when you're opening, if you've got the hyperextension, you can actually see yeah. as you're opening and yeah. actually dial it in. I think that's what you're saying, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So you mustn't leave them with fixed flexion uh, if you're increasing the slope for uh, PCL. A lot of questioners made the point that in reducing the slope to protect your ACL graft, because uh, it's usually revision, Yeah. If the patient already has a hyperextension of the knee, paradoxically, you you're accentuating it. the hyperextension, which might be due to soft tissue factors. How do you reconcile the two things? We've got to be very careful. And they, they both play against each <laughs> other. And if you heel strike with hyperextension, then you're going to drive the uh, ACL into the notch. And so maybe you place the uh, tunnel a little bit more posterior if you're doing a uh, revision. But the, you're reducing the impingement by reducing the slope, aren't you? They may have to, you may have to live with the hyperextension. But the problem with the, the drive, if you, when you, in the gait, when you heel strike with hyperextension, yeah. then it'll drive the knee into further hyperextension. So you have to be careful, I think. So also, it, and you don't want them to get any of the back knee situation, which they do get. So, I mean, the, by happy coincidence, people post-operatively 
struggle with extension. Yeah. So there is often a bit of tightening up, which helps. But with the therapists, I tell them to get them just into hyperextension, no more. Right. Okay. So that's a tricky one. Any offers from the ether? Can you yeah, all yes. hear me? Yes, I, I can comment on that too. Please do. Um, we, we see with the hematoma postoperatively in this kind of surgery that it stiffens up. So I, I agree with Andy that uh, whether uh, when you have intraoperatively this, uh, kind of an amount of hyperextension, uh, postoperatively often it's, it's not that much. Uh, however, in the Abu Dhabi population of Charlie Brown, where we have huge slopes and also uh, PCL insufficiencies, there's so many th revision, we uh, found that with the anterior closing wedge, you can do soft tissue procedures to reduce the soft tissue hyperextension laxity. And uh, that's uh, predominantly a postromedial advancement, yeah. but there's also in the literature like uh, techniques like opening a can of fish, like rolling the capsule posteriorly, and you can do that through small incisions, medial, as well as lateral and then uh, advance. But that's, again, in the hands of, of experienced people. Interesting. Yeah. Couple more. I've got, think we've got time for a couple more. Lateral and medial slopes, they're different. You're targeting the lateral slope with your slope correction or the medial. What do you think? What is, yeah, the lateral, I think we've, we've lateral. sort of... Yeah, right. For, for ACL sufficiency. Yeah. Hmm. Anything... Any, anything Anybody in the ether think differently? It's I mean, the only, lateral slope that's important. The only thing to say in those strange, complex cases, Chris, where you've got a hemi, a hemi plateau problem from a fracture. Of course. Then you're yeah. obviously just going to. But there's all, that point's important because if you change the the sagittal alignment, i.e. the slope, you also can create an axial rotational effect. So with Rob Leprad's medial opening wedge osteotomy for uh, post lateral corner injuries, uh, they found that they actually lost uh, some of the external rotation excess. And the oh. reason for that is as you increase the slope, the femur would fall back on the lateral yes. condyle and that would actually cause internal rotation of the tibia. So this, osteotomy is a really powerful tool. We don't yet understand the implications of some of the corrections we make, particularly in the axial plane. And we just need to keep studying, keep working. Okay. Are you out of time? Okay, we'll stop there. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you very much, Thank everyone. You. That was excellent. Thank really you. great session. Thanks, Sachin. Thank you. Okay, so Thank we. Thank you. So we're now going to go to the uh, industry session for 20 minutes. Um, so we've got uh, joint operations, and we're very lucky to have Professor Rene Verdon pre presenting his algorithm for the meniscus. And then Smith and Nephew are going to take us through the education platform. So we'll leave it there now uh, with the next uh, industry session. Thank you. So uh, good day to you. It's a pleasure to join and discuss with you what to do when the meniscus has been resected and the knee becomes painful or the compartment becomes uh, painful. This uh, is uh, my disclosure. And of course, you understand that we should save the meniscus all the way and all along, and that we are then investing into the future knee health of the individual. However, if uh, you're confronted with a failed meniscal repair and you have to do partial meniscectomy, in a stable knee, it evolves very often asymptomatically over time, but sometimes it uh, remains um, symptomatic and then you have to look in for uh, alternatives and we'll not discuss on the meniscal allografts in this uh, presentation but confront meniscal scaffolds versus meniscal implants because both of them have different indications so this is about the persistent uh, meniscal symptoms after meniscectomy both medial and lateral and partial or eventually in irreparable meniscal tears. And this are the, or these are the inclusion criteria we used when we did the European study. And please note that you need to have a stable or stabilized knee joint. You need to have a, a well-aligned knee, a 
preferably with a lower BMI, and uh, obviously the meniscal horns should be both present. Look at the uh, image on the right hand side, this pristine cartilage, continuous and intact meniscal rim and partial meniscus deficiency, becoming painful in this individual patient. I will not discuss on the procedure. You see how it is illustrated, and probably you know about this very well. You measure the defect, you trim up to the meniscal wall, you cut to size, adding a 10%, and then you insert and suture the meniscus. It is a standardized and reproducible technique. The results, and this is a minimum five year follow up, we now have almost 10 years in a group of patients and when you look at the CUS subscale really it improves. Over time it is significant difference within pre-op and post-op and uh, the uh, results stand the best of time. And this is both true in medials and laterals. However, medials are a little bit better than laterals and you can understand why. Uh, being the lateral being anatomically uh, quite different from the medial meniscus. So the conclusion of this investigation in this European Active Fit study with this uh, minimum five years follow-up is that we obtained good results like 88% of survival in standing the test of time between two and five years. As we wait for longer term results in the wild, please gentlemen, save the meniscus. Now this is uh, also found true in uh, almost 30 uh, clinical publications in young and active patients. You see 34 years of age, more males than females, 700 cases. But please do notice that uh, one out of two patients have concomitant procedures in this approach, like correcting the uh, alignment or stabilizing the knee joint or addressing uh, focal cartilage damages. Um, this is really important to notice when you follow up in literature. This literature illustrates very well that Coos sports and Coos quality of life and also VAS pain scores uh, very much improved over time and stands again the test of time. And remember, these patients connect with you because they have pain after a post meniscectomy situation. So this is really very positive in these results. That is uh, the other side of the coin when we uh, discuss uh, the meniscal implant, like the new surface. This is only medial right now, and the new surface really uh, in uh, biologic uh, or biomechanical investigation really uh, protects the cartilage of the weight-bearing joint and medial uh, compartment. What is the indication? Well, I would say, according to my uh, experience on the matter, it is uh, indicated for these individuals who have no indications for allografts or partial replacements. Allografts really work well, but in the younger aged group, between 45, shall I say, and 60, uh, the cartilage is too much uh, de degraded already and uh, allografts do not work that well. So the nose surface is really in the indication, as you see from this uh, slide, uh, it uh, replaces the meniscus. And uh, as to more recent uh, investigations showed, even in root tier uh, uh, ruptures of the medial meniscus or the lateral meniscus, uh, the, of the medial meniscus, it really works, works well, even in root tier. So the indication is extending. Technically, it's also reproducible. Uh, you prepare the knee joint, you do the atroscopy, you trim the meniscus up to the meniscal wall so that it, you can insert the new surface and it remains stable since it is not uh, fixed nor to the tibia nor to the femur. And really, it improves with time. This is 12 months, but I can tell you at 24 months, as the recent publication had suggested, the pain improves and uh, other coups, activities, daily living, quality of life stand also the test of time. Up to two years in the good indication and in between brackets, uh, it may really be a solution for the older age patient where indeed a root tear is present that you really cannot fix very well or at least not in a stable manner. 
So the target, the patient for this new surface is uh, the medial compartment with the dysfunctional medial meniscus and the irreparable root tears as it appears uh, or in revision from previous meniscus resection. Uh, these patients again, and this is very straightforward, should have stable knees and neutral axis and we should avoid the uh, morbidly obese patients or when the cartilage is too far gone above a great uh, or a little bit more. The active fit implant on the other side is indicated in the patient profile as young and active, good healers, younger patients, I would say below 45 or 40, with stable and aligned knees again, again a pristine cartilage at the most, and uh, no joint surface deformities. And the meniscus profile is, of course, failed partial meniscectomy, a failed partial uh, meniscal repair. Uh, in case of segmental, segmental, and I would say here three to four centimeters segmental mid substance loss in intact rim forms. So thank you very much for your kind uh, attention. Smith & Nephew has always put education at the forefront of its cultural aspirations and strategies. From the first dedicated laboratory training facility in York, which opened in 2011, we have expanded our reach and facilities and in 2017 opened the Expert Connect Centre in Croxley Green. We have developed immersive and expert-led educational courses using the best and most influential surgeon faculty from around the world. The Expert Connect Centre is where healthcare providers challenge themselves to think and act differently, building a network of information and experience and enabling better patient outcomes. The Expert Connect Centre has a divisible 14 station laboratory, has conference and breakout rooms, also boasts an 87 seated auditorium with high definition broadcasting ability. Not only that, but Smith & Nephew are very proudly the first commercial organisation in Europe to have courses accredited by the Royal College of Surgeons. Now let's hear from some great testimonials from leading global opinion leaders. Well, I, I think this shows the world, it shows surgeons, that Smith & Nephew is really committed to uh, surgeon education um, and developing the next generation of uh, educators. There are very few places that have got this sort of facilities, so it's a sign, a mark, if you like, of quality and also commitment to teaching. I mean, there's a big investment to make and there are some obvious spin-offs for the company, but look, it's a genuine attempt to improve the quality of patient care through education. And this is an ideal forum to get people together, train them, train the delegates, centrally located in Europe so we can have access. But the general communication, the ability to get from an airport to here in half an hour will attract world-class people on a more regular basis. This is really a step forward. Uh, I think it's maybe the best surgical training skills facility uh, in the world, at least that I've seen. So I'm very impressed. Throughout the COVID pandemic, we have adapted and innovated our education to best serve the virtual world, keeping you connected with all that Smith & Nephew and our leading faculty have to offer. From our virtual classrooms, to surgical videos and small group lab training. To live interviews and key case discussions. As well as keeping abreast of all the virtual conferencing opportunities. 
Smith & Nephews Education Unlimited, keeping you connected. Even through a pandemic, our drive for product innovation continued. A great addition to our world-leading meniscal repair portfolio was Novastitch Pro. A unique product that allows a circumferential compression stitch around individual tear types. Some of the features include a 1.6 millimeter entry profile for ease of access, a curved upper jaw for the condyle, a needle fully protected from the cartilage, and different size sutures for different repairs. The versatility of the Nova Stitch Pro and its circumferential compression stitch can repair tears such as horizontal cleavage and also allows a stronger repair vector along certain tear types such as radials. The addition of Nova Stitch Pro has helped us expand the opportunity to save even more of the meniscus. Here is a great example of where we've combined product innovation and our education limited in our Live in the Lab series. A virtual classroom of live cadaveric demonstrations with a format that allows open questioning and discussion with a small number of delegation with the faculty. Here Mr James Robinson and Sanjanan demonstrate some key tips and tricks on Nova Stitch Pro on a horizontal cleavage tear. This has been done with, you can do it with an all-inside device, but that does often involve, just relax on that too, that does often involve deploying your T-bars into the capsule at the back, which when you tighten those up, yeah. really does bunch it up quite significantly. Yeah. And also when we're doing inside out, it's the same thing, isn't it? You're, yeah, you're tying a knot on the capsule. And it's, it's, uh... So this advantage of this nervous stitch does allow you to deploy it, and it's wholly within the meniscus itself, and will close that defect up quite nicely. So we've got one load, again, this is a two over here. I'm just going to release the lower jaw. And again, these are fairly simple now. If you want to just plan your attack, so before you fire anything through, make sure we can get to one side of the tear there and one side here. And really, usually two stitches, sometimes three is often all you need with these. So we deploy that as far back as we can. And we just gently depress to make sure we're happy. And as you can see, if I just gently pull on that and pull back, it's sliding off the bottom. So you want to just make sure you just push that in really further. Once you're happy with your position, you can deploy the needle. And as you withdraw now, that's nice. gone through the bottom and come out the top. And you don't need to pass a second throw with this type of repair. Okay. Do you want to tie or do you want me to tie? Thank you. Okay, we'll just hold that. Do you hold on holding that scope for me? Again, SMC, Mars, is that right? Yep. SMC knot. So we're just going to fire it through once round, twice round. And I think it's just worth, it is worth, people do worry about knots. Prior to today, I only knew one knot and it's absolutely fine. So just learn one knot that you can do and you're happy with and stick with that one. So it's just a sliding locking knot. So you pull that down now. You just gently watch that screen now. I'm just going to just literally let go of that right suture and just pull this knot in. And you'll see it just feed down. Into that. Yeah, there we go. So I think I'd be like, you know, I'd, I'd just dip, hold it that there, tuck some clot in, and then snug that yep, knot down. Fantastic. I think that, yeah. And once that's done, you just put two stitches, two further stitches, one forward and one backwards just onto that. And again, you can slide these down. So again, this is something to practice, isn't it? So Absolutely. Just this, you know, because for us knee surgeons, it's not always, uh, you know, this, these sh almost shoulder techniques are not so... You want to push past, past that to really yeah. make sure you get a nice snug repair. Yeah. And if you want, you can put a third one there as well. But we'll just slide the cutter right. down and just cut those off. And that's it really. That's one stitch. And you can just repeat that if you want for the second one. Well, the second one we can put a second one in, yeah. Put the hook in there just so we can just see what one has done. Right, so you can see that has closed that tear really nicely. 
all the way to the back of the meniscus, but not into the capsule. And I think there's a definite difference between the standard. In, if you put two fast fix at the top and bottom, yeah. Yeah. you'll be snugging that and pulling that into the capsule. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Happy with that repair? Just close yeah, it down nicely. We almost put another one in. We'll just put just a second one in. Just show us how, how the device works and uh, we're doing okay for time. So I think this is more for the younger patients who have these power meniscal cysts. Just get the device. And I think the key with this device is really put it further back than you, than you feel you want to initially. So you can see the black laser mark. Just deploy that second, the lower jaw. Just put a little bit more. Um, yeah. Any more valgus? Just a little bit more if you can. Yeah, there we go, mate. There we go. So you can put the upper jaw over the top first. Deploy the lower jaw and then just wriggle it so you can get to where you want to get to. And the nice thing is because of the curve of that, it just takes it away from the condyle, doesn't it? It the does. Needle, yeah. So we're going to push that right to the back. You can just withdraw the bottom jaw and pull that out. Feels like it's better. Okay, so that's going to really push good. that knot down. And really you can push past really snug down. Yeah. And again, you put your third one on the opposite way around. We ignore that. Yeah, that looks we'll, lovely. And we'll just cut that. That's lovely. Fantastic. So you're just going to cut those now yeah. with the knot push load them together. Beautiful. Okay. So we can then put a hook back on there. That. Thanks, James. So you can see we've got two hay bale sutures there, not into the capsule, all the way through the meniscus. I think you've got pretty good compression across there. Uh, if you'd like to see further highlights of Live in the Lab, please go to the Smith & Nephew page within the conference platform. In closing, we have great pleasure in announcing the return of our face-to-face -face flagship soft tissue courses in 2021. October this year will see the return of Soft Tissue 2, focusing on complex and multi-ligament knee surgery. It is hosted by our leading faculty and headed up by Mr. Dave Houlihan Byrne and Mr. Sam Church. Soft Tissue 1 is also back in July this year, focusing on surgical skills relating to meniscal repair and ACL for the early consultant and fellow. This is headed up again by our extending faculty and is chaired by Mr. Adil Adjuid and Mr. Giles Helpburn. For any further information, please click on the live chat link on the conference Smith & Nephew page or take a snapshot of our QR code here on the bottom right. We would like to thank you for listening and a big thank you from all of Smith & Nephew. Welcome back everybody. Uh, we're now going to go on to session two, which is going to be chaired by um, Ronald. Who, and we're going to be looking specifically now at slope change and the cruciate ligaments. Over, over to you, Ronald. 
Okay, thank you, Rex. Uh, we have a slightly different uh, faculty because uh, as well, Howard as well as uh, Alan are busy in their parts of the world. So we have in the studio, Chris Wilson, Matt Dawson, Andy Williams and Rex. And then we have uh, in the ether, we have James Robinson and Bushan. Bushan, can I invite you to present your slides to introduce this uh, session, please? Yeah, hello. All. Um, we are going to have a look at uh, the literature supporting uh, the correlation between the slope and uh, the cruciate ligaments as such. Uh, can we get the slides on, please? Yeah, so there are various studies that uh, have uh, noted this correlation and the effect of slope change and cruciate ligaments. And uh, I've looked at uh, various data uh, uh, or various uh, studies that have dealt with uh, the slope change and uh, the crucial uh, ligament biomechanics change. This is the, this is the first slide uh, study from California. Let me just get this on, give me a second. Yeah, so this study from California looked at MRIs of patient with ACL tear, and it was noted that the posterior TBL slope correlated. Uh, next, uh, please click the next one. Yeah, so you can see the posterior TBL slope on the lateral side correlated very well with uh, incidence of ACL rupture. Now, the second study from uh, Rochester States uh, also looked at uh, 35 patients who had early graft failure. So now we are talking about a uh, patient who had ACL reconstruction that failed within two years, and they were compared with 30, 35 controls uh, who also had an ACL reconstruction but did not have a graft failure. And once again, the posterior slope on the lateral side uh, was significantly more and in the group that uh, failed the ACL reconstruction. And the odds ratio of uh, ACL reconstruction failing uh, increased significantly with increasing posterior TBL slope on the lateral side. Next slide, please. Now, so we have literature supporting the association uh, in theory. What about uh, practical? Now, whenever you look at data, you look at the theoretical data, then you look at cadaveric studies. This cadaveric study from Professor Imov group is quite interesting, actually. Can we have the next, please? So, in, uh, once again, next, please. Yeah, so in this 25 cadavers uh, were CT scanned and uh, 10 of these which had significantly high TBL slope were included. Uh, these were tested, the ACL resected and ACL reconstructed and uh, the anterior TBL translation uh, and the forces in the ACL graft were then assessed. And uh, as expected, it was noted that the anterior TBL translation was reduced significantly with slope change. They used an external fixator and did a closing wedge anterior osteotomy on the cadavers. And the ACL graft forces were also found to be reduced with, with uh, uh, slope change. So we have cadaveric confirmation as well. Next slide, please. Next, please. So now what about live patients? So uh, David Dijar has done a lot of work on slope change and uh, looking at the literature, I could find so many articles written by his group that I was quite surprised. So uh, this is a review article. So anyone interested in slope change can have a good look at it. They have uh, uh, discussed the standardized techniques for measuring TBL slope, which you have discussed. Uh, next, please. Next, please. And uh, it, it also looked at how to assess anterior TBL translation using a telos device. So you can standardize the technique in which you are assessing the anterior TBL translation and also uh, measure the slope. Next, please. Next, please. An important thing to remember is that the MRI slope, uh, the soft tissue slope that can be measured on MRI is different as compared to the bony slope. And uh, the soft tissue slope is, is slightly flatter as compared to the bony slope. Next, please. Next, please. Yeah. And we all know our knowledge of uh, slope change for compensating ACL deficiency comes from our veterinary friends who uh, have done this surgery for quite some time for their canine patients. Next, please. Okay, so similar the effect, uh, uh, so quantitatively speaking, uh, 10 degrees of increase in posterior TBL slope will lead to about six millimeters of increasing in anterior TBL translation, irrespective of whether you have a functioning ACL or not. And similar effect is seen when the slope is increased so, uh, so much so that PCL deficiency can be completely compensated when the slope is changed by about five degrees or so. So that's a, a very good uh, thing for PCL failures. You can just adjust the slope and the, the deficiency will be completely compensated. 
Uh, next slide, please. Now, coming to actual studies which look at uh, using slope change in practice. Now, this study from Sonari Cote uh, from uh, Lyon uh, utilized the technique in patients undergoing re revision ACL reconstruction. So, this is a second time uh, revision ACL reconstruction. And in this study, it's a very small study of five patients who underwent re revision ACL. Uh, the posterior tibial slope average was about 12. And this was corrected to uh, corrected by about four degrees along with the revision ACL reconstruction. Next slide, please. So uh, you can see the excess slope that was seen in these patients. Next slide, please. And this is the way in which uh, the tibial slope was altered. Once again, next slide, please. Again, yeah, and that's uh, a surgical uh, picture of the, the procedure as such. Now, these were all fairly active patients with an average Tegna score of 7.4. So those were actually involved in competitive sports and their Tegna score post-operatively at two years was 7.2. So they were able to go back to their normal activities, which is a good thing. Next slide, please. Now, one more study from Dija group looked at a similar group of patients who were fairly active who underwent combined slope-changing osteotomy and ACL reconstruction once again for a Second revision ACL reconstruction, and at two year follow up, there were no failures. So, combining the two procedures seems to be a norm in literature rather than just going for a single uh, technique as such. Uh, next slide, please. This is slightly older study. I could not actually find this study. This is 1998 study from Dija group again, a slightly bigger number 22 patients. And in these uh, uh, 18 patients underwent slope correction as well as ACL reconstruction while only slope change was done in four patients. And uh, only slope change did not give as good a result as compared to combining slope uh, correction as well as ACL reconstruction. Next, please. Now, finally, I could only find one Chinese study which looked at primarily doing a slope change along with ACL reconstruction in the first instance before the ACL failed. And uh, again, uh, this showed really promising results. So this was the only study I could find where primarily a slope change was done along with ACL reconstruction as a study. Next slide, please. So does this mean that we need to look at slope for every patient who comes uh, in our uh, theater for ACL reconstruction? Do we need to think of a slope change for every patient who fails ACL reconstruction? And in low demand patients, can we get away with just slow change? I think that opens up the discussion for us. Thanks, Ron. Well, thank you very much, Bushan. And uh, to go over, because we're, we're now, you have given an excellent overview of all the articles and all the publications on combined procedures, but also on the articles that deal with the deformity in the bone whether it's described as MRI with soft tissues or only the bone deformity. We're gonna discuss about the slope chains only or should we do the ACL, PCL as well? So the bone deformity is there and we go by each individual faculty member. Would you, and you already mentioned it Bushan, would you in a low demand patient go only for the bone correction? Bushan, you're at first. Yeah, I think uh, for someone who's not a sportsman, who's, let's say, in the late 30s, early 40s, and uh, is not essentially uh, doing any heavy impact activities, uh, I would think of just doing a slope change and getting away without doing uh, a revision ACL reconstruction. Okay, James, what's your opinion on that? Um, well, we sort of talked about this earlier. I for me, the, the slope changes are mainly for the re-revisions. Um, interesting, Al Getgood, who was going to be on this uh, session, just WhatsApp me from theatre saying that in the stability study that they've done, um, the slope increase was obviously was associated with an increased risk of failure. But addition of a lateral extra-articular procedure did uh, you know, help to decrease the number of ACL ruptures in that group. Uh, and so for me, with a primary ACL, even if the slope is, I mean, not drastic, I, it, but it, but increased, that for me is a warning sign that we should be considering to add a lateral extra articular procedure in that patient to help protect the ACL. Okay, now we're back to primary ACL. I want to go back to a, a, a slope deformity, which is there on your x-rays, however you measure it. Um, 
Chris, would you consider in a PCL deficient patient only to do a small flexion osteotomy? Well, I've got a clear view on this. The patient who's had a chronic PCL injury and a lot and posterior sag for more than a year is usually starting to develop some medial OA. Uh, mm -hmm. My view is I would now, having done a few combined PCL reconstructions and osteotomies early in my career and suffered for it, I would only do a slope increasing osteotomy. If there was no need for a coronal correction, uh, then I wouldn't do one, but there generally is a small coronal correction to be done as well. So I would treat the problem entirely by increasing the slope and, and making a coronal correction. That's the PCL. The acute PCL, different thing. I would never do anything to the bone when dealing with an acute PCL, either manage it non-operatively non or in some cases with a reconstruction. And I would sort of make, well, I've got the flaw, I would make the point that the converse doesn't apply to the ACL. You can't treat ACL instability by reducing the slope. You can simply reduce the slope to protect a graft in a revision situation. I think that's a, that's a common misunderstanding when we're talking about slope alteration and the cruciate ligaments. Thank you very much, Chris. Uh, a, a lot of information here. Andy, what's your thought about this? There's another aspect of PCL, in chronic PCL insufficiency, the patients often develop a fixed posterior subluxation of the tibia. We've looked at this in our MRI studies uh, 20 years ago and these were asymptomatic cases of isolated PCL, and we scanned them. First of all, we found that the kinematic abnormality was in the medial compartment, hence PCL insufficiency gives you anteromedial osteoarthritis. But also when we translated the tibia forward, in none of those asymptomatic knees could we actually bring the um, tibia as far forward as we could in the unaffected knee. And so I think it's because people sit around and with gravity, the tibia drops back and they get a contracture. I don't really believe that happens with um, ACL. Somebody mentioned early on a fixed anterior subluxation. I, I really don't recognize that. I can't understand that. Um, and obviously very happy to discuss it. Um, but uh, the power of the osteotomy for a PCL is to slowly stretch that capsule out as well as uh, altering the um, kinematics medially and also shifting uh, weights to the lateral side if there's a varus and uh, medial OA. Well, thank you. And I was exactly hoping for that with the, uh, the fixed uh, posterior position and what you do with that. Rex, what are your thoughts about uh, combining procedures, ACL plus osteotomy or PCL plus osteotomy? Yeah, so I think doing it as a stage procedure just uh, gives you a bit of time to recover from the actual insult from the osteotomy. It is a big procedure to undertake both a reconstruction and an osteotomy at the same time, particularly in the revision setting when you just let the soft tissue settle off and the bone to heal. It's quite a nice environment to then go in to remove the meta work that you've done for the slope change and then do the ligament reconstruction thereafter. Particularly if you're doing the anterior correct corrections, whether you're using an allograft or if you're doing a closing osteotomy, they usually heal up pretty quick. So downtime's not, not too long. But you know, in, in my, my practice, I would say doing a stage procedure is a, is a, is a, is a good approach. Okay, thank you there. Well, given the fact that often we consider slope corrections at the stage where an ACL reconstruction already has failed or a PCL reconstruction already has failed, and we have a situation where if we want to revise that, we need to do bone tunnel grafting. Matt, would you then do two-stage, first-stage slope correction then with, with grafting or would you do it the other way around? Well, just exactly as you said the first time, I definitely graft. That's what I've done in the past. Uh, um, cases are sometimes, you know, for the re-revision situation where the, you know, you might consider one one tunnel try um, acceptable for an ACL, but when there's been two tries already, um, I think you have to graft it. That that would be my philosophy, and then go back and do it at six months when you when you're happy it's incorporated. Yeah, well, thank you, thank you, Matt. This is exactly what we've seen in one of the previous uh, sessions, case presentation. Now, I just want to, from out of my own experience, um, I wanted to make a statement here. The statement I want to make is the bone always wins. So again, the bone always wins. 
And that's from my experience also in the Middle East, uh, uh, working with Charlie Brown, who this uh, third time revision, so revision ACL third time, uh, or uh, the other way around with PCL. Um, in the end, if you have a high sloped patient, ACL failing, ACL graft failing again and again, my, my thought is you have to address the bone whatsoever. So what are your thoughts on going then to that primary patient? If you have, uh, for example, in the Middle East region, there's a six times higher incidence of ACL ruptures in the primary population, six times higher than the US. Bushan, also in your region, you have a higher slope. Primary slope reduction in ACL first time rupture. What would, what's your thought on that? I think uh, slope correction is, is uh, a bigger undertaking as compared to ACL reconstruction. Maybe for someone like you, it's a, a very straightforward, simple surgery. But uh, for, for someone like me, I think it, it's slightly bigger undertaking for the patient as well as for the surgeon. So I would possibly give one try for a, a standard ACL reconstruction to work. And if that fails, I will think of uh, a, a slope change. I'll discuss this with the patient as well. Um, if that well, patient well, is... If, if I may, may, may stop you there. So you would discuss with the patients, although you have a high slope, and that yeah. may be a risk factor, we want to try it first with the, the standard procedure. I might add a lateral tenodesis. That's not okay. Okay. I see you nodding, uh, James. The same for you here? Yeah, I, I think that's right. And, and um, it was nice to have Al's sort of confirmation of that. I, I mean, I think that if you, particularly in somebody who's looking to get back to sport, um, you, uh, so someone in their 20s looking at getting back to sport, I think an, an ACL, a lateral extra articulate, and a warning that your, you know, your, your biomechanics is against you is what I'd go, where I'd go to first. If they then fail, then I think you're looking at addressing the slope. Yes. Well, uh, to go back to London, uh, the room over there, I, I, I realize I'm totally biased but doing only the bones and the corrections, but uh, g give me some help here, guys, from the sports and Chris from the trauma side. Um, am I right to address the bone all the time? Well, Chris, but the prim a primary situation, a primary ACL rupture, even with a high slope, more than 50% of the patients will have a good result. We're talking about a high re-rupture rate, but they won't all re-rupture. So, you know, the general principle is first do no harm. ACL reconstruction is a reproducible and well, you know, well-defined procedure, even though there are imponderables. And I think I would never do, I would never do a primary uh, procedure involving a complex osteotomy like this. I would only reserve it for a redo where the slope was obviously a contributory factor in the, in the graph not performing well. Well, then on patient information, Chris, you have a patient who has ev uh, evidently a high slope. Would you warn that patient against going back to uh, ACL, uh, sp well, sports that lead to ACL ruptures? Well, uh, again, patient needs to be involved and a full disclosure, full transparency over what the risk factors are. You'd also warn them, you know, young female, etc., etc. All those things that might contribute to a failure, but it would still wouldn't persuade me to do this really quite major procedure as a first time round treatment for a procedure which more than 50% of the time is going to treat the patient's problems quite well. Yes, indeed. Thank you. Andy, what about the elite sportsman? Well, any, any use of slope corrections there? Yeah, I don't think so. I mean, uh, it's very much the view that if an elite athlete has an osteotomy, they don't get back to the same level. So I don't have the luxury of being able to use this tool. And so we have to get around the problem by doing the best ACL we can. So we choose the right graft, which in football is patellar tendon. Other sports may be different. Adatinodesis, 
and uh, make sure the menisci are as good as we can get and make sure the rehab is good because I don't think they would get back from uh, an osteotomy. But modern osteotomy is getting better and better and it's tantalizing. I think one day we, we might consider it. But going back to Chris's point, the only time I would ever do an osteotomy with a primary ACL reconstruction is in a chronic ACL deficient knee that's got usually medial OA or lateral chondral damage. And I'll combine an osteotomy with an ACL reconstruction in those cases. But the vast majority of my slope changing osteotomies are also to change the coronal plane alignment to offload medial lateral compartments. And um, you know, that's, ha that's the way I think really. But in a primary healthy joint, primary ACL and a healthy joint, I wouldn't do an osteotomy. Well, thank you very much for this, uh, this answer. It is actually the, the perfect opening to the next uh, session. Uh, thank you very much, faculty members, for this discussion. We're going to go to the next uh, question and to the next session. What has happened to your hair, Ronald? You are crazy today. No, no, no. no. <laughs> I don't know whether we are open already in the air. No, no I guess we're not. Okay. Yeah, okay. I hope so. <laughs> Ronald. Yes. Can we continue? Yes, over to you. Okay, thank you very much. So as we ended the previous session mentioning by Andy Williams that he does a medial opening wedge and slope correction, we're now short, we, we have 10 minutes to discuss the frontal approach versus the medial lateral approach. Mathieu, can you please present some slides here? Yeah, of course. Thank you, Ronald. Thank you once again for, so I, I want you to give some basics and I will say that uh, 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 to be honest, there is two ways to, 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 to correct those kind of slopes, anterior closing versus posterior medial openings. And to me, the answer is very easy. You need to understand what is the, the deformity you want to correct more. Is it slope or is this virus associated to slope? For this case, for example, you have an example of a patient with a, a quite normal slope, third ACL revision, and uh, the MPTA is 84, so you can scroll to the next one. Next slide. So for this one, uh, my, my, my option was to go postural medial and do a postural medial opening to correct the slope and correcting the virus at the same time because the biggest deformity was frontal. Next slide. Second case, uh, just to remind you that for this guy already have two ACL, rear rupture, no meniscus left on the major side. He's 45, next slope, next slide. But when you analyze the virus you have, you can see it's all in the femur. So you need to also imagine that for this kind of patient, you will need two correction, next slide. One for the slope on the tibia, but the virus need to be corrected on the right bone either with this kind of setting. So we do a DFO plus slope changing osterum. Last case, please. And for the last one, you can switch to the one, next one. Yeah. For the last one, it was a pure slope changing osteotomy for a 30 CL uh, revision for a 23 year, 21 years old patient. The PPTA was 77, but the axis is normal switch. So we just correct the slope by an anterior approach. So to be easy, try to correct where you want to correct. If you want to treat various, do medial openings. If you want to correct slope, do anterior closing. It would be my last words. Thank you very much, Mathieu, also for staying within time. Bogdan, what's your experience with the slope correction osteotomy? Uh, actually, I agree with uh, Mathieu. It's um, usually, if I correct uh, the slope, it's almost my indications are mostly fixed uh, PCL cases, so I do it uh, staged. And I usually do it uh, in frontal way. Uh, usually with the ACL, I try to combine it with the surgery or from medial opening or lateral closing. Uh, but usually, uh, really, it's important which is the most important deformity to correct. And then the other correction, you adjust to the other. And in these cases, uh, I use always navigation and also PSI. Uh, also to plan everything 
and to do to print some also some um, jigs and to correct uh, in in both planes the correction. But usually, uh, when I have like ACL revision, I, it's also possible to correct the slope from the medial part with opening. But in this case, you have to also go very close to the hinge and try to also to break it and to change it. And uh, But um, I know that from the medial side, you can change the slope like maximum five to seven degrees. If you have more than uh, seven degrees of correction of the slope, you have to address it from anterior part, in my thank case. You. Th thank you, Bogdan. You have all the toys in the store over there where you're practicing PSI, navigation, all the things. Yes. But you mentioned very important issues here, breaking the hinge. Chris, is that also your approach, Christian, um, uh, your approach when you want to do medial open wedge and slope correction? Yeah, so uh, thanks for having me once again uh, and, and giving me the opportunity to contribute here in this in this uh, section where we speak about osteotomies, uh, where when we are honest, I mean, we don't treat like a hundred of these uh, every year. So first at hand, I, I want to emphasize now because I after listening to the, the sessions, uh, it gives the impression as if we are doing like uh, uh, crazy amounts of these surgeries. And if I'm doing a lot of those, then I would say even when I was in a, in a practice where we treated massively, it was like 10 a year for the whole uh, for the whole team. So maybe I do like five of these a year. But anyhow, yes, it's absolutely right. Uh, I couldn't agree more to what has been said. We approach the, the, the core um, deformity uh, that we have. Uh, and first we have to analyze in what plane it is. So then we address the surgery. So this is very much patient triggered, obviously, uh, where we go to. And obviously, yes, when we want to change more uh, than a certain amount of degrees from the medial side and want to con convert a purely uh, frontal plane surgery into the sagittal plane, well, then the hinge goes. Yeah, that's quite normal, I would say. Do you have um, a cutoff point? Let's say we have 10 degrees to correct uh, uh, in the frontal plane and 10 degrees in the sagittal plane. Would you then make it uh, from medial and then mm. uh, cut the hinge? Because no. Bogdan stated no. it's not possible. Yeah, I would say it's, I would not even say that it's not possible. I think a term unpredictable is, is way better because you yeah. don't have access to the, to the, uh, to the uh, contralateral side. When you go from the medial side, you don't have good, good control of the lateral side. Well, we could emphasize as this is like um, this is like a sphere, the lateral side of the plateau, at least is a cutout of a greater sphere. You could say, well, it doesn't play a major role, but as a matter of fact, we don't know. We can not provide sufficient data or at least big enough data to prove that. So my approach would be as I'm unpredictable with this, uh, I would say I go from the frontal side. So from the frontal side, at least this is what you can do is use your trigonometry. And that is exactly what Chris Wilson ta uh, taught us a couple of minutes ago. Um, you can measure it up and say, well, how long is my is my angular correction? How, how wide do I have to open? And then you can measure it up all from the front as if you're doing a normal open wedge just from the medial side. Okay. But then individual yeah, but for each side. Well, let's yeah, go to it's... let's go to Chris now because we have this situation where we have two planes that are off. Chris, if you w would go from the frontal side, can you also correct somewhat in uh, in in the frontal plane? So we have to decrease the slope. Can we also do a little bit of varus or valgus uh, mm -hmm. correction? What's your opinion on that? Well, it's possible. My technique is that for every frontal correction now, I would take the tubercle off. Uh, it, seem, uh -huh. it seems radical, but it's technically a lot easier to have an um, accurate slope correction. And it, when you do that, you have an opportunity to have a differential opening, to have a small degree of varus valgus correction. The only technique modification would be if I was doing a pure a sagittal correction for, for example, a uh, person that's 
got an anterior slope because of a previous growth plate injury, I would do a biological plate. But if you're now introducing a coronal correction, I think the obligation then is to put a um, prosthetic plate on the, on the medial or the lateral side because the biological plate can't provide that degree of rotational stability that you need if you've done a two-plane correction. Yeah, I, I, I think I totally agree there. And, and we have to be, we, we have seen a lot of techniques. Uh, and if we are talking about biplanar, you probably want to add some extra fixation. It has been mentioned in previous session too. Um, final one for Macho here, because you're an expert in the PSI world. Um, uh, combined planes, uh, where do you put your plate and how do you use the PSI? Good question, Ronald. Uh, you know that PSI is connected to the plate you use. So it's the, the question is not, not the, the real question is what plate will you use? And I would say that if I need to correct slope plus frontal, I would probably use two plates or a staple and a plate. At the beginning, we only have a medial plate with the PSI. Now we have a lateral one. So to be honest, today I would do lateral plating, medial staple. And I will leave the tuberosity in place and try to play behind it. I know that you will not love this part of the answer, but uh, when, when you get shoes of living in, in place and playing behind, it's working. Well, great. And perfectly in time. Thank you, faculty, for this session. We're going to move over to the next one. And uh, Rex is going to present some slides there instead of Adrian. Thank you very much. Bye-bye, friend. Thank you. Bye. Fantastic. Welcome back to the studio, guys. Uh, so we're now going to move on to the third part of this session, which is looking at the extended in indications and technical tips. Um, I'll be presenting the cases, and this will be chaired by Ronald. Ronald, should I get on and present the cases? Yes, please, Rex. Just uh, do the cases, and then we're going to have a 30 minutes discussion on the extended indications. Thank you. Brilliant. So this is actually leading on nicely to what we've already been discussing prior to in the first two questions. And these are cases that we've done with Ronald and Christian at the London Clinic. So the first case, this case is of a 52-year-old gentleman who's got a background history of Charcot-Marie Tooth with excessive recovatum, reduced slope and a valgus alignment. So you can see here on the, on the lateral standing weight-bearing views, he, he dips into quite excessive recovatum and he's very um, symptomatic from that. But he also had some valgus alignment on the coronal views. So this was a case that I did with uh, Christian. So Christian left the um, tibial tuberosity on and he actually worked around the tibial tuberosity and did the osteotomy with the tuberosity still intact. By putting lamina spreaders either side of the um, plateau, we were able to elevate the plateau and correct the slope. In order to compensate for the fact that the patient was in valgus, we put different sized wedge grafts in so that we had a bigger wedge graft on the lateral side compared to the medial side. And this corrected the alignment, as you can see on this II film, to the middle of the joint. So it's a bigger wedge on the lateral side compared to the medial side. And these are the post-op x-rays. Same patient we did with Ronald, it was just a slightly different approach. Um, so this patient, same again, had a previous operation in his childhood. You can see the screw and the tension band wiring from the previous operation. And he had a very complex problem. So he had, um, a, needed a DFO to varize and a slope change for a recovatum. So we first did the distal femoral osteotomy. In our practice, it's quite standard to do a medial closing wedge distal femoral osteotomy. And you can see that nicely corrects the valgus alignment. And then we did a biological plate. This is the term that we, this is the term that we use for this operation. 
As Chris explained earlier, we take off the tibial tuberosity, so we have access to the front of the uh, front of the tip, frontal, from the frontal plane. We gently elevate the um, the, the slope. And then we fix the uh, tibial tubercle back down again, having filled the gap with um, femoral head allograft. We then use the, um, the actual tibial tubercle to, as a plate, and we put small fragment screws to fix it back on, and some staples either side to, fix, uh, to hold it in place. And you can see the correction nicely aligned um, with the correction of the valgus and the correction of the slope. Back to you, Ronald. Well, thank you very much, Rex. Uh, and a nice, nice uh, approach to, to uh, look at one patient, two legs. In interesting patient that was. Now, we're talking about extended indications and, and you have seen examples now of rather complex surgeries. Um, extended indications also mean that we have found patients where we say an osteotomy can do the job here. When we think of extended indications, and first uh, is, is here Matt, uh, what indications through the years as an osteotomist have you found um, that you didn't start with? So you started with various osteoarthritis medial compartment, and now through the years you have probably found patients with extended indications for osteotomies. Yeah, well, it's, it's fantastic. It's like having a, you know, a paint box and somebody keeps giving you blank canvases. It's, it's really, really eye-opening what you can get up to. And there was one case uh, which came to my mind earlier, and I was just thinking, could I dangle a carrot in front of Chris for this, for this slope change in the primary ACL? But if you've got a patient, and this happened recently, who has arthrofibrosis uh, with an ACL injury, and they develop a, a, a bit of a fixed flexion, uh, together with that relatively high slope, then a primary osteotomy can be a way out of jail there. And remarkably, and this has been about a year, the, the, not only did the extension recover, but the flexion recovered as well from a, an anterior closing wedge osteotomy. So, so that was peculiar and rewarding at the same time. I think the other things are all of the combinations, and, uh, such as you know, as, as you've just seen, you can change the um, the, the, the uh, coronal plane using uh, uh, the uh, differential sized uh, wedges in the in the proximal tibia. And I saw Christian in Warsaw demonstrated that technique to me, and I I still haven't done it, but I will uh, because it looks very go-to. I, I currently lift the tubercle off. But also, you know, you could do this in the femur if you're staying in the, in, in the green zone and there are small corrections. So I think the capability and the, the trust you have in your own hands when you do a number of these things opens so many doors and uh, it makes it something that you really want to tell people about. Well, thank you very much. Um, same question here for, 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 for James, who is also in the faculty here. Uh, if I'm not uh, not uh, so so, so wrong. James couldn't make this session, uh, Ronald. So okay. it's myself, okay. Andy, and Chris in the studio. Okay, Andy. Then, um, what extended indications did you find during the years of osteotomy? I mean, it's um, there's something fundamental about having a straight limb, and we often forget that because the mechanics are favourable, the loading is favourable. You don't get dynamic varus valgus, etc. So. I, mean, I think that probably the biggest things uh, for me have been the use of osteotomy with complex ligament instability and also uh, intra-articular uh, deformity due to malunited uh, intra-articular fractures. So I've uh, done a, a reasonable number of combined extra-articular and intra-articular corrections for depressed, usually lateral tibial plateau fractures. And uh, the... It's obviously a very big exposure, it's a big procedure, but you can get millimetre perfect reduction of these depressed areas, even if they've been healed for a year or two in the wrong position, and the patients can be delighted. Now, there is risk with it, obviously, um, but uh, it, generally speaking, it's been very pleasing and life-changing for people concerned. Okay, thank you. Um, Christian, extended indications. What have you found out through your journey in osteotomy world through the years? Uh, specific cases where you say, well, I wouldn't have thought an osteotomy would work out there. 
Yeah, that's that's a good question. I'm, we are at a point where we have to confess that everything has been set apart from myself. So um, I, I have plenty of cases that I was able to experience where I have seen that the osteotomy was the only approach that basically helped the patient. And as, um, as James said, is life changing. So what we have is, uh, I, I like the answer that we've heard before that uh, there is a certain demand for a straight limb. And um, the good thing about osteotomy is if you have it in your armamentarium, that it's a tool that you can use for all the problems that may arise around your knee. So it's either for post-traumatic, as we've heard, it's for complex ligament problems, and it's for the simple so-called um, plane corrections. So um, I would say it is probably the most versatile surgical tool that was given into my hands. So I do lots of um, hip and knee replacements, but uh, they are all very specifically for for certain uh, diseases and, and osteotomy is something that covers the whole knee. So whenever you run into problems uh, that go beyond the normal and your re patients are referred to you because of very complex scenarios, most probably an osteotomy is the answer to go for. Well, thank you to, to, to that too. Although Chris Wilson is not part of this faculty, um, I want to involve him. Chris, I, I, I see you sitting there because you have an, a marvelous series of patients. I know, I know that uh, you presented that had uh, osteochondral defects, uh, lateral as well as medial, uh, where you, even if they, they were old, where you unloaded that area, yeah. And there was certainly a recovery. Can well, you tell us about that? Yeah, we've got eight now, so we should write them up. But um, essentially, if you go back to Roman Sales' nice slide, the treatment gap, over the years, my treatment gap has got wider. So I do patients with very early disease, osteoarthritis, so-called failing knee, the pre-arthritic knee almost, and uh, abnormal load. And I believe you can preempt and even prevent osteoarthritis in these patients, uh, yet to be proven. And the patients with very late disease, who have got very end-stage arthritis, and particularly the valgus knee, respond very well to realignment without knee replacement. So that, those are my additions. But the patient group you mentioned, these are patients who've come along, they're young, they've had many, in some cases, four failed attempts to treat large osteochondral lesions and we've done nothing other than correct the axis. And in all eight cases, we've seen spontaneous healing and resolution of the lesion. So you could call this the osteotomy effect, the biological effect is very interesting. It is controversial, but I'm sure it happens. So it's encouraged me to offer patients with early degenerative change, the failing knee, the chance, if appropriate, to, to have this type of treatment group as well, the um, posterior root tear patients of the medial meniscus mm -hmm. who uh, have varus alignment will often get avascular necrosis. And one of my neighbours where I live, happens to be the same age, very young at 57, um, he presented during lockdown with a very rapid onset of uh, deteriorating medial compartment with AVN. And he was offered a total knee replacement, which is extraordinary. Um, so I did a medial meniscal posterior root repair and an osteotomy lateral closing wedge and he's now totally asymptomatic um, six months on. The MRI signal now is normal and it's the power of realignment. You know, it's amazing. And so the, the use of osteotomy to protect things must never be forgotten. The, the osteochondritis dissecans cases I see in elite sports, uh, occasionally I'll do an osteotomy in the youngsters. Now they, they often don't go on and do well, but we do have a, a weird game in the UK called cricket and uh, it's less athletic than others, and may, maybe you can get away with it. I've currently got a boy who's now 19, he's two years out from a distal femoral osteotomy plus um, uh, fixation of a, an enormous osteochondritis dissecans lesion of his lateral femoral condyle. So it, it is powerful. Yeah, well, thank you very much, uh, especially these posterior root tears, which is kind of a, yeah. a new thing. Um, uh, brings me to a perfect bridge to my experience because I had the experience of a professor, Professor Rene Marty, who I was a resident with, and he presented cases like 25 years follow-up, and we put that in that book on, on manual of post-traumatic deformities. And 
he had patience. Of course, he started in an era where total joint replacement wasn't that good and, and, and had, had the results they're having now. But these were awful post-traumatic situations where he just realigned the leg. He just made the leg straight in all planes and these patients returned for follow-up sometimes 20 years plus with no, it wasn't a perfect joint. It wasn't like the joint was without degeneration, but there was no question that this patient would ask for metal and plastic, so a replacement. So the power of realignment I, I've witnessed through my, my teaching and I've seen it very often. And that is what you kind of confirm the speakers here. And I think it's, it's, it's important to teach that to the audience for the new indications, the new things we see, the, the specific meniscal lesions that are kind of new. Be aware that if you do a perfect root repair and it is in a varus metal lined leg, you probably will have not such a long survival. As we all know, also from cartilage lesions, if that cartilage lesion you repair with whatever technique, and it is in a compartment where you overload, then the alignment will, it will be the key factor of failure. Well, to continue in this session, Rex, you had another case to present? Yeah, so, um not slides per se, um, but Ronald, the just as other indications that certainly in my practice more recently have, have come to light uh, with patients who are about to undergo joint replacement having had trauma prior. So in fact, there was a case that you came to look over my shoulder at Guy's Hospital to make sure I did a good job of it. But uh, there's a patient who have malrotation, who've got patellofemoral maltracking, they've got fixed flexion deformity having previously had femoral shaft fractures. And the natural you know, thoughts would be to go straight to a total joint arthroplasty. Now we know that if you are malrotated with poor patellofemoral maltracking, you've got a fixed flexion deformity, trying to correct all of that through a total joint is, is, is difficult and also not likely to last a, a particularly long time. So now we're getting more and more people sending patients in with post-traumatic deformities that are so ready for a TKA, but actually they've got the, they need to be corrected. And, and, in, and certainly we've done a few cases now where we've derotated and corrected the uh, flexion extension um, uh, sagittal alignment in one, in one sitting. And they're much better suited to having that total joint arthroplasty. So I think that's another extended indication uh, worth, worth considering. Um, certainly not something to be done in your sort of early years as doing uh, osteotomies. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. It's also, yeah, we shouldn't forget to, uh, that there is probably a next surgery which you want to postpone, but also probably to realign a leg so that a next surgery is possible in, in the near or the further farther future. Now, as we have an expert panel here who are dealing with uh, extended indications, through your uh, journey in the, the, the years of your career with osteotomies, what extended indications didn't work? And I'm going to put mine in first. As uh, Andy was already talking about intra-articular reconstructions, I've, done, uh, I've been thought how to do that, uh, and I've been, been doing that. However, I found out that some of these attempts just failed. And um, I am now, uh, in specific cases, shifting towards... Uh, allografting tibial plateau, parts of tibial plateau, and then do an unloading osteotomy under the allograft. So the question now is, through your career, what extended indication surgeries you tried failed? Matt, to start with you. Well, I, I don't know if I, I probably will try it again, but I, uh, I the first couple of uh, attempts at um, dealing with joint line obliquity on a, a previous osteotomy, going back and doing a, a double osteotomy to correct the joint line obliquity, because there was nothing wrong with the coronal correction, but they were overcorrected in the, the joint line. And then revising that by doing a, a double level osteotomy, I expected a, a, a magic wand to correct the situation, but it didn't. So I don't know whether that was because the arthritis had got too far, 
but it's still something I'd be interested in doing because I know looking back on some of my osteotomies before I started doing double level, I think a lot of them have that obliquity, which I'd rather they didn't. Yes. Well, thank you. Thank you. Chris, you had a, a perfect video uh, presentation uh, in your lecture also, in the, the pre-course material, and you were very honest and open about uh, doing femoral corrections, uh, you should be careful, and there's a learning curve, and there are risks and dangers. Uh, doing extended indications, uh, can you tell us a little bit about complications during that kind of surgery? Well, I'm well placed to talk about complications after femoral osteotomy. I'm unfortunate enough to have uh, injured one patient's femoral artery uh, only the one, but uh, a dramatic complication, which in this case turned out badly. The, the osteotomy was fine. Um, mm -hmm. We completed that, uh, but the vascular injury required repair and there have been complications. She's a young girl, 18, and amazingly she's come back to have the other leg straight, and so she still has sort of some faith in me, but it's left a big impression on me. So um, there's no question uh, that Osteotomy, particularly around the distal femur, uh, requires, it, it goes without saying, it requires a, a great deal of care and a lot of time spent protecting the neurovascular bundle. In fact, um, it's easy to become, when you've done, say, 20, slightly blasé about it, but it was a very strong wake-up call for me because um, 10 or 15 minutes spent in the initial dissection, isolating the site of osteotomy, and making absolutely sure that you wouldn't injure even an aberrant vessel, because they do occur, uh, is time very well spent. It sounds very obvious, but it's easy over the time to become slightly blasé about these risks. Yeah. Well, thank you very much also to honestly share this, because in this, this, uh, this symposium we, we talk about successes a lot, but I think uh, uh, in an expert panel we all have our failures and we know about the risks and extended indications you probably have to weigh against these risks and against these complications uh, before doing that. Uh, what's your, your, your experience there, Christian? Well, uh, tricky, tri tricky topic, obviously. So as I've heard from my uh, co-speakers here, uh, most of these problems, apart from the first example that was given by Ronert, which was pointing towards biological non-responders, um, most of the other topics are rather related to technical problems or technical errors that occur during the surgery. And you cannot really blame the osteotomy itself for that, I guess. And this is my experience as well. So I try to design lots of osteotomies and technically bring it forward. And so therefore I have to admit quite often I was on the wrong track. So um, the osteotomy is just as good as it is performed obviously. And I've made some attempts on, um, on crescent osteotomies um, to get that uh, to, to, well, basically reduce the amount of wedge cut out or opening um, because I thought that a circular uh, correction would be the ideal, uh, uh, the ideal scenario for um, the change in the frontal plane. But I had to realize that this is rather a tricky surgery and I abandoned this um, because the functional, uh, functional outcome wasn't half as good. I, I had rather issues with uh, late or non-unions. And uh, so the idea of, of this particular um, correction wasn't really great. So maybe, it was a design flaw. My technical, uh, my technical abilities weren't just good enough. And maybe in 10, 15, 20 years from now, someone comes, over, comes around the corner and performs that surgery just in a magnificent way and everything heals perfectly. So I guess it's just sometimes due to limited abilities. And I have to include myself there. Obviously, we're not perfect. We're trying to do it at its best. Thank you. Thank you for your honest... Uh, well... Uh openness about uh, your journey and your experience. Rex, what do, you, what do you do with hinge problems uh, as a result of osteotomies? As, as just, we have discussed it a little bit 
yesterday, but in extended indications, it's probably even more important. Yeah, and so I think one of the most um, you know, powerful things that I've seen during osteotomies, whether they're straightforward or extended, are actually using a hinge wire across the hinge. I think Mathieu presented really nicely on the technical tips and the data that you can significantly increase the or reduce the stresses across the hinge if you simply put a wire across it. And so that's, in our practice, really reduced the incidence of um, propagation of a hinge, hinge fracture and stop you going too far with your, with your saw. There are um, options to be able to put a screw across the hinge as well, just to increase the um, rigidity of the construct. So using that same wire to protect the hinge, you just put a feeder screw with a differential uh, pitch over the top of it, and that can help compress the hinge. Um, for people who get hinge fractures during surgery, that, that's, that happens to a lot of us, and that could, that hap you can either compress that with a screw or even use the staples. So I, we did a little talk on nitinol technology, and just simply lining up a staple across the, the hinge or it can really compress it, and you can get patients fully weight-bearing straight after. So, so I think for the people who are sort of starting out um, technical tips-wise, that's, that's a top tip that I've, I've certainly learned and carried on in my practice. Well, thank you. Thank you. Great answer. Well, as we are moving towards the end of this session and combined sessions on the sagittal plane, probably the, from the question and answers, we can have uh, some feed uh, from, from, from the London office on questions and answers from, from the participants which we uh, may try to answer here. So who's gonna uh, put in the questions from the audience here? Well, there's one, one main question. That there was, um, there was a, a, a comment that a lot of bone graft was being seen to be used in the uh, opening wedge osteotomies. And so uh, people wanted clarification, what is the indication for bone graft? And I suppose we should probably define the difference between slope changing and uh, coronal alignment changing. When would you use bone graft? Okay. Uh, can I ask uh, Andy, when yes. would you do bone graft? So You're I'd... a closing wedge uh, osteotomist, I, I think. Well, uh, if I use it in closing wedge, it means I've done it wrong. But no. um, <laughs> if Definitely. it's an opening wedge osteotomy, I don't bone graft. Um, I certainly don't use bone substitute. And uh, the only time I, I will graft, and I use autograft from the Ionic Crest, is if I've got a correction of over 15 degrees, um, or if I've got a, not, uh, sorry, I've got a smoker uh, d doing the surgery. But I use autograft, I think it's the best thing. I do understand the biomechanical advantage of having a rigid a cancerous cortical wedge, but um, I would be worried it might slow down healing. Okay. Uh, any thoughts on that, uh, Matt? Uh, on your side, bone grafting uh, in, in the sagittal plane corrections? In the sagittal plane, um, definitely. You know, if, you're, if you're opening up, I would definitely put something both structural and um, osteogenic. So I would, I would certainly use um, an allograft in that situation. I have actually done one case. There was something uh, where we used to aspirate marrow from a femur, on, and I used that once, that was fantastic, but he ended up with a sore leg on the other side, so, so I didn't do that anymore. That was called rear, I think, um, aspirated uh, marrow. But I'd always use something biological, and you want some structure there as well, I think. I use the biological plate, so I think a little bit of uh, structural infill is, is vital too. Any thoughts on that, Chris? Uh, bone substitute, would you put in uh, artificial things in the bone there? Well, uh, Many years ago I did, but I've stopped because um, they never go away. Um, they're always there. And if there's an infection, even a low-grade infection, they're a big problem. So I now don't use anything uh, for the opening wedge osteotomies of the type we've been discussing. But for a sagittal plane correction, for a biological plate, I will put an allograft in because we can't rely on the tibial tubercle for any structural integrity, so we need something in the gap that will resist uh, partial weight bearing. But those are my only situation where I put anything in the gap, actually. And for okay. a revision, um, I've started to, uh, I don't do many, but where I need something in there, I've started to use bone marrow aspirate. I've been taught how to do it, and uh, it, it seems to work very well for me. Okay, Christian, 
you're working in a part of the world, at least part of your practice is in Germany, where allografts are not abundantly available. What do you do with open wedge uh, high tubule osteotomies? Um, yeah, so for the frontal plane, obviously, uh, we know that uh, it works perfectly without, without grafting. As I work in the UK, the only benefit I see from putting other grafts inside is that it acts really as a solid scaffold and you have a rigid fixation that may enable the patient to be on, uh, on the legs a little bit quicker. Anyhow, for the sagittal plane, I would just agree uh, with my co-speakers and I put something inside and as I don't have proper access to allografts, I have to use tricortical crest uh, from the iliac crest. So it's, um, yeah. it's, it's quite a solid uh, construct that you can create there and put it inside. But if I open that, uh, that was a funny case. I mean, we've seen the case that Rex presented. Um, and that was exactly that case uh, in London where we uh, used um, not not uh, Ilya Crest as we have access in London to uh, to allografts. Can you still hear me? I guess my mic is now off, but can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, yeah perfect. So um, we used allografts in the UK. My, my suggestion for him was to get rid of the staples completely. So what I'm doing in Germany when I do these sagittal corrections, I put in tricortical ilia crest allo, uh, uh, grafts at, at either side of the tibial tubercle and try to hide one behind it. And I don't put any, any hardware inside. So I, I just leave it like this. So it's okay. not, this is not a general recommendation, I have to confess. But I see that it's solid enough to 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 really heal, and so you see that at, at least you can prove that the tricortical um, structure is solid enough to hold the whole construct. So it's worth putting something in. We, well, sorry, Ronald. We looked at this when we were in uh, when I was on fellowship in in Basingstoke, and um, and actually, you, you know, the, it was likened to putting a cork in a bottle. So. By plugging the gap with, with a bit of um, allograft, stopping the bleeding from the cancellous surfaces, it showed reduction in pain uh, post-operatively, swelling and, and healing was, was quicker as well. So there are advantages to it. We, we also use it as a way of measuring our gap. So our pre-planned gap, as James uh, Robinson had alluded to earlier, um, as you've seen in our practice, we we predefine the gap, we know what we want to do from the plan and we make the wedge the same size and we simply put, put that in. So there are a lot of advantages to it and, and you know, femoral head allograft is so readily available, it's not that expensive, it works well in our hands. Well, thank you very much. To wrap this up, an excellent input from, from the experienced faculty. Extended indications, we've been discussing about cases like arthrofibrosis, coronal plane deformities, uh, adjacent to the sagittal plane, femoral corrections, um, just straightening the leg, doing complex uh, ligament reconstructions with osteotomies and intraarticular reconstructions as done by Andy. And then we have this osteochondral defects, uh, which seem to clear up just by realigning the leg. Um, I think we will find more extended indications in the future. And I see a tendency in the literature that people are reporting on these. So keep your eyes open. Thank you faculty for your participation in this session. And we move on to the next part of the program. Thank you. Okay. In this case, uh, we see a medial meniscus uh, instability with uh, a sort of uh, small uh, rump lesion that uh, can be treated with uh, all inside the device. So in this case, uh, you can see from the second view the setup of uh, arthroscopy and the introduction with this uh, sleeve that allow the easy introduction of the true span. And then we start from the posterior part to have a vertical meniscus uh, suturing 
and in this case it's difficult because you have to reach the posterior wall and to have one shooter in the menisci and one tag in the capsule. So in this case we try to stabilize the posterior horn that is a little bit unstable. And then you see that at the end the stability of the menisci is better but for me it was not enough so I decided to do a second point and again you see the introduction facilitated by the sleeve and then I do this type of suturing that try to embrace the menisci completely so one on the bottom and one on the top of the menisci in order to have a very nice stability of the meniscus and you will see at the end when we pull the menisci the menisci is very nice in place and with no mobilization so at the end the menisci is very stable and the suturing is finished In this case uh, we see a very strange uh, horizontal uh, lateral menisci that uh, since he's a younger patient we try to preserve the menisci. So we try to do two, actually three vertical suturing trying to embrace uh, all the menisci and uh, reach a nice stability of the meniscus posterior horn at the end. This is the last point that we try to give to have a really complete uh, full suture of the menisci and at the end the menisci is very well done. In this case we suturing a posterior root lesion of the lateral menisci without doing a tibial tunnel but trying to fix the menisci with the all inside suturing that fix the posterior root to the PCL and you can see I try to do these two suturing and trying to fix the menisci and give more stability to this posterior insertion that is very important and in this case with just two simple suturing I try to have a nice pulling of the lateral menisci and try to stay where it normally is inserted and at the end you see that the stability of the meniscus insertion is very nice and is stable without having to do a tibial tunnel In this case we show a meniscus transplant performed without bone block of the medial meniscus. This is the MRI and this is the posterior hole for the insertion of the posterior horn and uh, I normally do this uh, hole without any uh, guide and uh, now I insert after preparing the medial meniscus rim we insert the meniscus transplant taken from our bony bank and uh, we introduce with the help of a Kelly the graft the graft is uh, positioned in the good area and trying to cover all the meniscus and then I will start to fix this meniscus this nice menisci with the truspan and in this case you will see many type of suturing and this is the first one of the posterior horn a vertical suturing trying to start to fix the meniscus and obviously in this case you have to, to be sure to be posteriorly to fix the menisci to the posterior capsule this is another 
tutoring again it's very simple with this uh, device that is a gun so it's very easy uh, the way to fix and to pull this uh, mini sky the sliding of the knot is very nice you can see and uh, you don't have to fix too much the, the, the graft otherwise you have an extrusion related to the fixation to the capsule and you see I go and I try to reach all the meniscus area again you see the sliding and you have a nice fixation and again I go back to the posterior horn trying to fix the really posterior horn close to the insertion in this case it's not very simple because uh, the meniscus uh, is a little bit too high but uh, at the end the shooter will be nice so you see that uh, sometimes uh, the we try to fix and to pull the suturing and uh, have a very nice stability of the mini sky and uh, this is the anterior horn and you see there is a sort of uh, elevation of the meniscus and so in this case you have to go and to fix the inferior uh, part of the menisci to the capsule and in this case I do a inferior suturing and in this case you see a very nice uh, uh, depression of the meniscus as should be normal so I will do the same on this part on the anterior horn and uh, you see that I try to go inferiorly trying to fix in the anterior and mid portion of the menisci and to have a depression and a lowering of the meniscus as it should normally be with the you see that pulling the menisci is shooting down and you see how it is nicely depressed in this case and then you try to even reach the really well anterior horn to have fixing to the anterior capsule and in order to be sure that you have a very nice stability of the whole menisci with this type of device it is easy to reach even the anterior horn and you can pull and you will see that at the end the meniscus is very nice and stable look at that it's very nice and stable you have a nice overview of the meniscus this will cut the suture and you have at the end I will probably try you see you can see the the posterior horn that uh, still need one suture more in order to be sure that the posterior horn is very stable so in that case I normally do two or three suturing to be sure that the meniscus is stable enough and at the end you see that you have a very nice new meniscus Andy Williams here now in the chair, so bad luck to everybody who's listening, watching and taking part. Uh, first up in this session, which is on the postlateral corner of the knee, uh, we have a presentation from Martin Brinkman on how best to assess uh, the injury. Martin, over to you. Yeah, thank you uh, for your uh, introduction. Um, I've prepared a short presentation that for me illustrates 
almost everything that's challenging about doing osteotomies and ligament surgery. Um, and I've left a lot open intentionally, so it, it hopefully can be used to get the discussion going. Um, it's a 22 year old male that came to me recently uh, uh, who had sustained a rotational injury on the soccer pitch a couple of months ago. He was treated conservatively elsewhere, uh, but in spite of adequate physiotherapy, his knee continued to feel unstable. He didn't trust his knee and he, most importantly to him, he was unable to, uh, to play soccer, which uh, is, uh, well, he, he earns his money by doing that. Uh, he had a, a knee that wasn't swollen anymore. It was a quiet knee. Uh, it had full range of motion and he had increased AP laxity uh, and a positive pivot shift test indicative of an ACL rupture. But he also had abnormal PLC laxity uh, uh, and his, uh, the rotational component was um, uh, larger or bigger than the, uh, the varus uh, instability or increased laxity. So, but then on doing the analysis, he had uh, an MPTA of 78. He had a uh, hugely abnormal uh, slope. And obviously he had his uh, PLC injury and his uh, ACL injury as already suspected. So um, usually I see these patients in the, uh, in the setting of a, uh, of a failed primary uh, ACL reconstruction where they come see me because their ACL has failed and the other surgeon has either overlooked a malalignment or overlooked a PLC uh, injury. Uh, but in the primary cases, I find it very hard uh, to sell the osteotomy and the PLC reconstruction. So um, this case for me has a lot of questions um, and I'd, you know, I'd like to, to hear the opinion of the, uh, the, the panel. That's a great uh, case there. Uh, Martin, as you say, a lot of questions. Um, the great thing being chairman is I don't have to tell you what I think, but uh, we'll go around the panel. Sachin, how, how would you deal with that? That's, it's, it's almost a dysplastic joint, isn't it? Yes, I think so. And uh, one of the things that uh, one will take back from the previous sessions that we've heard is it's very difficult or it should not be probably the rule of thumb to sell the osteotomy as a first line treatment. Although, I must warn the patient that the lateral side is a convex on convex and he's got a high slope there. He's got a varus. So everything mechanically is not going right for him. Considering his age and his need to play and perform well, I think the ACL always will have to be done. And unless and until you address the postlateral corner, this ACL reconstruction would fail as well. So for me, a good discussion with the patient after doing a good clinical exam, getting some stress x-rays done, documenting the pathology, and then offering him an ACL reconstruction, BTV autographed along with a postlateral corner reconstruction using his own hamstrings, autographed again, since in India, we don't have access to a lot of good allograft, although allograft would be the ideal way to repair or sorry, reconstruct his lateral side believe that Sachin? You know that allograft is nowhere near as good as autograft. How could you say that? Well I think it's basically the reason why I'm saying that allograft would be preferred for doing his postlateral corner is since I'd be taking off his uh, patellar tendon and his hamstrings and that would I think compromise his uh, performance level because he earns his bread by playing soccer and that's probably one of the reasons why I made that comment. There. Okay very good. Um, Silvio, have you got any other uh, comments? How would you deal with this? It's obviously okay. complicated. Uh, it's a, it's a, it's a complicated case, but it's a usual case for in, in my daily practice as a footballer. And I uh, came into to the office with with a postural instability and anterior instability. So uh, as as it's, it was mentioned before, it's very difficult to to sell an osteotomy at the first stage. So I would go very conservative. With, without doing any, any, any bone procedure. And I will, I will stabilize, uh, stabilize his, uh, his knee with an, uh, probably my, in my, my practice is an all inside uh, ACL with a semi-T and then with a, an allograph with a, um, performing an, an RCR technique to uh, resol resolve the postural corner. Okay, so quite a different view, just soft tissue. And um, what about in the room here? We got Martin, 
What would you do? If he's a normal individual, then I would be selling the osteotomy. Yeah. Uh, uh, for sure. Um, and to be honest, I would have a serious discussion about selling the osteotomy anyway. Cause yeah. I, I can't remember his age, but... Um, he was, he was 22. 22. 22, yeah. yeah. So, that, that, I mean, it, 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 I suppose it depends on the level and things like that. He's not going to want the osteotomy if he, if he wants... Uh, if he wants, if he's a footballer and is serious about getting but, it. But, but the reality is he's just running a soccer school. He's not a real right. footballer. So. I, I would definitely be selling okay. him the osteotomy. Adrian? Do you know what? I think if for, for the first time injury, I think, you know, obviously I'm a real proponent of osteotomy, but I would go for the soft tissue. Would you? Industry. Yeah. Okay, very interesting. Yeah. And finding that. I, I, yeah, I think we, we're all in some sort of balance and some equilibria are more, more uh, delicate than others. He's, he's going to... It's not going to work, soft tissue. No. He's going to have a bony operation, I think. Yep. So just for the record, I would do an osteotomy. I'd use a teletendon and autograph, and I'd use hamstrings for his post lateral corner. That's what I would do. Martin, what did you do? Well, I didn't do anything yet. I gave him back <laughs> to consider his, consider his options, and he looked very funny at me when I suggested him that, he, need, that he needed a bony procedure. <laughs> Perfect. Um, so, you're gonna, um, so how did you assess so I, it? I, 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 you know, I'd, I'd go for everything. I'd go for the osteotomy yeah. and, the, and the soft tissue uh, procedure. Because yeah. I think especially with that slope, I, I think you're setting him up for failure if you, uh, if you just, just do the, uh, the, the soft tissues. Okay. Uh, with, with just the varus, I'd be tempted, you know, to just do the, maybe just do the soft tissues okay. and then see where things end. Yeah. But with, with the slope, I think the forces are, are, are abnormal, abnormal to such an extent that you're just setting him up for failure if you don't okay. uh, if you don't do anything about that slope. So, um, Sachin, would you do it in one stage or two stages? I'm doing the osteotomy primarily, then I'll do everything in one single stage. Okay, and Martin, what do you do? But Andy, I oh, think sorry. Uh, I have for you, in the previous session, I think uh, a lot of the faculty booted out the possibility of doing an osteotomy as a first to go procedure for someone who has a high slope especially so in a sportsman. So why now the change of view here? Oh, he, he's not a real sportsman. Come on, Sachin. He, <laughs> he, runs, a so, he runs a soccer school. He, he's an avid amateur soccer player. Yeah. But he does, he does earn his money by doing that sport. And therefore, he'd earn his money for longer by doing the proper operation. Whereas if he was earning, if he was a you know, real a professional, you may stop him earning for that year or two. This guy needs a living for till he's 50 or 60 or 70. I think in this, this scenario as well, the osteotomy is for the lateral collateral, it's not for the ACL. Yeah, so, and Martin's just pointed out that coronal plane alignment is very, very important because, you know, there's a big proprioceptive deficit if you lose two ligaments and that varus will eventually stretch out, even a normal um, LCL actually, even if you haven't got a yeah. post lateral corner. So, um, Martin, would you do one or two stages? Oh, well, for, for me, that, that's, the, that's the big question here, because I'm not sure if I can correct that slope by doing just uh, a medial opening wedge osteotomy. Uh, also, if, if you want to do a, a Laprade type um, uh, PLC reconstruction, you, your, um, your hinge is going to be very close to that tibial tunnel. Um, but if you do it staged, um, you're setting him up for, for two years of rehab. Uh, or something like that. Um, is there anyone who would do a lateral closing wedge uh, osteotomy in this situation? Well, that's perfect because I would, oh, okay. and uh, I would, would keep you... the superior tib fib joint intact, and I would make a little osteotomy, but at the fibular neck, you're going to take the nerve off it. Lateral closing wedge, hold it temporarily with the staple, pass and drill the tunnel, and leave the reamer in when you put your termofix plate on and screws. If the screws hit the reamer, you know you're, you're in trouble, so you put a short screw and then pass the graft. So that would work well. And Martin, you're gonna to talk to us about the assessment of the post-lateral yeah. corner. So yeah. let's do that, shall we? Yeah, sure. So great case, um, great case. Thank you. Um, for the assessment, um, for me, it's, it's physical examination um, with, a, uh, with a very stress with the, uh, the injured leg over the edge of the, of the, uh, of the, uh, of the table in the, in the, in the, in the, in the room. Uh, and, and a dial test uh, and a recurvatum test, uh, uh, see how much hyperextension there is. Um, and then only optional for me are stress x-rays and MRI. MRI usually I use for, for diagnosing other stuff that's wrong with, within the joint, 
but not the uh, but not the PLC. So for me, it's basically physical examination and a high uh, uh, level of suspicion that something might be wrong with the PLC. So Sachin, what are the um, physical findings that you really look carefully for when you examine the patient? I think uh, my uh, surgical plan is based on my clinical exam more than anything else. And the key things that we want to look out for is the amount of lateral joint opening yep. at full extension at 30 degrees of flexion and 90 degrees of flexion. I'm also going to do my dial test at full extension at 30 degrees and at 90 degrees. The reason being is that the LCL is the main restraint to varus throughout the arc. So I want to know how much that's opening. If I have increased degrees of external rotation or a higher dial test at higher flexion angles, I know my popliteus is also dysfunctional. So I'm going to think in more in terms of a lapra type of reconstruction. But if I have external rotation opening only at lower angles of knee flexion, it probably means that you know my popliteal fibular ligament is the only injured structure. My popliteus is not that badly injured. And then I would plan an r serio for him. So I would definitely look at these two structures, these two clinical findings. And most important, I would assess the gait pattern to see if he's got a thrust because um, that really will tip off the balance between whether you need bony surgery or whether you need soft tissue surgery alone. Okay, Silvio, any other examination findings or...? Well, uh, well not in this case, but uh, usually um, the, the, the long leg, the long leg uh, yeah. x-rays to, 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 to let us know if there is any, any malalignment, as, uh, for, for, uh, even, uh, especially in chronic cases. Uh, as it, uh, and it, additionally, it has been well documented that uh, PLC injuries can be associated with vascular injuries. So we, we should uh, test uh, if there is any clinical suspicion about vascular injuries. And, and the, the nerve conduction in the, in, in the, in studies should be as well considered. So to, 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 to take uh, a, a, a thorough uh, uh, exploration of the patient, I, I, I would do uh, all, all these things I've, I've mentioned. Okay. And really, these injuries are a spectrum. They can be pure varus, if it's purely LCL, which is obviously tight in extension, it loosens inflection anyway, or it can be popliteus complex related, in other words, an increased external rotation. Um, or, and usually, of course, a combination of the two. Just one little point, if you have a, a player, usually a football player has a varus injury, and they come to you with sometimes even a complete rupture of the lateral collateral ligament as an isolated lesion, um, what do you, how do you treat those, uh, Matt? I think um, I would be very tempted to, to go for an osteotomy that's going to take him to neutral and obviously reconstruct, probably use a, a BTV, yeah. something like that for the lateral ligament. And if it was an elite player, would you consider that? No, no, I think I'd yeah. defer to what you said before. Yeah. You, no. Martin? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm usually pretty aggressive. I think Postulacron is one of the most disappointing operations <laughs> commonly yeah. in terms that they all tend to stretch out that little bit. Yeah. And so I think you have to be really, uh, personally, I'm quite aggressive about the amount of varus that I will accept, okay. obviously, in that population. I would only say that maybe in this guy as well, he might be a good case for an opening wedge PSI or some sort of navigator because his, his slope is so big that he's going to be the one that's going to have quite a significant metaphyseal bone loss with a yeah. closing wedge. Yeah, yeah. I think that is going to be an and, issue here. I mean, I Adrian, in terms of your calculation of correction, you've got the cause of your varus is the bone. It's also the slack in the LCL. And so how do you calculate the uh, correction for that? So I look at the other side, look at the joint line con uh, convergence, yeah. and then I use the other side as a guide in yeah. terms of my osteotomy. But I mean, this and, and obviously the risk being you'd overcorrect yeah. if you, if yeah, you don't yeah. do that. It's such a critical thing. But in this case, I mean, like Martin said, I think the reason why I didn't jump in for an osteotomy is because I think it's a two two stage procedure. This I don't think I wouldn't be able to correct that slope just by coming from the side, and I would come from the medial side. So for me, it would be either a PSI, which I'm not skilled in, but I know then you can predict where the hinge is going to go. But, but our brains don't allow us to actually dial in a hinge at the front or a hinge at the back to actually give us a play in slope in the same way that PSI does. So for me, this is definitely a frontal approach. And I would, I would, I would close from the front first, and then it would definitely be a two-stage procedure. So and that's so a really not, important point Not to surprisingly, make. a really complex case many different answers from people who I would trust to operate in me or the family. So for what the audience, it? it just teaches you 
the importance of considering it and doing what you're comfortable with. And what would you do for the what would you do for the uh, for the lateral side, Andy? Yeah, so I, we'll talk. We've got another session talking about treatment options, but I have a strong preference for fibula-based um, reconstructions. I'll explain later on. Well, thank you very much, Lee. That's the first session uh, dealt with, and uh, we're going to move on now and um, look at the treatment options. James Murray, I think, will be joining us, and thank you very much indeed. Silvio, Martin and Sachin. Fantastic. Uh, well, ladies and gentlemen, back in again, and uh, we've got to consider now how to treat uh, the postlateral corner. And uh, we've got a new faculty have arrived. You can see them there in their squares on the screen, and the same guys in the studio. So, uh, James, you're going to tell us about the treatment options for this uh, injury. <laughs> right. Thanks very much for that. Um, so this it really does lead on very nicely. So a case not dissimilar. Uh, this is a, uh, a young lad, 23, rugby tackle, medium meniscal root, lateral meniscal root, LCL grade D, mid substance, ACL grade D, post lateral corner, slight. So, a bit more information. So, he's opening up and he's got an MTPA of 85. So, uh, on EUA, which I didn't have at the time, but uh, obviously on decision making, but that uh, that shows you his LCL. So uh, options. So what um, if I could come to people? Uh, who we're going to go to first? Let's go to Sanjay. Sorry, James, I can't quite see the images clearly on that one. Um, uh, could you just summarise his injuries just to me? Yeah, sure. So he's got a uh, PCL, he's got a postlateral corner, which is mild, and he's got a significant uh, um, uh, significant uh, lateral collateral grade D ACL. So sorry, AC ACL full thickness, PCL is mild, postlateral corner mild, and he's got a full thickness LCL with that varus that you can see. Okay, this is MTPA all from a, a, 85. Acute injury. Acute injury, 23, I think it was, 23 year old rugby player. Okay, so obviously I'm assuming his neurovascular status will be all okay. Yeah, check. yeah, so he's, he's um, neurovascularly intact, he's subacute, he's got over his initial stage. Um, and he's presenting through clinic. He's not being admitted. He is coming in through clinic. James, just want to cl clarify, when we use the okay, term so postlateral corner, I think most people would include the LCL as part of it. So yeah. he's, got, he's got a severe LCL as part of the postlateral corner. As part of the postlateral yeah. corner. But, but, but what not, do you mean? He's, he's, not, rotating, exactly. he's not rotating significantly. Yeah. So, so his the, puppeteers, as you can see in the yeah. bottom right, is um, there's high signal in it, but it's not off. Yeah, so it's part of that spectrum. Okay, yeah. thanks, Andrew. Okay, so I, again, I can't see the images clearly, but I'd be looking at an acute surgery for this chap. So I'd be looking at repairing his postlateral corner structures down. If there's any avulsions, uh, stick those down and reconstructing uh, at the same time. And because he's in surgery, you may look at also doing the, uh, certainly the PCL uh, at the same time to his, get that his PCL, compensation. His PCL is very mild. It's, uh, it's um... okay. So the main injury is the, is the lateral LC, collateral. It's lateral collateral and ACL, medial root, posterior root. Uh, sorry, so medial meniscal, posterior root, lateral meniscal, posterior root. So he's a double okay. posterior root injury. So I would... Pro ACL, LCL, yeah. that's his main injury. Okay, so I would probably acutely be looking at doing, assuming he hasn't got a, a really significant capsular injury, trying to get the root back down. <laughs> and doing an acute postlateral corner repair uh, and reconstruction. And then seeing how you do it, I would probably just then in that circumstance, just stage the ACL. Okay. So the, me so the are, message there. Are you, the are you gonna do anything with, um, with his slope? You're gonna change his coronal alignment? Um, 
I think with an acute injury, I wouldn't be doing that at this stage. I think if he's just coming fresh, his knee settled down, I personally wouldn't be doing a, a coronal correction on this chap. Okay. It's going to be dramatic at the fault, isn't it? Mm. That's why, sorry. So, uh, I'm just going to go on to it's the ligament that's doing, yeah. Yeah. that next slide. So, I'm struggling to see it, actually. On, I've only got thumbnails that I can see on this, so... Uh, mm. I think everyone's got the same, haven't they, on the panel? Hopefully you can all see it in the audience. You know, good view. Great, OK. So um, I went for a medial opening, uh, a TA allograft for the LCL, and a BTB for his ACL. The um, reason that I would normally go for an, an autograft BTB in a young... Um, um, so. I demand soccer or rugby mm -hmm. player, um, but I went allograft as I was using a TA allograft for his LCL. So, so James, did you increase the slope deliberately? I did, yep. I did, but it wasn't with a PSI, so I will show you a, a case um, coming up which does do exactly that, but I am trying Can to increase his slope a little, <laughs> yes. So Sanjay's point about the post lateral corner, in, in reality, with the ligaments, the only ligament complex that has to have acute surgery really is the post lateral corner. Bruce Levy's publication on that showed significantly better results. And so you've got a really angry, horrible knee. There's no shame in bracing the PCL, bracing the MCL, and uh, leaving the ACL, just getting on with the post lateral corner. Back to you, James. OK, so if I go to another case, Sorry, the clicker's just obscuring. There we go, right. All right, so we've got a young lad now. He's the um, son of a local GP, 17-year-old soccer player. Um, he's got a medial meniscal radial oblique tear, posterior third. He's got a medial tibial plateau subchondral fracture, PCL grade C, LCL grade C, postlateral corner. Uh, in, in terms of popliteus, it is not rotating. So in terms of the complex, isolated lateral collateral. So, uh, James, are you, uh, can you see those at all? I know it's hard on the thumbnails. Uh, no, I think if you pin that image, then it tends to come up as big, James, uh, okay. on your screen. So if you click on it and pin it, it comes up large. But yes, I've seen it. I can see what, yeah, go on. Right. Okay, can you see that now? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So, so I, I separated this now, I separated this and I went uh, in three different stages. The first one was the medial meniscal repair, uh, acute brace, um, and then six months later I let him do his, um, his exams and then we came back and we did a, a medial opening wedge. PCL, LCL, with an active motion plate. And then third stage was just taking out his metal because he was tender. James, um, I've, I've undertaken combined medial opening wedge and PCL surgery. I found it very, very difficult and uh, vowed never to do it again. I'd rather stage it. But any tricks to make it uh, at least tolerable? Um, having we, This was done with another uh, colleague, so we had two of us around. Um, it helps with graft prep. It's allowed plenty of time for this. It was a long case. Um, I don't use a tourniquet, so that takes the stress out. Um, but apart from that, I, I would agree with you. It's difficult surgery. Yeah, I mean, generally speaking, I like to do everything in one go, but this is one operation probably I would stage. So, uh, and very good. And if you've got another case... I've got one more case that I do great. want to show because this is a, um, a different style of case. Yeah, we've got seven minutes left, so great. Yep. Okay, 19-year-old young lad, um, knocked off his motorbike. Uh, he's had surgery done elsewhere. He's had a uh, lateral plate fixation. He has a non-union. He's short, he's varus. He's got 10 degree range of movement. He's 19. So he had 
um, an arthrolysis and he had a uh, corrective osteotomy medially. He had biopsies, so there was no sign of infection, and he regained his range. Um, it's slightly more complicated as he's got a massive free flap on the front of it. And uh, he had a significant laxity um, laterally and with PCL. On his uh, scans, there's an avulsion fracture of his PCL. So um, this is what I had to start with. So on CT scan, which I've not got in this presentation, just for brevity, uh, that uh, cleavage plane laterally around the lateral condyle is partially united. And whilst it looks unusual, that picture, that is reasonably well aligned. So problem, the, of course, sort of is the, the problem, of course, is in the tibia. So the valgus at the femur is matched by the varus at the tibia. Is that what we've got? Uh, no, it's not, it's, not quite, it's not quite as bad as that. Okay. Uh, the, uh, the varus at the tibia is very significant and he's, uh, he's failed post remedial, as you can see. Yeah, yeah. So click up. So his distal femoral valgus actually matches his other side now. He's still 18 millimeters short. How did he end up? So he had a lateral plate on before, and now he's got a medial plate on. What happened in so between? He, so he had a lateral plate, uh, which was uh, taken off, and he had a, a medial uh, opening wedge osteotomy. Uh. But at that time, the the obviously the... Um, Femoral fracture was malunited, and uh, it was that was really difficult. That was a very difficult um, uh, making the best of what I could do with that plate. To be honest, and was there a postlateral corner injury? Or? Yeah, there was it? There was a postlateral corner injury. There's yep. a PCL avulsion fracture. There's an LCL uh, fracture, um, and he had. It was planned as a PSI plate correction, but when we put when I took the, the lateral plate off, the uh, the fracture was just just too uh, unstable, and so I was left with a very unstable situation that I couldn't fix with the PSI yeah. um, block. So I put the PSI block in the gap, and it uh, wasn't holding it stably. So, so it was a question of pulling it into the best alignment I could and fixing from the medial side. So suboptimal um, fixation medially, and I watched and I waited. And I thanked the gods that it did unite, and he maintained a range of movement of 90 degrees. So did you then, uh, have to do anything this about is the where the decision? This is where the decision comes in. I'm just conscious of time, Andy, there, because we've got three minutes left yeah. in this session. So that's where the decision comes in. So do I now go combined, do the postnatural corner LCL? Do I ignore that? Do I just go osteotomy? Do I go PSI? Do I go navigation? So quick... Uh, James, James Robinson, can you see those? Yeah, I can, yeah. What would you do in that situation? Um, I oh, think nice. I would probably look at correcting his alignment uh, in the bone, um, but looking very, very carefully, planning that as to where the deformity actually is. And, and for me, that the case is my, this may be where you'd want to involve your limb recon guys. Yeah. Um, is my thought. So there's his flap, proximal tibial slope of 23 degrees, MTPA 80, LDFA of 86. So I went PSI, um, aim for a 13 degree valgization, extension of 20 degrees with a 23 millimeter posterior opening. Uh, I considered navigation, but I thought the PSI would give me good views, I used allograft, and then I did not do anything with the postlateral corner. We went purely bony. Very good. So interoperative, allograft wedge in. And then that was him, I think at about four months. Uh, so that's four months. Uh, 
and uh, now this was planning for this summer. So he's just coming to an end of student uh, days and taking metalwork out. And uh, you can see his knee is actually aligning reasonably on uh, the lateral side. It's not opening up on the MR. But what, what's his symptoms now, James? He's just tender on his plate, uh, mostly on the medial plate. Do, so, you, do you do anything about the soft tissues at this stage? Or are you just so, going to leave? leave no, I'm going to, I'm going to leave it. I'm going to leave his soft tissues. The problem is his anterior knee because uh, he's got no trochlea. Yeah. So if you look at his original films, I mean, I mean, it was a really heroic reconstruction by the guys in the MTC that, that did it originally and, and flapped him and saved his leg. But this is, uh, obviously, as you can see on the original CT, destroyed. I guess, so I'm going to graft, yeah. graft that, take his metal work out. I guess sometimes less is more, isn't it? And I think uh, it's another example of how getting the limb lined up right helps very much indeed. So just coming yeah, to the it's end... It's hugely powerful. Yeah. We're just coming to the end of this session. Um, obviously, osteotomy is a really powerful tool in the, in the control of not only uh, frontal pain, sagittal pain, but also axial instability. We mentioned Rob Leprad's series previously, in which a medial opening wedge osteotomy by increasing the tibial slope tended to reduce the external rotation component of post lateral rotatory instability. And that alone left many of their patients not needing soft tissue surgery, as James said. Thank you very much indeed, guys. Thank you. Thanks very much. So uh, now I've got a few questions from the maestro himself. So we're back in the room with the maestro himself, uh, Chris Wilson, will be asking a few questions yeah. from our large audience. Two dominant questions from the audience. It, first one's an interesting one. Uh, I often wonder this myself. We're talking about a lot of these cases we've seen are footballers, aren't they? And we're talking about correction. Don't footballers need to be varus Absolutely. to be good at football? Yeah. What no, makes I've, I've, them good at football? Varus or are they varus because they're good at football? Well, there's a big debate about that. Johan Bellerman's written a paper on that and it's, it's unclear, but there's definitely um, an alignment type that benefits sports. So front five in rugby tend to be valgus. Ballet dancers are all valgus with, with high arches in their feet. And footballers are sprinters. They have flat feet and bowed legs. And now the duty for a pro athlete is to get them back to play. And I think usually with them, osteotomy is not necessary. But, or, or advisable. Or, nor advisable. But longer term, maybe they run the risk of stretching out the lateral structures. And you definitely see that. Okay. The second dominant question, you're talking about acute posterolateral corner injury. Anatomic repair alone or anatomic repair with some form of augmentation? What's your view? I appreciate that. Produce probably the best work on that in showing a really high failure rate. If and you Stanard, just, if you did that paper as well, didn't he? Yeah, yeah, if you repair alone, so you must repair and reconstruct. Augment. So repair yeah. and augment is the yeah. consensus. Yeah. The, only, the only exception is if you get a peel off or fibular head fracture. So peel off from the fibular head with biceps, LCL, popliteal <laughs> fibula, simply suturing it. Transosseous sutures works very well. Okay. Um, and I rarely augment that. So the fibular heads come off, so all the structures are preserved. Yeah. Got a nice single fixation. Yeah. Or it's even at that. Or on blocks. Uh, yeah. Soft tissue. Just but otherwise, we do, you recommend an augmentation. Absolutely. Uh, do the people in the ether agree with that? No dissenters. <laughs> James has lost his feed there by the looks of it. Okay, that's it. Thank you very much. Thanks, Maestro. Thank you. <laughs> What's wrong with James? He's struggling a bit with the computer, isn't he? Over to you, Andy. Session three. We starting? I think yeah. we're live, yeah. Okay. Three, two, one, I'm back in the room. <laughs> <laughs> Apologies for that. Um, now we're going to talk about rehabilitation. It's so easy on these sessions of teaching to be obsessed with the surgery alone. Perhaps the planning, which is also vitally important, the thinking is where you get the result. And we tend to neglect the rehab. So it's a really good opportunity to go through it. We've got. Um, uh, 
a new panel installed, Martin, James, Elvira, and Vincenzo. And uh, in the room, we've got Martin, uh, Martin uh, Adrian, and Matt, and myself. So if you have a post lateral corner injury, do you ever consider treating that non-surgically? Uh, I think there is a potential role, but it, it, it depends on the individual, okay. what their condition is. Yeah. Are they symptomatic? Cool. Uh, so, Elvira, if you've got a, a soft tissue uh, reconstruction alone, not an osteotomy, for, say, an ACL postlateral corner, because usually it's a combined injury, uh, what are your comments about ideal rehabilitation, range of motion, weight bearing, etc.? Uh, <laughs> I, I would, if I'm doing an osteotomy in a session with ACL and PLC, PLC injury reconstruction, I will not load weight bearing for six uh, weeks. Otherwise, it's just a, a posterior corner reconstruction plus ACL. Uh, I will load full weight bearing by, with a brace in full extension for um, six weeks. And actually, I just read an article uh, published uh, one month ago regarding all the, doing a meta-analysis or regarding rehabilitation and postulateral coronary injury. And there is a lot of a lack of evidence. And uh, some of the, <laughs> of the people are doing full weight bearing, some other no weight bearing for six months, for six weeks. And actually, which is interesting in this meta-analysis, they show there is more complication in the group with no weight bearing for six weeks. Yeah, no, that's so interesting. Now, uh, yeah. And what about Vincenzo? Do you use a brace for them? Can we turn on your um, microphone, please? Vincenzo. He's Vincenzo, on. we can't hear you. Vincenzo. Thanks. Can you turn? He's on mute. He's Perfect. Mute. He's back in the room. Oh, maybe not. Apologies, and gentlemen. Move on to Martin. Maybe uh, he can hear us. Uh, do you put braces on for these injuries post-op? Yeah, I find it a very, very difficult and interesting question because, like Elvira said, there is not a lot of evidence out there. Um, and if it's just a soft tissue procedure, I, I'm not sure what's the right thing to do. I, I tend to put them in an immobilizer and allow uh, zero to 90 degrees of passive motion for the first six weeks. Uh, and then in a hinged brace uh, for another couple of months with increased weight bearing, but that might be uh, too conservative. Uh, but I don't have a lot of literature to, to go on, except for a, a, a recent RCT by Laprade, where he compared uh, immediate weight bearing to uh, gradual weight bearing and non-weight bearing, where there, uh, there were less complications in the in the in the uh, in the non-weight bearing uh, in the in the weight bearing in the non-weight bearing group. So I I I think I'll go uh, more aggressive uh, uh, yeah. uh, initial uh, in the initial phase. Yeah, that's interesting. That, that up till now I've been very conservative in yeah. the in the rehabilitation, but yeah. I, that might be too slow. No, it's too, indeed. My logic is if they're in varus, and I've not done an osteotomy, then I'll protect weight bearing to prevent stress on the graft. But there's a big price to be paid for non-weight bearing. I mean, the muscle wastage. People yeah. often walk with the bent knees; they lose extension. Uh, Vincenzo, you. I uh, hope we can hear you now. But do you use braces? I think it's his headphones is a problem. Take his headphones. Sadly, we can't hear you. So James, ask the same question. Do you use bracing after surgery? Um, Andy, I do have, I have a slide to put, that I was supposed to put up for, for this session, which I do believe will uh, put up uh, a number of the, the answers to these questions, actually. OK, um, so do you want to go, far, go ahead with that then? Yeah, I don't know if the, the, the team in the audience are able to do that. I, I just wanted to make one um, uh, comment from the initial s session. Th this is all coming from the expert consensus paper that we published on the post corner um, uh, in 2019. And it was thought very reasonable for these acute injuries, even if there's varus, that a, a, a reconstruction soft tissue alone is reasonable without the osteopathy, which is, I think, the point you've been making, Andy, for these sportsmen. But the evidence really is with the chronic injuries that, uh, you know, a, an osteotomy is very powerful. And even in Le Prade's series, he showed that only 33% of those who had a, a, an isolated PLC needed to have a ligament reconstruction if the osteotomy was done. 
So basically what I've, I hopefully would show you on this slide, if people can see it, is the a disagreement and agreement to some of these um, statements on rehabilitation. It's interesting, you've raised the one about non-weight bearing and, and, and you can see there is some disagreement in that, but the majority of uh, our responders in that, uh, in that uh, experts consensus group did suggest that non-weight bearing was the way to protect things. And as you can see, the vast majority of people would use a brace. Um, and I have to say, I do both. I'm, I'm six weeks in a brace and six weeks of, of non-weight bearing. So, so James, do you want to go through the rest of your talk? Yeah, sorry. I'm just, I, well, I'm just what I'm going to do is just say, I'm just going to open it on my PowerPoint because I'm actually struggling to read the, the slide on the uh, on, on the session. Okay. So just I'm just going to open that. It'll take me ten seconds. So fine. So basically, what there was a hundred percent agreement was on a staged rehabilitation, uh, looking at basically success, outcome measures as you go through that. Just as Elvira says, we need to look at the um, the type of injury. Is it part of a multi ligament injury? <laughs> and you know, the surgical surgery that we've done. We talked about early mobilization, that's key. So people were talking about early made to avoid arthroprivrosis. There's a vast majority of surgeons agreeing on, on that. Um, knee braces, we've said yes. Uh, patients should remain non-weight bearing. Some discrepancy on that, at least 30% of people saying no, but studies suggesting lower complications with. Return to sport after isolated PLC, not recommended for nine months. Return to sport after isolated reconstruction based on objective functional outcome scores. And then we basically should be measuring isokinetic type of measurement. Important to look at how they're recovering and the functional assessment before return to sport. Is there consensus, James, on what sort of brace? Are we talking offloader or hinge? I think what we felt that there was a fear that this study didn't look at that, but I think if you're doing a soft tissue only procedure in a um, patient who's got uh, a varus alignment, so the two cases that perhaps James showed early on, I think an unloader type brace uh, to help offload the, ver the, the varus deformity would be, would be good. Um, but they, for these PLC re re reconstructions in, in this group, we, most people were just using a, a hinged range yeah. of motion T-scope brace. Okay. Any more to present, James? That was my one slide that I was allowed, Andy. Well, I'm, I'm yeah. fantastic. I'm sorry I jumped the gun earlier on. But no, it, it, I, it, presumably you'd have to choose the type of brace very carefully because some unloaders work by driving the lateral side of the knee immediately and you've got a nice wound there and uh, yeah. a fresh operation that may not may not be so good absolutely and i think you know that looking at that the, the where where the brace pads are and all the rest of it is really really critical to, to, to doing you know, to that you, you make a very good point very good adrian have you got any other comments on the rehab um no, I mean, I think that what's interesting is, is, is how varied it is for this. Yeah. Like they say, the evidence is relatively poor. I mean, with the collateral ligaments, I just tend to take the patients a little bit more slowly, yeah. allow full movement, and then, you know, take them off into, in, uh, uh, take, take them on, uh, on passive range of motion three or four times a day, and then keep them fairly still for yeah. a couple of weeks and then get them going. But like you, with the ACL, you're always worried about fixed flexion. You've got to, get, got to get these patients going. Yeah, and so, the, your surgery, whatever you do, has to be good enough that you can tolerate full extension immediately. I mean, the one thing that we haven't spoken about is cryotherapy. And I think we're all you know, using these clever compression cryotherapy tools and I think they work very well. I think you know, to keep the swelling down yeah. for all of this surgery is also a very important part of the rehabilitation. And, and the pain control. Because Managing the patient's if, pain. If they're not comfortable, they don't straighten. Well, it, Martin, you've got a point. Yeah, I was just going to ask a question more than a point. I was just going to ask, does anybody alter their weight-bearing status based on what type of reconstruction they do, whether it's fibula-based or a full anatomical so don't, reconstruction? Don't you, you could, can you all hear that? Martin, what's your view on that? Is it always the same rehab, or do you vary it according to what you've done? It's 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 all it's all it's always the same. I I, I tend to go for for a for a lot broad type reconstruction, uh, and anyway in, in most cases. So, okay. but no no difference between the uh, like say the Archero or modified Larsen's and the and okay. the and the full cool. I treat them the same. Elvia. 
Any different rehabilitation for different operations? Elvi, if you turn your microphone on, yeah. please. Yeah, yes, sorry, okay. sorry. No <laughs> uh, actually, not really, no. I will load a uh, flexion between zero and 90 degrees of flexion. No, no recuvatum, no hyperextension. Yeah. yeah. But uh, no, nothing special. And Vincenzo, I hope we've got you in the room. Can you hear us? Yes. Yeah. yeah, can you hear me now? Yes, fantastic. <laughs> okay, fantastic. sorry. sorry. Not, a, not a problem. So uh, I'll ask you the questions since we want to hear from you. Do you put braces on post-operatively and what sort of rehabilitation do you use? Yeah, I, I could hear you. You couldn't hear me. So I do use a brace uh, after uh, surgery, after PLC reconstruction. But just for me, it's just to protect uh, the post reconstruction. Uh, once uh, you know, the patient go to the um, rehabilitation, maybe uh, I think it's very much important to give them indication to work in the opposite side they used to do when they do ACL reconstruction. So they need to protect the lateral structures. So uh, they should not work uh, in virus, they should not work in hyperextension, and they should work a little bit more in valves. So the, the lateral corner, as you said, is uh, the most uh, black part for, uh, you know, for, uh, uh, for uh, evidence-based uh, uh, treatment. But, um, you know, we, we go by experience. Yeah. So Very protect good. the reconstruction. First, yeah. uh, first uh, then regain uh, uh, movement. And after that, you can start to, you know, Go yeah. a little bit farther. So I think as Elvira implied, the LCL tightens with extension, so it's wise not to push hyperextension. But the good news, you can flex as much as you like because it tends to loosen off in, in flexion. So uh, James, uh, you obviously presented uh, from the consensus group. Um, is there any plan to revisit that in the future? And do you think there are any trends for new uh, things to happen? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the real evidence gaps is this addition of an osteotomy in acute injury. Um, you know, there, whilst I think we felt that there's evidence to suggest that you should be osteotomizing the chronically pre presenting PLC injury, um, there is not that evidence yet for where, where does osteotomy fit with the acute injury. Mm. And the majority of people, I think, are, 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 would say, you know, particularly if you've got an elite sportsman, doing a soft tissue operation alone is reasonable. But that was very much experience based uh, and I think we you know we'll, we'll wait and watch what the evidence says but very good go fantastic well that, that wraps up the session perfectly so thank you very much everybody for your contribution to Vincenzo I was so happy that we could speak to you at the end <laughs> <laughs> see you guys you bye hear bye. Me, at least thank you bye 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 thanks Andy.
Fantastic. Uh, welcome back, everybody. And we're now going to go into our fourth and final session of today. We've learned a lot about the slope and its influence on the cruciate ligaments. But we're now going to focus on something that a lot of people find difficult to manage and certainly something that we're learning about all the time. So we're now going to look at patellar instability and rotational malalignment. We're really lucky to have in the studio today Holly, who's kindly volunteered to come, come and help us out with our learning. And of course, uh, most of you will know Chris Wilson from Cardiff, who's going to go through examination and, and how we do that. Over to you. OK, well, first of all, Holly, thanks very much for doing this. Yeah. I'm going to give you a bit of history. Holly's 21. She's a student. She's a law student, so we've got to be careful. Yeah. <laughs> and um, 
she's kindly volunteered for this. Now, Holly's presenting complaint is patellar instability. She gets lots of patellar dislocations, don't you? Yeah. But when we dig down deeper into the story, she's had problems since adolescence and has been one of those young girls typically that struggle with school sports. Her knees never felt really great, did they, at school? You've always had a bit of a problem with them. Difficult to put your finger on. Yeah. <laughs> lots of physiotherapy, so. lots of physical training, never really got better. Am I right? Yep. <laughs> okay. So now she presents ostensibly with patellar dislocation, but with that history when we go into it. So first thing, we want to have a very quick look at uh, Holly generally. We see that she's got some elbow hyperextension and she can just about, can you do that for me, touch the floor? But not quite, so it wouldn't count as a point on the Baton system. She can put her thumbs, can you do that for me? On her, almost to her wrist, so she gets a point there, and a point for the other side. I won't go into it, but the little finger's okay. So despite the fact she'd only get a Baton score of about four, she is pretty bendy, hypermobile. So it's an important thing to establish when you're seeing youngsters with patellar instability because hypermobility is a big problem if you think you might be doing a soft tissue procedure for patellar instability, a big problem in general. Okay, so what I want to do first of all is to get Holly to walk up and down, to walk away from us, first of all, to that, to that window there. Just walk exactly how you would normally and then walk, just walk towards the camera Keep going, that's great. And then walk back. Then walk towards the camera again. So what I want to do actually is to get you to walk up and down there so the camera's got a side view of you walking. And then come back towards us. That's fine. And so finally come here and just face the camera again for me. So, that's our general orientation, and I want you to point your feet straight ahead. Just hit your shorts a little bit, if that's okay, just to give the, the viewers a good view of the knees. And we can see, I think, I hope you've spotted that when she's walking, her knees don't quite extend normally. And uh, when we're looking at her now, she's got this typical internally squinting patella picture. Uh, and if we turn Holly around, face away from us completely. We see a very common association with flexible, stand on tiptoe for me, flexible flat foot, uh, the arches reform. So very typical, if you like, superficial examination of so-called miserable malalignment. Bearing in mind, she's come along with patella instability. But what's unusual about Holly's situation is that when she's walking, she seems to have this inability to fully straighten the legs. So. We're going to get her on the couch now, and uh, first of all, I want Holly just to perch on the side and face the camera like that. So I just want to demonstrate to the audience that this is quite a problem with your kneecaps, isn't it? We'll, we'll choose this one. So I want you to just uh, straighten for me. And can we, I hope you can see that. Uh, back at home and down you go again. There's really quite a lot of subluxation, lateral subluxation again going on just for normal flexion extension. And I gather sometimes it comes right out of joint yeah. and it's a, a full-blown dislocation, isn't it? Yeah. Okay, that's fine. Grand, so both knees are the same, so we're going to concentrate on just the one side, bearing in mind that both, both sides are giving Holly a problem. So the first thing we're going to do, we're going to do an examination. Now the choice of examination here, we can do this supine or prone, and I'm going to do both for demonstration purposes. So I want you just to lie back on there, Holly, if that's all right, and get yourself nice and comfortable. Okay, if anything I do is unpleasant, or you want me to stop, just let me know, okay? Yeah. All right? So we see here that with the foot pointing towards the ceiling, the orientation of the femur is internally rotated. We don't know how much of this is fixed compensation, because Holly's got so used to walking like this after 10 years. So we're going to gently, because she's quite touchy about having the kneecaps moved, and we're going to stabilize the pelvis, and I'm going to let Holly internally rotate her thing. And we can see we've got, with the pelvis stable, we've got virtually 90 degrees of internal rotation, 
at the hip. And then we're going to take, very gently take her back and externally rotate. And with my hand on the pelvis, that's the limit of our external rotation. So internal rotation and external rotation are very different with a lot of extra internal rotation. Now, we still are not completely sure whether the deformity is above or below the knee. So we can now gently, on the supine position, examine with the tubercle fixed and the foot at 90 degrees, the progression angle of the foot, the, uh, the thigh angle of the, the thigh foot angle. And we can see here that she's got about 10 degrees external tibial torsion, which is well within normal limits, okay? So we're gonna stay with the right leg. We can look here, and just to do a manual assessment of patella height, there's the tubercle, there's the inferior pro patella, there's a superior pole, and just on manual assessment, without doing the x-rays, we can see that the patella height is probably normal. And you can see here, there's great apprehension. Sorry, Holly. Sorry. <laughs> great apprehension if we even push the patella laterally. So strong apprehension. So we're going to repeat those tests, but in an orientation that we're more familiar with when we examine very small children. So Holly, if you'd be so kind as to turn onto your front, so take it slow, because I know that your knees bother you when we do this. Okay, and lie on the front there, get yourself nice and comfortable. So now, we've got an opportunity to look at the other leg. I'll stay on this side. So Holly's comfortable, the pelvis is flat, there's no excessive lordosis, the pelvis is lying flat there. So we very gently, because she is apprehensive, take the leg to 90, stabilize the pelvis and allow the hip to rotate. The pelvis is not moving and it moves now. So 70 to 80 degrees, and then we take the thigh over and the pelvis is starting to move. So external rotation, again, is limited to about 10 to 15 degrees. And we have an opportunity now to look down, use the foot as a goniometer, look down the thigh, stabilize the tibia in a neutral position, and we can confirm, first of all, that she doesn't have gross external tibial torsion. And we can also look at the feet and make sure that she hasn't got some sort of odd metatarsus valgus or metatars metatarsus varus. It's a normal looking foot, you'll be pleased to know, Holly. So, let me put you down there. That uh, completes the exam. A neurovascular examination has previously been done and is normal, and there's no explanation for this walking position other than the one I'm about to give you. Sw swivel back up, Holly, and let's have a, just sit up for me on there. Uh, just lying on your back, that's fine. So, what I think is going on with Holly's refusal to walk with a straight leg is that the knees do actually come straight, as we can see. But, the kneecap in this position is extremely irritable. And it's only when Holly gets to about 40 degrees that the kneecap is stable and she feels secure. So she's got used to walking with the knee at 40 degrees. She doesn't want to come beyond that because walking is very uncomfortable because the kneecap's playing around the whole time. So the, the walk that she's developed, we'll look, we'll look at it one more time, Holly. The walk that she's developed, you could say is habitual. Off you go because she doesn't want those kneecaps wobbling around because it's very uncomfortable. And we can see what she means. Okay, that's fine, have a perch. So that completes the examination. So on the basis of that, we're gonna do some investigations. We suspect that Holly has got excessive femoral neck antiversion and internally rotated femurs with a fairly normal looking tibia, but remember, if you see a patient come and hop down for us one last time, if you see it and face the camera, feet st pointing straight ahead, if you see a patient with internally squinting patellae, the deformity may be in the tibia. It may be that they're having to do this because they don't want to walk around like that the whole time. It's not the case here, but be mindful of the fact that internally squinting patellae doesn't necessarily mean the deformity is in the femur, 
until you confirm that with examination. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Ori. I mean, that's really, really helpful. Much appreciated. I'll show that's you great. that. Thanks yeah. a lot. OK, guys, so just to follow up on that, we're just going to look at some of her radiographs. Um, these are, there's an AP view, uh, looking at the lateral view, which, just, which I find useful on the short leg as well, looking at the patella height uh, relative to the uh, trochlea. And we can see a uh, skyline view. I don't find these particularly helpful, uh, but we do get them in our department. Uh, with the long legs, um, it's not bad. Her patellas are relatively centrally located on these, on these images. Um, she's slightly varus on the long legs. This is a cross-sectional axial image of her, of her uh, femur, uh, distal femur, and you can see where the patella is sitting very laterally. And I'm just going to flick through her rotational malalignment. So at the, at the hip joints, 1.5 degrees of femoral antiversion. You can see quite dramatic internal rotation at the distal femur of 40, 40 degrees. And then working out from her tibia, relative internal rotation at the, at the tibia, proximally and distally, um, it uh, works out at 17 and a half degrees. Uh, we also did an MRI scan to measure the uh, patellar trochlear index, and you can see that's relatively within uh, normal limits. So, over to my, my team here. So we were lucky to have um, a fantastic lineup of guys. Um, Ronald, what are your thoughts and your thought process in managing such a patient? Well, it, it, it started with uh, the comment uh, that, uh, that Chris already made, that she has um, uh, long-standing complaints, uh, even at younger age, and it didn't go away with any kind of treatment. And that's, that's uh, really a stop sign for me, that you have to think of why didn't it go away? It has the bone something to do with it? And this is actually a typical case I see a lot. And these are overlooked so often, these cases. And every orthopedic surgeon listening has his population of patients with patellofemoral pain and or instability. And you have seen an excellent demonstration of examination here. If you would only take 30 minutes of your time, put these patients prone on the bench or supine and check the rotations of the upper part and the lower part, you will find these patients and you may be the one who is the last one to treat them because you will address the rotation of the foot. So excellent case. Thank you very much, Chris, for demonstrating this. Brilliant. Um, and we're lucky to have um, Elvery from, from Leon, uh, who's published quite extensively in patellofemoral disorders. What are, your, what are your thought processes when you're managing such a patient? Um, <laughs> actually, I, I always look about uh, hip antiversion, internal, external rotation. But uh, it's really unusual for me to do something about it uh, because we, we analyze uh, those secondary factors, as we call that, secondary factors. And I, I really, we saw a lot of abnormal, uh, torsional abnormalities in patellar knee pain, not really in instability. Uh, actually, this uh, lady has both, but she has also a high grade dysplasia. Uh, so, and she had also uh, some, uh, I mean, she, on the long leg spin, I, I don't, I didn't see, but she's in varus or she's, she's quite in, She's normal. in slight, yeah, draw, drawing the line down, she's in slight varus, yeah. Okay, because when she's walking, because she, she didn't get full extension, but she had a lot of dynamic valgus, hmm. a lot of dynamic valgus, so... Uh, I think there is something about uh, this uh, issue and dynamic yeah. valgus when she is walking. And um, so I'm not sure I will do something about the torsional abnormality. Maybe I'm, I'm wrong. I don't know. Yeah. But I will focus more on the knee and, uh, yeah. and all the abnormalities around the knee than on the, okay. on the torsional abnormalities. But Thank I, you. I, I, yes. Yeah. Thank you. That's great. Um, Bushan, you've, you've got some slides for us um, that you've put together on looking at different, different okay, parameters. So, uh, we'll just rush through them because we uh, don't have much time. So just go ahead, uh, just continue clicking. 
So some of the papers which looked at uh, various uh, measurements. Uh, next slide, please. So a few of them are from actually radiological articles and they're quite good. Next one, next one, next one. It's okay, Bishop, we got time. So, yeah. Okay, so uh, well, we're looking at patella, uh, we're looking at trochlea and we're looking at the rotation. So uh, patella height, you already mentioned about the, the index. Uh, just uh, click five times so we can get the first image. I think uh, I was going to go a bit slow on this, but so we know about the indices. Click once again. So the, the standard, one more time, the standard index that we use is the insal salvati index and which measures the uh, ratio of the uh, tendon, patella tendon height compared to the length of the patella. And we know the normal values from 0.8 to 1.2. The problem with using the insal salvati index is that uh, the articular facet of patella is variable as compared to the length of the patella. So we do a Caton Deschamps index. Next one. So this is slightly more uh, specific uh, for measuring the, uh, the the patella height as such, and the values, uh, uh, as you can see, is almost similar 0.6 to 1.3. There is a modified version of insal salvati ratio called as modified insal salvati index. And that measures the length of the patella tendon as compared to the articular facet. Uh, next slide, please. So this is based on this uh, uh, Grell-Summers classification, where uh, the articular facet of the patella may not correspond to the patella length. And you can have variable articular facet length, especially the type B, in, in which uh, the, the ratio can be completely spurious and may not correlate with the clinical findings. Next one, please. So. Uh, one important thing, as in this patient, was when the patella engages. You, you can get a dynamic MRI uh, for patella tracking, and you can actually see when the patella engages in the uh, trochlea, and that's very useful for patella alta patients when you can decide how much to distalize the patella if there's patella alta. Rax, is there any patella alta in this patient? No. No. Okay. No. Next slide, please. So uh, you, you, you heard about the TTTG distance and it was normal in this patient, uh, but uh, it's always better to major the TTTG distance based on a CT where you can superimpose the two images uh, where the deepest part of the trochlea is and uh, proximal half of the tibial tubercle is, and you can draw a line along the posterior condyles and then major the distance between the two. Uh, normally anything above 18 millimeters is considered abnormal and about 20, it's always suggested that you uh, do some kind of intervention. Next slide, please. Next one, please. So we, we know a lot about, next one, yeah. We know a lot about the trochlear dysplasia. I think this uh, patient, if I'm not mistaken, did have a trochlear spur as well on, uh, on, the, on the lateral view. Uh, so she has a type B or maybe type C uh, trochlear dysplasia. I didn't see a clip on the MRI as such. So uh, she might be a candidate for trochlear correction and uh, trochleoplasty as well. Next one. Next one, yeah. So the key point here is the rotation. And uh, you can measure the rotation based on the MR or measure the rotation based on the CTs. Next slide, please. So that's uh, the, the example exactly in the, as in this patient. If you measure the femoral neck antiversion compared to the distal femur. In this patient, the antiversion seems to be the more prominent feature. But uh, as with Holly, the distal femoral internal rotation seems to be the major factor. The value is almost similar. So in this patient, is 39 degrees. In in uh, uh, in the patient we just saw, it's about 44 degrees. So it's fairly significant femoral intorsion uh, going on there. Next slide, please. So again, you can superimpose the images based on a CT, which is much more specific as compared to MR, and you can measure this angle directly, as you as you can see here. Quite a few times, the femoral neck is, does seem retroverted but the, the distal femur has much more internal rotation. So it's an effective internal rotation of the distal femur as compared to the proximal femur, which is more important here. Next slide, please. So as in this patient, uh, this is one of my cases, uh, uh, exactly similar to what we saw just now. There was slight valgus, which was corrected at the same time as the derotation osteotomy. Next slide, please. Uh, just play the video. Uh, uh, yeah, forget about it, it's fine. So I was, I was uh, quite uh, aggressive, uh, heard Ronald's presentation, did without a tunicate, it bled like anything, but uh, you can easily do a good derotation osteotomy in such patients. Next slide. So coming to 
the important things about uh, examination as chris has rightly shown all of these things the components or the contributing factors are all all of these and all of these will need to be addressed in in patients with uh, negative values just doing a an mpfl may not suffice next slide please so uh, we need to know the normal values uh, cd ratio or cd index is about 0.6 to 1.2 the ttt distance about 18 is abnormal and uh, the distal femoral rotation compared to proximal uh, femur more than 25 is considered abnormal so in uh, in this patient is about 20 degrees uh, over uh, internal rotation which can be corrected of course if it's a unilateral problem you can compare with the opposite side and uh, i think we need to correct the trochlea as well i think that was just a quick uh, summary of uh, radiological parameters based on ct and mr i have left out the trochlear index and all other uh, weird indices but these are the basic things that normally follow that's fantastic bush and thank you so much um, as ronald said these are often patients who are neglected they've gone through life life without really being picked up and i think as as pa patients that we see it's important to identify them so so Matt, when you have such patients, what sort of things are you looking for in the history and, and you know, what do you try and pick out? Yeah, well, it's, um, it's, I learned from reading uh, from Stahili uh, when I was a registrar some 25 years ago and then latterly from um, Bob Taichi and then I've had a very interesting case inside my own house. So uh, <laughs> I, I've got a little bit of inside track on, on, on the history and... Um, so yeah, I mean the classic is in the in the in the clinic is to ask about the W position, um, and some pa patients and parents would look at you and think, "What's he on about?" But others will immediately recognise the W position of sitting when they sit on the floor with the feet behind them. Classic situation that, that gives away that femoral neck persistent antiversion. Um, very very useful indeed. There are few other uh, situations which are really classical and this comes through in what Bob Taichi says that when he corrects rotation the, the huge list after surgery of very random things that now the patient can do yes. indicates what their problems were before and they're so diverse mm. you know couldn't get in and out of the car without my knee clicking couldn't bend down and pick something up couldn't go up and down stairs various things like this and so uh, often a more sort of discreet thing would be saying poor at sport because of these functional issues, can't partake in certain activities. And then going back to my own household situation, seeing you know a child just not being able to do what you think they would like to do to the, to the right level. So mm. just not making their achievements and getting frustrated. Mm. And then things to be careful about are labeling um, because mm. Sometimes these children get a get a an unf unfair label that they're lazy, that they're yeah. avoiding things, and they've really got a real problem with their gait, which we're not clever enough to understand. So absolutely, and it's given things. a f name miserable malalignment, which doesn't doesn't really really help. No, no but that's, those are really important points. If we just bring up my slides um, for just a case example of what we've done with. In fact, I learned from Adrian and uh, Ronald. And th uh, this is a patient who I've done together with my um, pediatric colleague, Arash Afshapad, a uh, 15-year-old with recurrent patellar instability, anterior knee pain, as Matt described, it, you know, labelled as being, as being lazy, but this patient just didn't really, wasn't really looked at in detail. So this is, if we can play the video, please, um, just to, you can see... I mean, this is quite advanced, actually, her, her disability, and, you know, not a, you, we couldn't really see from the knees, but if we look at the rotational profile, you can see quite excessive femoral neck antiversion, um, massive internal, internal rotation also, and there was a similar torsional abnormality in the, in the tibia. So this patient had internal rotation um, and ex ex in the femur, external rotation torsion in the, in the tibia, so just going to describe the technique which Ronald um, taught me to identify the uh, line perpendicular to the mechanical axis to make your osteotomy. Putting your wires in an offset position so that uh, you, uh, you pre-plan how many degrees correction you want to make. And then once you've made the osteotomy, you line those wires up so that they're parallel to each other. You then fix it um, in, in place and usually you don't need anything on the um, opposite cortex, but you can put a staple um, anterior to posterior if you like, but this is a very stable construct. 
You then do the same on the, on the tibia. You do a tibial tubercle osteotomy, put a wire in perpendicular to the mechanical axis um, and uh, do your osteotomy. Offset your wires once again. This time you're going from an externally rotated position to an internal rotation to correct for the torsion. Make sure that your varus valgus alignment is satisfactory and then you fix it, uh, fix it with a plate and we now also incorporate that with a staple. And you can just see, particularly this view here, you can see the patella height has been nicely uh, adjusted, so the patella outer there, and now the patella is engaging nicely in the trochlea. And she's, she's recovering, she's doing relatively well. So, so I think we'll close that question at this stage um, and thank our faculty uh, for, that, for that particular session. Uh, we'll, we'll be back with you in just a second for the next question. Thank you, guys. Welcome back guys. So we're now on to our second question um, and this is going to be covering when to de-irritate, when to do a tibial tubercle transfer, when to do an NPFL. These are all really difficult questions and we've got a fantastic faculty to help us answer that question. So on, on, on Zoom we've got Ronald, um, we've, uh, we've got uh, Martin Brinkman, Sanjay Anand and Martin Snow in the studio together with Chris uh, Wilson and Matt. So Ronald, can I ask you to please kick us off with your, with your slides um, and tell us how you work out your, your algorithm? Yeah, well, this is a typical patient. We have seen an excellent demonstration by, uh, by Chris uh, in, in the former uh, setting. 20, 20 years old, uh, female, recurrent patella subluxations and luxations, pain also to come with that. And she presents with some gait abnormalities. And look at this knees pointing inwards. And you can imagine if, if you want to have the patella forward that her feet will point outward. So you, you do the examination as perfectly demonstrated by Chris earlier. You see a kneeing in and a toeing out and a patella laxity when you clinically examine that patient with apprehension plus plus. This is the scan, 38 degrees anti-torsion and external torsion at the tibia on both sides. So for me, miserable malalignment is the combination of femur as well as tibia, rotational deformity. And many of these patients present with patellar instability. Um, can you continue with the slide, please? Yes. If you want to really understand the forces playing a, a role here, just have a look at uh, Frank Noyes' book on knee disorders. There's a Bob Tai Chi chapter there with these illustrations. And if you look at internal rotation of the femur, look where the forces go around the patella. And that's the same with external torsion at the tibia level. The patella wants to go out. And then you quite easily understand what forces play a role here. Can I have the next slide, please? This is our algorithm. And it's a quick view. It will be published uh, in the next months in a French book of Mathieu Olivier edited. Uh, but we will publish it also. And it has been published actually before in, in the books we, we did rotational deformity correction chapters on. Actually, it has the, the parameters and the, the surgical indications already mentioned by Bouchan in the previous session. So we take two standard deviations from normal as the, the cutoff point where we try to uh, talk about uh, indications for surgery. And in my experience, and that's 20 years now with rotational deformity corrections, it seems to work to have such an algorithm. It helps me uh, to find the right patient. 
Uh, next uh, click, please. This was also very useful to find out if you want to think about also translation to stabilize, you may want to do a biplanar cut at the uh, tuberosity level to not only internally rotate the tibia and the foot uh, relative to the proximal part or do a proximal cut above the tuberosity. And then you also immediately translate the tuberosity medially at the same procedure. It's all been published and all been written down in articles and books. So I want to refer you to that. I do separate tuberosity procedures only when they have a high, uh, uh, high patella position. And MPFL, sorry to say, I have to undo MPFL reconstructions uh, in many of these patients because the diagnosis was missed that a rotational disorder was the primary cause of the patella instability. So MPFL reconstructions really tightening up that knee, giving a lot of complaints and overpressure on the medial facet of the patella is sometimes what I, what I see in these patients. So I'm not that happy with MPFL reconstructions in these patients. I give it back to you, Rex. Great, thanks, thanks, Ron. Well, that was a fantastic insight. Certainly, you've got a wealth of experience in managing these patients. Um, I'm really pleased to welcome back Al. Um, I wasn't sure if he was going to make it for this session. I know how busy he is. Al, thanks for making it. Really appreciate it. Can I ask you to present your slides? And you're specifically going to be looking at your algorithm as to when you derotate tubercle tubercle transfer and MPFL recons. And this is a really nice, succinct slide. So over to you, Al. Thanks, Rags. And yeah, thanks, uh, thanks for having me back. Sorry I missed earlier this morning. Um, I mean, essentially, we often talk about algorithms when we're dealing with patellofemoral instability, but unfortunately, it's just really not that simple because there are so many factors that we have to take into consideration. And so as, as much as I've, just, I've called it a surgical algorithm, I think it's better thought of as maybe just a, a blueprint for um, forming your decision making and uh, discussing with your patients. And uh, so I think of it really just looking at deformity being either proximal to the joint line, distal to the joint line, uh, and then obviously looking at the axial plane rotation as well. And then based on what, uh, you know, I think Bushan was going through previously, we can look at our imaging, we can look at a clinical examination, look at our imaging and determine what, what is at fault causing the recurrent instability. Um, and then, then we try and address uh, what is the most, what, what we think is probably the most telling uh, anatomic factor um, and you'll see that, you know, the common th thread for me is certainly is the addition of an MPFL reconstruction. And I would agree with Ronald, you know, an MPFL reconstruction when done badly is a major problem. Uh, I think if you correct the kinematics of the patellofemoral joint and whether that's doing, uh, addressing the trochlea, addressing patella height, addressing tubercle, addressing the axial plane, the last thing that then should go in at the, uh, is, is your MPFL reconstruction to act as a check rein. You're not using your MPFL reconstruction to control the patella and stop it from coming out of joint. That's when you end up with a problem. And of course, if you haven't addressed the rotational abnormality and are using that MPFL reconstruction to control the patella, you are by definition going to over tighten the medial side and run into lots of problems. So I think the, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a lot of the things that we have to think about. Um, and then uh, determine what the best course of action is going forward. And then the last thing I would say is we've got to think about the patient themselves. Some patients can cope with a lot of surgery and other patients can't, and also the, the, their family members as well. And so it's a big conversation with all, all, all parties involved. Thanks, Al. I mean, that's a valuable input. And I couldn't agree more that it, it's, not very, it's not didactic. You've got to tailor it to the person that's in front of you. And it's all on a, on a spectrum, but that's a really useful um, aid memoir, I would, I would say. And I'm just going to ask Martin now. So Martin, you've obviously do a lot of research involved with um, different trials and things. Can you just talk to us a little bit about the evidence for MPFL recon, tubercle tri transfer, and your experience with derotational shortage? Yeah. Uh, in terms of the 
derotation. Uh, I think, yeah, I think the important thing to say is that there's very difference in terms of your local population. So in the U UK, there's more tibial torsion than there is femoral antiversion. Uh, but in the continent, it's it sort of flipped. So Austria report more femoral antiversion to tibial torsion. So you really have to sort of know your population, really. For me, I slightly do it differently in that I my indication is if the... I look at the sort of accumulative effect of the torsion, so take into account the femoral antiversion and the tibial torsion. So if my distal femoral condylar axis relative to my uh, bicondylar axis at the ankle is greater than 50 degrees, then um, I, I look at derotating at that point and then just look at which one is the dominant factor. So there is little evidence. In, there's about five trials uh, looking at rotational abnormalities. Uh, based on correction at double level, there's one trial that looked at the outcomes of a great, of tibial derotation relative uh, to femoral antiversion above and below uh, 20 degrees, and there was no different in the clinical outcome. So uh, at the present minute, um, it, it would appear that you can compensate significantly once you get one corrected. Um, in terms of the MPL and stuff. I, I think the problem with this is that we're replacing a 150 newton uh, ligament with a 650 newton tendon, <laughs> and therefore, um, it, it, what is your definition of failure? So, you, 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 the issue is more about not redislocation, but what is it the effect it's going to have later on, and we're not going to know that for a number of years. But if you look at these two examples in terms of uh, uh, failure analysis. Uh, basically, the commonality is patella alta, uh, positive J signs or evidence of a maltracking, um, evidence of uh, trochlear dysplasia, um, valgus malalignment. So all the factors we've talked about that predispose to, to malalignment. And probably maybe a better way to look at it and to try and put some numbers on it is a study by Andrew Amos. Uh, biomechanical uh, cadaver study where they looked at the tracking uh, by various sur surrogate measures um, with an MPFL reconstruction and varied the different parameters and basically what they found is once your TTTG goes above 15 then the MPFL struggles to restore the normal biomechanics within the joint so maybe uh, uh, that's about as best as we can say from the yeah. evidence in terms yeah. of what is a, a, a cut-off limit what where TTTG G it needs to be corrected. Yeah, it's interesting. So some of the teaching is 19, but that clearly shows 15 millimeters is a good, yeah. good cutoff. Sanjay, we're, we're talking about quite big procedures here. Derotating is, you know, it's not, it's not a small thing to do. Well, can you just talk to us a bit about the evidence between uh, derotation and the sort of lesser procedures with tibial tubercle transfers? Yeah, could they put, put my slides up there? I've got a couple of slides just would all help us along. Yeah. I don't know if they've got them or not. Um, I don't think they have your, would I have, have slides here, Sanjay? Do you want me to share my screen? Yeah. I've got it on here. Okay. Yep. That'd be great. Okay. Let me know if you can see that okay. No. Can you, can you talk us through them, do you think, Sanjay? It, be able to talk us through what, 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 they, what the evidence yeah, was? Yeah, sure. I mean, it's, it's a simple question, yeah, when, when to consider derotation. Unfortunately, the answer isn't quite so simple. <laughs> I think one of the problems is it's difficult to define, you know, what the normal population variation of rotation is in the femur and in the tibia. I think when you try and look through all the literature, there's lots of studies commenting on range of rotations in selected groups that come to their clinic, be it a knee clinic or a hip clinic. But they're often coming in with a pre-selected either a knee problem or a hip problem that goes with that. And I think on top of that also, you know, the rotation certainly isn't static. We're always taught that once you finish growing, that's it. But there's certainly changes that occur with age. There's male and female variations. There's even left and right sides. And Martin's already commented on geographical variation as well. So it is quite difficult to kind of pin down. Um, we, we, we kind of did show uh, on this, you've got pictures on the screen now. We can see the screen, yeah. Uh, so, you know, this is just one different techniques of looking at femoral antiversion, and there's multiple different methods uh, using different measurement techniques. So, it creates a, a, a vast amount of data that's actually quite difficult to interpret. Now, this is from Martin, this is from your paper you just published just a couple of months ago, look at different um, measurement techniques and results with tibial torsion as well. So, you can see why it becomes very, very confusing. There's lots of studies that kind of clear, show clear benefit for isolated MPFL tibial tubercle transfers. But there's also quite a number of studies that show clinical benefit to derotation. 
in particular people who've had failed previous isolated procedures. In terms of what investigation do you do, uh, this is one study I found that's looking at femoral antidiversion and MRI does appear to underestimate the extent compared to CT. So I think CT probably does still remain uh, our gold standard. Uh, so kind of normal values based on what I could read from literature, I think your femoral antiversion probably somewhere between 10 and 20 degrees and tibial external rotation measured from the back of the tibia to the bi bimalleolar axis is probably about 25 to 30 degrees. There's just a couple of papers. This one was looking at femoral antiversion from the same group. So on the left hand side, 135 mes all had uh, high femoral antiversion. One group had MPFL, the other group had a derotation osteotomy, and there were better outcome scores, laxity findings uh, uh, in the group that had the derotation osteotomy. On the right hand side, it was 144 patients. They had an MPFL and tibial tubercle osteotomy, and they looked back at the subgroup analysis based on how much antiversion they had, so less than 20, 20 to 30, and more than 30. And there was a poor outcome with outcome scores and graph laxity in that final group. And this is a paper I think Martin just mentioned earlier, um, 36 isolated tibial derotations in the presence of some, some of them had femoral antiversion as well, up to 36 degrees. Mean derotations just in the tibia was about 25 and they all showed improvement in their outcome scores. There were no redislocations, there was improvement in pain and the femoral antiversion didn't appear to affect uh, outcomes in those study groups. So I think it's, it's just a rough guide from the data. I think, it, well, yeah, when would you do it for femoral antiversion? Probably greater than 30 degrees. External tibial torsion, probably greater than 35 to 40 degrees. But we've already seen the importance of clinical examination. You've got to take all of these factors into account on the screen here. So it's not just um, a number that you go off and you've got to kind of once you've got your deforming forces, work out which one you feel is the dominant one. Maybe look at that. Brilliant. Thank you, Sanjay. That's a great um, synopsis of what we've been discussing. And, you know, we could talk about this literally all day. Um, I just want to bring in Martin Brinkman. Martin, um, we're, we're talking about surgery, which is quite complex surgery. What is your sort of preferred surgical technique when you're looking at um, derotation? Do you do it over a nail? Do you do metaphyseal osteotomies? Do it in the hip? What is your... What are your thoughts? Um, well, I learned from Ronald, so... <laughs> you and me both. <laughs> um, <laughs> proximal tibia and distal femur, for me, depending on where the pathology, where the, where the, uh, uh, where the deformity is. Uh, and, you know, based on what all the experts have been saying, uh, I, I'm just nodding in agreement here, listening to it. And um, that, that, that slide that uh, Al showed is actually very helpful uh, for me. I try to, you know, uh, see in which category the patient falls and try to keep it as simple as possible. Uh, but that's that's not always the case. And, uh, well, usually uh, I've got my mentor, Ronald, to refer the patient to if it's too difficult for me. Um, so I, tr I try to keep it simple and, and correct where the deformity is, distal femur, proximal tibia. Great. Brilliant. I think that uh, really ends it nicely on this uh, particular part of the session. Thank you so much, guys, for, for tuning in and um, educating us today. Uh, we've got one more uh, session that we're going to go to, so we'll, we'll take a 10-second break and start the next session.
Great, welcome back everybody. We're now on to the last se section of the fourth session today. And we're gonna start by uh, talking about the, we're gonna finish off by talking about the summary of PFJ instability management. Um, for part of the um, faculty, we've got the team back in again. So it's good to have Christian back and Ronald here. And in the studio, we've got Matt, Chris and Martin and myself. So I'm gonna start off with Ronald, if I may. Ronald. Um, we often see skeletally immature patients um, with rotational problems, patellofemoral issues, and obviously there's the additional problem related with the growth plate being present. How do you manage such patients? Yeah, well, actually that presents a problem because some of these patients do really have severe complaints. And uh, uh, as patellofemoral instability as itself, they have already stretched soft tissues to a certain extent, and they are really handicapped by that they cannot get along with their, their, their teammates or their classmates, uh, presenting with these uh, severe patellofemoral instability problems. Some of them have these rotational issues, and if they have them, uh, it's, it's a, a long talk with the parents as well as with the patient, what to do. And um, sometimes you choose to do a temporary solution and telling them, well, we're gonna try to do a limited amount of surgery right now, soft tissue. And when you grow up and your growth plate have closed, you come back. And sometimes you do not have that choice. It's, it's too much handicap and then you go for shaft corrections uh, out of the way of the growth plates uh, to not uh, do anything there that could uh, be a later consequence. So that's my workup in these patients. And some of the workup is with Philippe Neray described in his, some of his work regarding medial soft tissue plication and lateral lengthening. What, what, are you, what are your thoughts about the results for those in, in your hands? Have you had good success with that procedure in the pediatric population? Yeah, we have been discussing the MPFLs. Of course, you're, you're not going to do MPFLs in these young kids because uh, you are in, in the, the area of the growth plate then for fixation on the femur. Uh, my teacher in this uh, lateral release medial plication or not the standard lateral re release, lateral lengthening of the capsule, which is much more controlled, was Philip Nere. And, and I think it makes sense if, not the, if the, the mechanical factors are not too far off to do capsule plication mm. on the medial side and if, if necessary with a lot of tilt and a very tight lateral uh, capsule, uh, to do a lengthening of somewhat uh, of that uh, mm. capsule on the lateral side. And it doesn't harm later extra surgeries when you do that. If mm. you would do more aggressive kind of stabilizations, probably you would have to undo that. Whereas this is not a treatment I, I see to undo in these patients later on. Thanks, Ronald. Um, we know that once we've corrected the alignment, the rotation has been corrected, the, the so-called train is on top of the train tracks, um, the patella will sit within a trochlea. Uh, just wondering, Matt, if you could comment a little bit of the role of trochleoplasty in patellofemoral instability. Yeah, well, first I have to declare I don't do that particular operation and perhaps what a big problem is across maybe in the UK is how sketchy the coverage of expertise is in this area. I, I think looking at the, the literature, there's definitely a role for trochleoplasty, but it's very difficult to define exactly which patients. I'll tell you which ones it wouldn't be. It wouldn't, it wouldn't be the type A and type B de jure classifications, probably. It would probably be the Cs and Ds. But once we've established uh, the, you know, the train on the track or the, you know, brought the patella, sorry, put the trochlea under the patella, um, we often find that these funny shaped mm. trochleas actually articulate perfectly normally and I've, I've seen that happen in, in, in my own patients. So I think you know, it's something where we need the expertise mm. and you, I'd be much more comfortable when we've got an appointment coming up in our area very <laughs> soon with a Bristol trained fellow who's going to hopefully shine a light on this for us. Mm. Um, but I, I haven't knowingly um, 
missed an opportunity to do a trochleoplasty. No. So I'm sure it will be done very well. But the other tools we have in our box at the minute seem to do the job for us. As, as mm. long as we get the alignment right from the start, both coronal and axial. So the message is alignment is key. Marty, can I ask you to comment on that? Yeah, so, uh, so in the series, I've got a uh, series of 106 rotational tibial osteotomies. And of those probably 60% of them have a degree of trochlear dysplasia and of those have only ever gone back to do a trochleoplasty twice. So once you get the alignment right, although saying that, uh, the, the patient we saw earlier, Holly, so she, I think in her, she's going to be the one though that once you, even though you correct the rotation, because she walks with such fails to engage she walks in flexion to engage her patellas mm. even in the static situation even though you'll correct her dynamic valgus because of the rotation she'll still be very apprehensive uh, and i think she'll be she would be one that would be high risk for return yeah. and that'd be something i would definitely counsel her towards mm. i would still do it stage i would do the rotation first and then i would say to her there is a pretty good chance we might come back but We'll do this so that's first. That's a really interesting and important point that in that big series that you have there with correcting the rotational alignment, a very small percentage then go on to require trochleoplasty. Yeah. But that classic sort of apprehension and getting engaged in the trochlea yeah. is probably someone so who's going to be good for it. If she had had patella alta, mm. then I would say she probably would not need a trochleoplasty mm. because yeah. I would distalize the patella at the same time as the, as the rotational osteotomy. And then as a consequence, then she would be happier because she'd be engaged. Mm. But because she doesn't have patella alta, she, she, she needs a deeper trochlea. Yeah in order to extend her legs during gait. She'll be happier walking, but she'll still have that apprehension because she's statically mm. and apprehensive. Brilliant. Thanks. That's a really important point. So we know with abnormal patellofemoral biomechanics that we do see a lot of these patients <laughs> later on down the track developing um, osteoarthritis. And, and that's a very difficult situation to manage with total knee arthroplasty. Christian, you're, you're one of the sort of highest volumes of arthroplasty guys uh, you know, in, in your country. And what is your experience with this, um, managing the patellofemoral joint in total knee arthroplasty? Yeah, so as the uh, patellofemoral joint somewhat remains, as we have heard, an enigma in the normal uh, anatomy, because it's influenced completely multifactorial, uh, the worse it is in, in the total knee. So um, if you go for arthroplasties and, and look for these patients, then I guess, to my opinion, um, as we cannot really uh, give lots of data on that, um, it, it becomes even worse because the total knee is even more affected by abnormal kinematics. And uh, you can see this, for example, in the screw home mechanism. So this is completely not there. It's absent in total knees. And therefore, we kind of enter the whole range of motion, the, the motion cycle in some kind of an external rotation that may somewhat sometimes be aggravated. And I know that we don't want to share uh, uh, or sh um, show slides here, but I can share my screen and hopefully you can see that. I don't know if you can. Um, that would be awesome. If not, then uh, share slide. well, I'm sharing my screen right now. Can you see that? The guys are just looking at having a look at it. Yep, we should be able to see them. In a bit? Yep. Okay, so are they there? Not yet. Yep, if, yep, you can click, click on. Okay, so what you see is that in a normal rotation scenario, you, we'd be putting now the, I'm looking at the, from the distal side at the femur. And the thing is, um, mm -hmm. if we do so, then this is what we call today rather kinematic uh, implantation or um, anatomic implantation. So we reference basically to the posterior condyles and we always reference to the, to the dorsal offset of the femur. What we therefore almost never do is an, uh, a complete app uh, appreciation of the anterior offset of the femur. And even worse, um, most of the surgeons for compensating uh, the rectangular cut and therefore the, um, the resection error at the tibia, they kind of externally rotate um, the, the femoral component by some three degrees, which is exactly uh, what the normal tibia at an MPTA of 87 is off. Uh, the um, 
in the measured resection tibia at 90 degrees. So we have a flexion gap at the lateral side, which is wider, and we externally rotate as a compensation. When doing this, we lower the lateral wall uh, of the trochlea, and you can see that by clicking further, please. Next slide. I think you have to click on your side, Christian. Okay, I did. Uh, there we go. But, yeah, here we go. So here you see, sorry, here you see the external rotation that goes even even further. And what happens therefore uh, is you you lower the lateral wall of the of the femoral component which actually acts like a breakout barrier for the patella. So the tracking is in fact not improved, but worsened by that. And we have lots of, lots of things like the, as said, like the screw hole mechanism, plus this lowering of the wall, plus the fact that almost all of the, of the total knees on the market um, don't have an, uh, an adequate uh, uh, trochlear shape. So there was a comparative study regards PFJ um, uh, implants and uh, that comparative study uh, came to the result that all of these implants are basically dysplastic and there is a study in published in Kesta from Kuo from uh, New South Wales uh, in 2020 showing the same for total needs. So we don't respect the anterior offset of the components and therefore that leads to other problems that come along with it uh, that basically settle onto what we've heard already for normal anatomy. So this is a particular problem. How to deal with that? Well, first at hand, I would say try to, to match normal anatomy for total knee implantations and try to avoid massive external rotation. So this is an answer which is basically given on a question that was never asked. It's slightly controversial, Christian. When would you consider derotating prior to total knee arthroplasty? If, if, if yeah, that's really, yeah, that's really controversial. So I, I'm not saying that you cannot compensate uh, uh, with a total knee. So uh, you can, for example, for, for various valgus alignments, uh, this is what you do and what we actually do every day. I'm just saying that we cannot uh, undo normal anatomy uh, with a total knee implantation. This is what we constantly do with compensating something that we have basically got wrong on the completely other side. So uh, there is an opportunity to compensate uh, unnormal anatomy with a total knee, but it's obviously counterintuitive to put in a total in a completely wrong shape uh, when the normal anatomy provided uh, was holding the patella right well in place. Yeah. I used to work for John Cameron who used to, so he would say you could externally rotate the tibial component to compensate for your tibial torsion and that tends to have little effect on the actual knee biomechanics itself. But you say once you get to 20 degrees, then you, you cannot compensate more than 20 degrees through a tibial component. Right. That would be his cut off. If it's more than 20 degrees he needed, yep. he would then derotate. Actually, so at I'm, the same time. Okay, yeah. in one sitting, okay. Yeah. Well, not to contradict, this might be possible in, in lots of systems, but you know, there is a, such a wide, variety of implants that we have on the market with different uh, kinematic and anatomic uh, configurations that it's very very hard to find the correct mm. answer for this question that was asked here uh, for all the specific implants i guess it's not possible and we need to have an individualized approach thank thank you christian um look it's been a fantastic session and i want to ask uh, chris wilson to just do the summary for us um, to end, end the session and the day. So can we get up Chris's slides, please? You got the, are you going to click it? I'll click for you. OK, Chris's slides. Good. OK, there we go. OK, well, to summarise, well, there's a lot of issues there as we've discussed, but I suppose the biggest take-home message, apart from uh, assessing skeletal maturity, is that MPFL reconstruction is not the default operation for patellar instability. We've all seen that there are lots of other reasons uh, why you might do it, but it's not your first choice. And that clinical examination is actually very important. Uh, you don't go straight to the CT scan, the MRI scan. Clinical exam will tell you a lot. Um, of course, we're going to investigate the knee, and we're going to look at 
basically we need a lot of answers about the rotational profile and also the anatomy of the knee, trochlear, telehite, etc. I'm going to click on. So look, um, coronal alignment, we've been talking about this for two days, it's, it can have an effect on patellar stability. I don't know if we can get this, this is a video, can we get that to, to this is a young lady who got a, a normal knee other than having a valgus knee. So will it run, will it roll? That bit, that's a, there we are. So there we are. And all she's got wrong really on investigation is a valgus knee. So the, the cure for her was um, correction of the valgus. So coronal alignment's important. Patella tracking is important. Rotational profile, as Ronald has said, is often overlooked. Uh, and hypermobility, look for it. And if, you, if the patient's got it, you've got to proceed with caution. Okay, next one. So rotational profile, just to dwell on this, we've seen a lot of this. The classic one, the internal, oh, go back. The classic one, the femoral neck antiversion, is characterized by a high degree. Can you go back a slide? They're characterized by lots and lots of internal rotation of the hip, as we saw in the model. Now, as Martin has said, it's rarely just one bone, but one bone's dominant. And this is an example of a girl of mine who looked like a miserable malalignment, but in fact, the problem was in her tibia. Uh, and she had to walk around with a knee pointing, in, kneecap pointing inwards because she didn't want to walk like Charlie Chaplin. So that was highlighted by the clinical exam. The clinical exam showed not much internal rotation, lots of external. So we're alerted to the fact clinically that the problem was below the knee. Next slide. The TTTG, very trendy, but it's also lots of unanswered questions. It's very useful. We know that if there's over a two centimeter offset from the torques, then we can use it. In the smaller patient, maybe we should be looking at the angular offset rather than the actual pure distance in the smaller knee. Uh, if the overall rotation is normal and we've got a high TTTG, then we're going to look at an osteotomy there, as per Alan's, Alan Getgood's uh, nice um, algorithm. And don't forget that distalizing a patella alta is an extremely powerful and effective operation. Some people who are very uh, knowledgeable about patella femoral issues will say that medialization um, can predispose to patella femoral OA in the medial facet. So maybe that needs to be looked at. Now in the older patient with an abnormal rotational profile, Maybe we want to be pragmatic and correct things around the knee rather than big operations on the tibia or the femur. That's for discussion, really. Next slide. MPFL reconstruction. Well, some patients will be suitable, and, uh, but everything else has got to be normal. And when you're doing an MPFL rotation, it's worth saying that if you've got a hypermobile patient, maybe you shouldn't use an autograft. Just a thought. Next slide. Trochleoplasty, well, this is an operation that I pass sideways to my colleague in Cardiff. I find it, it's a rare operation. It's an ugly operation, in my opinion. I think it almost inevitable these patients are going to get patella from a low A. Uh, there's a narrow window of opportunity to do it and get a good result. It's generally in combination with something else. And I think that the thresholds and the criteria for doing this are something that ne really need to be threshed out a bit more because uh, it ought to be a rare operation, actually, but um, centers do vary. But, it, but it's something that we do. So that summarizes this afternoon's discussion. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Chris. Um, that really puts, pulls everything together, what we've been talking about this afternoon. So um, just to say, yeah, thanks, thanks to everybody. That's the end of the course. Um, it's been a fantastic couple of days and really couldn't have done this without the faculty uh, the conveners and all our friends who've come together to really make this what it is and I think we'll all agree it's been a really um, amazing educational um, event. Thank you so much to the guys on the screen over, over Zoom, the guys in the studio today, Clockwork Medical, um, the guys panels here, thank you Matt, Chris, Martin, for everyone who's been here for the last two days. Um, Adrian, over to you. Yeah I mean I, I, mean, I think but we'll sign off, sign off. We just want to say one final thank you to the London Clinic. I think Mark Hawkins just wanted to say goodbye. It's literally a minute long, this video. Can we show that video from the London Clinic? So we have another blooper.
keep filling. Okay. <laughs> so uh, it's interesting, actually. A, a great proponent of trochloplasty. My phone's been been burning, saying you don't need to do this derotation stuff. It's trochloplasty solves the problem. There's a huge debate about how to sort out these complex problems, but I think. What, what the take-home message was from that last session is you have to get the alignment right. I think it's such an amazing operation for that young girl who, came, who was being examined earlier who can't walk. It's life-changing. And, you know, we go back to Bob Taichi a lot, but when he came to the course a few years back, he gives that amazing lecture on his enormous experience with, uh, with rotation. And it's one of the most life-changing things that you can do for an individual. And Martin, you know, with over 100 in his personal se series, it's a, you know, it, it's, a, it's a real winner. So um, I think, you know, it's not for a beginner, that yeah. surgery. Ronald, when he comes, we've had a lot of visitors. And I remember Daniel Nawabi came and there was some other people in the room and Ronald made it, make, made it look like he was just, I don't know, cooking a cake or something. He made it look so easy. And uh, Daniel Nawabi just whispered to these people, I was there standing next to him, he said that. It's an extremely difficult thing to do and he just made it look very easy. So I think uh, if you're interested in these complex techniques, it's definitely worth uh, visiting and, uh, and, and coming to see the experts, come and see Ronald. Uh, Matt Dawson runs a fantastic cadaveric course, which we hope is going to be kicking off again next year, yes. hopefully. Um, and we're just going to get Mark Walkin to say farewell. Hi, and good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mark Hawkin, and I'm the Commercial Director at the London Clinic. Thank you for allowing me to come along for a couple of minutes at the close of this London Osteotomy Masterclass. And I think you'll agree with me, the actual Masterclass has been phenomenal. I'm sure you fully enjoyed participating in this very well-delivered and very interactive two-day event. And hopefully, as part of that, you've got the opportunity to consider alternative approaches to surgery for your patient pathways. When I was approached to see if the London Clinic would sponsor this uh, masterclass, I already knew that it was a very um, prestigious event on the orthopaedics calendar, which is why I also knew that it would be a great fit for the London Clinic, because we also pride ourselves in delivering complex surgical care, embracing innovation, and also new technology. It's been very humbling over the last two days to actually listen to some of the experience from the presenters and the participants from across the world and the London Clinic is absolutely proud to be sponsoring such a showcase of excellence. At our hospital, we actually really pride ourselves with engaging with consultants who embrace change. The consultants who are at the vanguard of driving change uh, and innovation. That kind of relationship allows for a truly successful partnership. A partnership that can be successful for years to come. And actually on a softer note, it gives you a really good feel-good factor because it actually means you're making a difference to patients' quality of life. Anyway, it's late on a Friday afternoon here in London, and I'm sure many of you already are actually thinking about what you need to do before you get to the weekend. Actually, I'm sure some of you are probably looking to week start the weekend sooner rather than later, now that the pubs and restaurants are, are open. So finally, a big thank you from the London Clinic to all the presenters and the audience that participated in this fantastic event. Please don't forget to fill out your evaluation cards. And if you're ever passing the London Clinic, please feel free to pop in and have a cup of tea. Say hello. Have a great weekend, everybody. So once again, thank you so much for tuning in. We think this is the, the new way to deliver a course. We're looking forward to having auditoriums full of uh, attendees again. But I think this is a great way of linking the world and linking experts and it's been a fantastic two days. Thank you, everyone. Thank you to the faculty. Thank you, Rags, for all the hard work. Amazing. <laughs> Thanks, Thank guys. You.